This is Jocko Podcast number 318 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. The Native Americans believed that if you gave someone a diagnosis, it was a curse. It was a curse that can become an identity if you accept it. But a rewiring can happen when you realize that you are the one creating your own experience. This is a long and truthful conversation with yourself. How can we learn and evolve from our successes and our failures? Where do we need to change? How can a person find solace and sovereignty in the face of experience that has been shaped by such pressure, immense hardship, bad choices, chemical manipulation, digital stimulation, and sophisticated programming that teaches you to kill? When the antiquated ways fail, and repeat the same answers and produce the same results, it's time to take charge of change. You are not the victim of this life, but rather the victim of your own choices. Truth is found within oneself, but to get to that truth, you have to peel back the layers to who you are. It's self-work and self-knowing that creates profound change. Today we have an addiction problem. We are addicted to other people's ideas. We become the victim of our experience. We take magic pills or become convinced by false prophets as to what will fix us or make us happy. We just want to relieve hurt and make it go away. But running from pain only magnifies the pain. We are born to honor what is good while striving for our highest self. You have to be open to everything and close to nothing. The heat, the cold, your weaknesses, failures and successes, your loss, and your regrets, face them. Face yourself. This is the most important and difficult battle you have ever been in. Alexander the Great once said, bury me with my hands out of the ground so the world can see that I left it with nothing. That is the plan. You change your own life from within, always from within, never outside. It's 100% in you. Life is not here to punish us, but it's here to help us grow in wisdom and knowledge and to ensure we never again are a victim of life. The time is now. And that is a compilation of words that I put together that were written by or spoken by or implied by a man by the name of Micah Fink. And I think you're going to see that through his path in life, in boyhood and business and war and combat and service and sacrifice, it's allowed him to learn some valuable lessons. And his goal is to teach those lessons. Or if not the lessons themselves, then at least teach other people how to learn those lessons, how to rewire themselves to be who you want to be, to be who you can be. And we are lucky enough to have Micah with us here tonight. 
to share some of those lessons. So, Micah, thanks for coming by, man. Thanks, buddy. <clears throat> man, that was intense. <laughs> yeah. That was fucking awesome. Yeah, you've got a bunch of clips out and, yeah. and stuff that you've written on your website, and I just pulled from some of it and watched some of your videos and pulled from some of that to try and give people a feel for sort of where you're at. But in order to get to where you're at, I guess we we start at the beginning. Yeah, where have you been? Yeah, where where have you been? <laughs> so, where did it all start, man? <clears throat> you know, uh, I uh, I kind of always start I was like, yeah, I was just a small town kid from upstate New York, and I laugh because if you would have told me when I was a kid that I would be doing the things that I'm doing today, I would have. I probably would have hit you over the head with a frying pan. <laughs> I just, uh, I feel really fortunate to, uh, you know, to now be in a place where I can, I can take the experiences in my life that at a point did break me down. Um, and, and, and now kind of, uh, show people that those experiences are the greatest ally that they have in, in this journey of self discovery, uh, that we're all on. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I grew up, my dad, you know, I grew up tough family, you know, uh, uh, my dad was, uh, you know, seven brothers and sisters, and uh, grandfather was a mob mob guy, mm -hmm. and uh, so he was in federal prison, you know, for ten years. And uh, were you alive then? No, no, I was. So this is before you were born. Yeah, it's before I was born, and but and he had a tough life, and so he grew up as an orphan on the streets. And this uh, is your dad, my dad's or, or dad, your dad, my grandfather, your grandfather, who I was super close to. He died when I was sixteen, and. Uh, I was I was really close to him. He was a he was a hard man, and uh, he grew up as an orphan and um, and ended up turning his life around. I guess you could say much later in his life, became the head of the railroad union, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> my my dad always tells a story when when their life kind of started straightening out and. Fast forward a little bit, my my dad said they used to go back. He was a uh, engineer in the railroad. And uh, he said he used to go back in the caboose. My grandfather would be running all these card games, you know, hustling, doing this and that. And my dad would come back and say, Pa, I thought, what are you doing back here? I, th I thought you were a Christian. And he's like, you can't gamble. And he's like, well, with me, it's a sure thing. So it's not gambling. Because <laughs> he was a card counter. He could count cards. But, uh, you know, so it's like real blue collar family, railroad family. And, um, you know, my dad. My dad grew up in that kind of life, so my grandfather was a pretty severe guy. And so, did years. your did your dad grow? Did your grandfather live in uh, also in upstate, or was yeah. he down in the city? So he was upstate. He was in the city, and then uh, and then family moved upstate New York, and then uh, mother and father died of alcoholism, and then I think nine nine of the brothers and sisters were street kids. Basically, they were orphans, and then my grandfather kept ex escaping and. Um, matter of fact, he broke his leg as an orphan, was taken back to the home, had to get surgery, and you want to talk about having it rough they circumcised him he was 10. Ooh. the dog yeah he's an orphan kid so they brought him in there <laughs> they're just like ah, i'll give him a little snip but uh <clears throat> yeah so it was a it was a interesting kind of upbringing because my dad grew up and he he went to the 82nd airborne uh, i was either go to go to prison or go to vietnam type deal mm -hmm. and um my dad was a really really rough guy like he's the epitome of a tough guy like a real tough like a violent tough guy and uh, he wound up in prison, and he wound up in Leavenworth. And uh, <clears throat> and what what was this before you were born? Was this yeah? After this you is, were born? So this was before I was born. So my mom and dad had been together since fifteen or sixteen. Mm -hmm. My dad had to join the military. Um, Did he go to Vietnam? Well, he was supposed to go to Vietnam, but then he wound up going to prison. Oh, um, which Vietnam might have been better, but uh, yeah, he uh, he never had that balance in his life, you know. And um, you know, it's interesting. My mom and dad, I think fifty six years or something they've been together. Um, but yeah, my dad went to Leavenworth and uh, he got in some trouble in the military, of course, and he was riding with all the biker gangs and stuff like that. And I mean, he doesn't, every tooth in my dad's head has been punched out. He's got a hundred something stitches across his head. And, you know, he kind of just, he had it rough and he hit rock bottom and he got out and he ended up uh, becoming a Christian. And then I was- So born. he, so his prison time was in the military, obviously, because yeah, he, he went was in to Leavenworth. Leavenworth. Yep, yep. Yeah, so he went to Leavenworth, and uh, how long was he in Leavenworth for? A couple of years, and then after that, it was whatever dishonorable discharge, most likely. Yeah, and yeah. then and then he got out, and he just uh, like took a bus back, basically. So he owed a, he owed a bunch of money to uh, 
like the Hells Angels and those kind of guys. So they like took everything when he went to prison, robbed him blind, basically. And uh, so he got out with nothing. And, you know, when I was a kid, like my Christmases were spent like in the city missions. You know, every single Christmas we were in the slums and the hoods. We had people at my house, like straight out of prison. Like my dad used to always tell me when I was a kid, he's like, you know why I come here? He said, I come here because I never want to forget where I came from. And my mom said that when my dad, when she met him, he had a van, a 56 panel van that said, no hope without dope. And he can never figure why, figure, figure out why you have getting pulled over all the time. But like, so he was rough, you know, he was a, he was a rough guy. Mm-hmm. And matter of fact, I know, cause as a kid, people would come up to my dad. They wouldn't believe that, you know, it was him. And he was, he was a, he was a violent human being and the kind of person that has nothing to lose. And he was tough and he was a boxer and he was a street fighter. And, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so my dad gets out and he ends up becoming, uh, walking down the street, like lowest point of his life. And he sees like the windows open in a church and lights on and he decides he's going to walk in there and he sits in the back. ZZ top looking guy. If you look at the pictures, he's got the huge beard with the, you know, the jacket with 87 patches on it, you know, rats and stuff. And, um, uh, tattoos he had like jesus smoking pot on his arm <laughs> man all kinds of crazy stuff and uh he uh he has an experience like in that church and, and nobody talked to him like nobody would even come up to him they just looked at him like whoa this is a scary guy and he turned his life around right there in that moment and uh so i was born in 79 my sister was born in 77 and <clears throat> my dad had to figure out how to put his life together. So my grandfather got him hooked up on the railroad and I uh, ended up becoming an engineer and uh, working on the railroad through till I was in second grade. And then he started a church in a really rural town of 600 people. Uh, so we were, we were real poor when I grew up. Uh, we all lived in the same bedroom. How, so how many uh, brothers and sisters were so there? So one sister. Just, just the one sister? Just the one sister, yeah. And, and this is it still in upstate New York? Yeah. And then they started doing the tent revivals. Mm. So when I was a kid, I always tell people, I'm like, listen, I, at the time I had become, uh, and I'm not a religious guy, like, but I had become, I would get saved like pretty much three to four times a week. I've been, <laughs> I've been, I've been saved more than any human being in North America because you would hear these guys and they would start preaching, you know, the crescendo would build and the worms in the hell and the, and I'm like, ah, and I'm like, you know, I'd been kind of. I'm touching my penis or something. I'm like, I should, I'm gonna, I would just be at my hand up. And I, I was like, I, I moved my way up to the blanket guy where I, when the people would fall down, I would rush in with a little blanket and lay it over him. Mm-hmm. Um, which a lot of them are faking because I was like, man, these people kind of just fall down. Like before they even get up there, sometimes they would just, they would get under the power or whatever. And so I'd have these little blankets, you know, I'm like seven or eight years old. I'd run up with the blanket and I'd always like step on their finger and they'd be like, Hey, <laughs> so then I was like, I started questioning things. <laughs> I really, I really did start questioning things. Or sometimes they'd push you down on the ground. But that was a crazy experience. You know, we traveled all around. Was that all around the country you travel, or just upstate like, New York? Up, okay, upstate New York. You know, so it was. Uh, remember the '80s? It was kind of a wild time for that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. That people would get the laughing spells, and like you know, there was all these kind of things going on. And so I ended up. Uh, I ended up leaving home at 16, so and I, and I lived on my own from then on. And where'd you move to? <clears throat> kind of moved around the country, uh, and uh, yeah, so I ended up uh, moving uh, down to South Florida and uh, getting a job down there and working. And what were you doing in South Florida? Uh, my grandmother lived down there, and I lived. Uh, I was homeless for a little while. I was homeless for some months down there, and uh, I'd gotten, you know, I was, I'd gotten in some trouble. I was also a very rough kid as you could imagine i <clears throat> the thing about that whole movement looking back now retrospectively is is the guilt and the fear and all the things that are associated with that what, you know? what movement the movement yeah the revival movement okay. and all that kind of stuff and <clears throat> it was never about love you know and, and i mean to me like that loving yourself and not judging yourself and all those kind of things it wasn't associated with that at the time and so as soon as i got old enough you know around 15 i uh well i started working at 10 and um <clears throat> yeah my first job on a dairy farm and then by the time i was 14 years old i was working 35 40 hours a week sometimes um and that was kind of my life and were you to, going to school yeah i was going to school so i'd get off school sometimes i worked at 10 o'clock at night i'd work all the weekends i'd work sunday afternoons um and then i started working for a family as a lineman 
first I was like the pick up the sticks guy, mm-hmm. you know, I'd run around and move the trucks and do all these things. And then, um, slowly anything to get off the dairy. I don't really drink milk because of that. Um, <laughs> milk is a disturbing product. Like <laughs> it is, a, I don't, it's just <laughs> sorry, like new horizon organics or whatever, but <laughs> It's nasty. Like, it's a nasty thing, you know? Like, and my job was to clean the udders and stick these little suckers onto there and, you know, like these old bags kicking you and and shitting on you, and it's the worst thing. And then the milk goes in there, and there's little flies, and the cat's licking it up everywhere. And and then these things got to be, like, constantly, you know, kept pregnant, you know? So they're, like, in this perpetual state of pregnancy to get them to keep lactating, you know? And the only thing I wanted to do is just get the hell away from it. So, <clears throat> yeah, I ended up uh, ended up becoming a lineman. So I learned how to do line work. Be- started climbing telephone poles when I was thirteen, and uh, started making like good money doing mm-hmm. that. So um, I didn't do that down in Florida. I did a bunch of other things, and then uh, I, <laughs> that uh, sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that was a really really rough time in my life. Uh, matter of fact, we were just down in Florida, and I was driving through some of the areas I used to live in. I could remember being so hungry, like going to the grocery store and just being like, just like grabbing like food and just like seeing like the big fat security guy, like just looking at me, like, <laughs> and I would do the whole like, kind of like Julio Jones, like, you know, and <laughs> usually I'd make it out with like one tenth of what I had. Like, and I, I remember this particular package of sausage that I had. Um, <clears throat> Who are you hanging around with? What was the, what was going on? Uh, I ended up, uh, I had met some guys when I was younger and, um, that were kind of passing through, they were like street guys and at the passing time, through upstate New York. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They were like selling shit and, you know, mm-hmm. kind of rough crew. And so I actually showed up at their house, uh, in Florida. Yeah. yeah. And I was, you know, I was in some, I was in some pretty big trouble at the time. And, um, I, uh, I was on my, I wasn't living at home at all anyway. And so I moved down there and. I stayed down there until I was 20 and, and then I moved back home. I had like 30 grand on me and and a car and all kinds of stuff. And I moved back home with a, with a stripper girlfriend. I got that out of my system. So when I got the stripper brief in the teams, I was like, oh boys, (laughs) I was there when I was 17. Don't do it. (laughs) And yeah, so I, I, you know, I moved back home. My life was kind of like in a tailspin. Uh, Honestly, I, you know, I had money, I had things and, I had a real hard chip on my shoulder and I just, uh, you know, I had kind of become like my father, I guess, in a sense where I was, I could be violent. I was pissed off. I was just angry. Once your dad found like God, was he still pissed off and angry? No, but it, inversely, he was really hard. He was a hard man, mm. like hard, you know? I didn't, I never looked at God as like God is love and he wants to like care for us and Jesus with the lamb and stuff. You're like Old Testament God. (laughs) Old Testament God, like, like I'm gonna take the stab. Those are the stories I heard, you know, like the ones you never hear. You only hear like, Jesus just loves everybody. Like, and then if you don't listen to him, like worms are gonna come suck your brains out and you're gonna burn in hell. And by the way, like, I mean, I mean, it was like that. That was the, was the revival days. It was the fire and brimstone. And so, um, I was afraid of it, to be honest, and I, um, I didn't, I didn't like the whole thing. I didn't like the hip, hypocrisy and, and that whole movement and stuff. And so, as soon as I got old enough, you know, I had a bunch of money. I had worked my whole life. That's what I did. I put my head down and I worked. I worked really hard, and um, that's kind of all I knew. I was an excessive compulsive worker, and uh, you know, when I left, I was on my own. I had like, I had no like balance in my life, so. Yeah, I, uh, I moved back home. I started doing line work again. And actually, a big turning point for me was that I uh, um, I went on a backpacking trip by myself and I ended up kind of having this experience out there with a bear. It was like a little black bear or whatever. And I kind of just started like thinking about my whole life and and how I just wasn't ready to die. I wasn't ready to – that there was something else missing. And I walked out of there and I, I – Literally after that moment, I kind of changed my whole life. It was nothing religious. But where, where was where were you at? In the Adirondacks, you? yeah, kind of where I grew up going to all the time. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah, so I ended up getting back on the line crew, climbing telephone poles again. And now I look back, like when I was a teenager working on these line crews, I would spend the summers living in New York City, mm-hmm. and I was living with grown men that were shooting heroin and you know living in these. They would put me up in these hotels and. 
I would live in these with these guys that were like vagrants, you know. They were they were like they would travel from city to city on these huge contracts, and I would be down there for the week. And um, <clears throat> yeah, that was a uh, that was tough, you know, because I was a kid. Matter of fact, I remember there was a guy I'll never forget him. I won't say his name. He's probably dead now, but he was like six foot eight. He was the scariest guy. He was from Long Island. Okay, his brother was another gigantic dude, and they were the hairiest people like I've <laughs> ever seen in my life. Okay, I've never seen men that hairy in my life until I met you. And then <laughs> um, these guys were like, these guys were like fucking Lebanese butchers. Like, <laughs> and they had the deepest voices and I get put on a splicing crew with this guy. And I remember I'm, you know, I'm 16. It's right before I left. I'm living in the city. I'm living with all these guys. And of course they would never give me a bed. I'd be in the corner of my little like sleeping bag, you know, and they'd be doing their things. And uh, <clears throat> I remember this guy would never talk to me and he would always flick his cigarettes at me. And he was just constantly smoking pot all the time. And you're 16 at this point? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, so I'm down there with this guy, and I'm like, he has a van, like a white like murderer van <laughs> filled with all his cable <laughs> stuff, and his head like, touches the ceilings in it, and he'd always be like, he always called me loser or fuck bait or whatever, like any name except for my name he would call me. And he had the deepest voice he's covered in hair. And I remember we're in Long Island, and <clears throat> I mean – most kids are like playing like basketball and they're out there like trying to like, you know, make out with their girlfriend, like do a high school prom. Like I'm there with this dude, Jim. <laughs> and I remember we're in Long Island and I'm like setting the cones up or whatever. And, and I'm not doing it fast enough or good enough. Everything's getting paid by the units. And I remember he's like, he's in the bucket above and he just he looks at me and he starts swearing at me and he takes like a bolt and he throws it down. He hits me in the side of the head with it. My you know, I had a hard head and like, I mean, it rang my bell. Freaking dude had a wing on him too. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So he just like whips it down. It's like, bong, like, and I like, remember I like rocked back and I like, I went around the side of the truck and I started like kind of crying. I was like, <sighs> so then I like, I just snapped. And so I started like taking all the cones. I started screaming at him and throwing them into the road and cars like laying on their horns. This is in New York. And I'm like, ah. and then I run over and I grab the emergency controls in the bucket. And I'm like, <laughs> and he's like flopping and shit's coming everywhere. And he's screaming, oh, I'm going to kill you. And I'm like crying. I'm like, ah. like, and I'm pushing all the tools under the ground. I'm throwing everything everywhere. I'm kicking the truck. I'm going crazy. So finally, after like 30 seconds of going crazy on the controls, I can see is like, this dude's going to murder me. So he just like stands up when I stop and he's like, you're dead. You're dead. He says to me. And I'm like, so I just grab a huge pipe off the thing and I'm like, and I'm out in the road and I'm just bawling my eyes out. I'm like, come on, jam. I'm like screaming. And he's like, Shh. he's like coming down in his little bucket, you know, and I'm the tears and people are laying on their horns and shit's everywhere. And he looked at me and he's like, he gets down like just like out of reach from me and I'm hitting the truck. I'm like, your dad. He's like, and he probably would have killed me. And then he just like looked at me and he's like, and he went back up. He made a good decision, huh? And I was like, <laughs> so then he's like, pick up everything, you piece of shit. He says to me, like, and so I'm out there picking everything up. And sure enough, like, I got to live in the house with the guy. So I like, you know, I go back, the week's over. And of course we go back up, you know, he's, it, it was like nothing happened. You know, and I would ride back up there and he would just be like smoking like joint after joint, listening to the Led Zeppelin. <laughs> he would like look at me, he'd get done and he'd go, and he'd like flick it at me and like hit my pants and I'd brush it off and he'd be like, huh. and he'd like, he'd like keep driving. So, I mean, that was kind of like, you know, I always like joke about like <clears throat> when I got in the military, like I was already kind of like a, I wasn't afraid of much at that point. Like in the sense of like, I just had, been, I had had a lot of experiences, you know, I'd grown up on my own and grown up, you know, pretty rough. And so um, I ended up starting my own line crew and hiring some of my <laughs> delinquent friends that I grew up with, you know, and and uh, I happened to be uh, in Queens, New York. And at this point, I really did turn my life around. And I'm in Queens, New York, uh, when the first plane hit the World Trade Center. So September 11th, I go to the yards in Long Island, pick up all my equipment. We used to store everything in these huge yards just outside the city. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to get some of this here. I got like... <laughs> Eat some goat juice. <laughs> and uh, I get uh, get all the stuff loaded up. And I got the, we used to just go down there and be dudes standing out in the street, and I would give them cash. 
So I'd be like, who needs a, who needs a job? You know, and I'm like, who's got a driver's license? I'm like, all right, hundred bucks, get in. And we'd hire like a ground guy. And um, I was making big money at the time. And I bought myself like an Audi, which Damn. I would not advise. Uh, Wait, what? Was there something wrong with the Audis? <laughs> well, I mean, I didn't realize that when it broke, I could afford to fix it. Like that, that was like, <laughs> and they do break. Who were your friends that you were hanging out with? Who were um, these dudes? So like, I only really kind of ever had like the same friends kind of growing up. So the same crew from Catskill yeah. moved down with you? Uh, the guy, yeah. So they would work with me during the week. We'd live down there oh. and on the weekends they'd go home. So we'd leave Sunday night at like three o'clock in the morning or whatever. And then we'd be there to work Monday. And then we had a place that we'd rent and we'd live down there, work all week and then come back up. Weren't you in a band or something too? Yeah, yeah, I played in a funk ska band. Shout out to Funk Shop Loomis. I think everyone's probably dead in that band. But uh, <laughs> And were you guys playing gigs back then? Yeah, so we were playing gigs back then. So I ended up, uh, man, I wish I had a, my wife has a great picture of me at the house with my band. I had platinum blonde hair and like my ears pierced. <laughs> and they're like stretched out and I got the gauges. Oh, the right. whole thing, huh? Oh, yeah. So like, this is like, so this is 1999, well, I 2000. started playing drums as a kid in church as a, you oh. know, and play that gospel music, you know. So when so, you weren't. Covering so you got people all those like chops. blankets. <laughs> so it's all those kind of like old gospel chops. And, uh, and so I started playing drums when I was eight and, um, you know, I wasn't like that. We ended up kind of moving out of being, you know, really poor and, and, um, you know, kind of got to like, I guess you could say like, I guess what would be considered middle class or whatever, you know? Yeah. Cause your dad had a legit job with the union and the railroad. Yeah. But he left the railroad and that's railroad. when we kind of went down because God was going to pay us. <sighs> Jack. <laughs> yeah. And so you guys were gigging. You were in a gigging band. Gigging band. Yeah. We actually, uh, the band Funk Shop Loomis opened up for Long Beach Dub All Stars. Um, we played. You out, bro. Yeah. Actually, I have a demo. We actually have a demo CD. We had a song um, called Single Man. And uh, TV dinner's always the same because I'm a single man. <laughs> One night stands are calling my name because I'm a single man. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, we were, we were a, kind of a jam band and funk ska band. And I like that kind of chops. I like gospel music. Like, you know, that's kind of what I grew up with. And um, guys like Dave Weckl and Ginger Birch. And, uh, you know, so I was really actually thought I was going to become a professional drummer. That mm -hmm. was like what I was really aspiring at the time to be. Um, and I probably would have been had I stayed on the trajectory had nine eleven not happened. Um, I mean, I was, uh, getting, I just gotten sponsored by Evans Drumheads, JD Adario. Um, so I was, I was getting pretty like serious and I probably wouldn't have stayed with that band forever. I would have moved up, you know, into you know, various bands and, Damn, so selling out your band before you even made it, bro. I know. <laughs> Look at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would have moved up from Loomis <laughs> Funk. <laughs> yeah, funk music's guy. It definitely gets people. Moving. Well, ska is like the fact that you were playing ska music. Yeah. I mean, it's, is like real is big pretty fish rare. type stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it, well, it's a particular style of playing too. It's a lot of like odd time signatures, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, and so it's, it's, and funk and gospel and all that kind of stuff has a similar foundations, you know, it's all based off of kind of like jazz, you know? So that's what I did, you know, and I played a lot of like Christian music, you know, it was like Jesus rock. Um, and let me tell you something, you get the youth group girls when you're like Jesus rock star, <laughs> you totally do. <laughs> you're playing like at the huge youth camps and stuff, you know, you're like, you, you're the guy, you're driving the beats, you know, <laughs> we love the Lord, but you know, what's your name? Christian youth camp <laughs> attendance just went down by 80% <laughs> for young girls. By the way, don't go there. I'll <laughs> never send my kids there. It's the worst, you know, <laughs> back of the van. So... So, I, uh, so all that's kind of where you're at. You're busting your ass working. Yeah. You're playing music and making money, enough money to buy an Audi that you really can't afford to fix. But still, you got the Audi. Yeah. And then September 11th comes. Yeah, September 11th came, and I had never like you know thought about joining the military or anything like that. Where were you on September 11th? Because you're in the city. So I was in Queens, New York. Yeah, I was on a telephone pole when it happened. Uh, so I was on a railroad pole at the time. My job was to send a, so time Warner was being stood up high speed internet road runner. Mm -hmm. And we had to isolate those systems with what they call power supplies. And so power supplies had to be isolated. So if there was a lightning strike, it would only go like 300 feet before the next pole and not blow the whole system. Mm -hmm. 
So I had a job putting in these power supplies and then grounding everything to power, bell, cable, and then all the way down into the ground. And then I would install these big supplies and then wire everything up. And I got paid for everything. I mean, if I put like a screw on, I could bill for it, whatever it was. So it was, it was a good gig. I mean, making seven, 800 bucks a day after I paid my guys and all my expenses. So it was like, it was good money. And I was a hustler. And so, I mean, I could just, I would work when the sun was up, like, you know, I was on my second cup of coffee and making money. So, um, yeah, the, the first plane hits the World Trade Center. I'm on a telephone pole. I have no idea what's going on. Um, and I get a call in the next tell from a friend of mine that tells me that uh, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. And at first I really didn't believe him. And um, I come down off the pole and end up, like, meeting a lady who's had her door open, like, right next to where the pole was, basically. She lived right by the railroad tracks. And what a terrible place to live. Oh my God. When people live by the railroad tracks, it's just like. Especially on the East Coast. Like when you drive, when you take the train, they'll, the railroad tracks. Yeah. If you live by the railroad tracks, it's a bummer. That's, that's rough. Let's face it out here in California, you can live by the railroad tracks in Encinitas and have an ocean view that in a house that you paid $4.8 million for. It's not that way on the East Coast. No, your house is made of shingles. Yeah. They're like, the, the house, you know how those houses are shingled? Yeah. It's like, yeah, these are keep working going. on the roof. Let's just keep going. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was like, so I come down, I see this lady, she's in there, she's watching the news. Husband was a Port Authority police officer and she was kind of crying and emotional. You know, then obviously the other plane hits and like at the time I thought like, America was like under attack or we're being invaded. I, I don't know. I had all these like weird thoughts probably from watching like movies and red, know, red, Dawn's red dawn happening now. Yeah. yeah. Jed. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I, uh, I go back to the yards and I got my buddy with me. We got rid of the other dude. We gave him his hundred bucks and, and I was like, I'm going into the city and my buddy's like to do what? And I'm like, I don't know to like help out. And he's like, you don't know anything. I remember this conversation we were having because I did. I don't know what I was gonna do. I was be a victim or something. But how old are you? Uh, uh, I was twenty one. Okay. Yeah, so I'm forty two now, and so I was like, so I go in there, drop everything off, take the Audi, get on the LIE four ninety five, and I'm like hauling ass down there. There was no traffic. It was crazy, and I'm like maxing this car out. It's probably why I broke down. And I get to the, I think it's the Lincoln Tunnel. And there's like already tactical teams and guys all standing there and tell you how tight security was. Like I had like a bunch of like cable TV and electrical IDs and like just, you know, (laughs) I look like a state department guy in Iraq, you know, I had like the (laughs) million badges or whatever. And I tell them I'm like a demolition crew and can you, can you let me through? And they're like, yep, bring it in. And so I just drove right on through and we went down there and parked and, that's when I, you know, towers had fall, listen to the radio. And that's when, uh, I realized like the severity of everything that was happening. Like I could see the smoke and people were screaming and running everywhere. And I'd never seen anything like that in my life. And, um, so I ripped the sleeve off my shirt, put it on my face and my buddy and just walked into the smoke. N- basically at this point, I had no idea where I was going. So I would stay there for 24 hours till September 12th. And, um, that was a. Uh, what, what were you doing? At first, like nothing. I was just like trying to like see if anybody needed help, but like I needed help myself because I was covered in the smoke and everybody was running the opposite way. So I ended up getting in there and then they were putting together these like makeshift shirt. It was total chaos. Like I don't think that people, unless you were there, like realized like there was really no organization. It wasn't like there was half, you know, the fire department was dead. There were smash vehicles, cop cars everywhere. So we kind of started like getting together with groups to like look for people late in the afternoon. I ended up seeing like a guy's leg sticking out from underneath a police car and a bunch of us got over there and lifted it up and he was dead. And I remember like all the gravel and everything was like shoved into his face. He must've hit underneath the car. I, I don't know to speculate, but whatever happened, the car lifted up and smushed them. And <clears throat> so people like pulled them out and they pulled like some blankets over them and fire department came in, Citibank tower fell, that tower, you know, mm-hmm. mystical tower seven. I was like right there. 
and uh, you know, for a couple of hours, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. It was one of the most terrifying experiences in my life until I became an SDV guy. Did, did you stay put? Did you just stay there? I just stayed there with my shirt over my head, but I couldn't breathe. And then the, you know, I go to the fire department, they watch my eyes out, and I stayed there all night. I found like an arm and like intestines, like, and I crawled inside the World Trade Center. Like I was sliding down the metal beams into the belly of the World Trade Center, and it was like the most insane noises I ever heard in my life, like creaking and, you know, just like smoke and steam. And it was just, it was so chaotic. I had no idea what I was doing, but I wanted to help. I had, <clears throat> I have this memory of like, I had a bicycle tube tire on my hard hat with those little like disposable ever ready, like red and green, like with the white switch lights. Mm -hmm. That was my headlamp. I had them like tied on there to the rescue. And even if I found somebody, I don't really know what I would have done because I had zero skills really. And um, so I, you know, I'm right by that iconic picture of where the exoskeleton of the World Trade Center is, where the guys are raising the flag and it's all over the posters and stuff. I'm like sitting off to the right. And uh, so the next morning I was there, got some food out of like a smashed up like little bagel cart that was there with my buddy. And and I remember for the first time since like that dude hit me in the head with that bug nut, I uh, I was like crying really hard. Like I, ne I could feel the death. I could feel the departure of life in that area. Like you could feel the immense loss. And um, I was sitting there with my buddy. I'm like, we're just crying. And he just looks at me. He's like, man, like, what are we going to do? The sun's coming up. It's the next morning. And I just looked at him. I was like, I'm going to fucking kill whoever did this. And he was like, okay. Like, you know, he kind of patted me on the back like, yeah, okay. And so um, <clears throat> I ended up um, deciding in 2003 that I joined the military. Because what happened was I lost my contract like six, eh, maybe it wasn't six months, maybe three months later. I lost my contract. So, th <laughs> So through the end of... 2001 you you go back to work go back start to work working. but then they're like you know all this economic ambiguity all the new build all the stuff they start cutting i'm like low guy in the totem pole you know subcontractor so i own like all these like um uh like all this line equipment that i bought and you know i had a truck that was i bought that payments on i had my audi like <laughs> like i had all this shit and now i'm like you know basically i'm just trying to keep everything afloat i couldn't find any work everyone's freaking out i'm watching the, i'm glued to the tv you know 24-hour news cycle and so i ended up selling everything off picked up some like side work and uh and then moved out to big sky montana uh and i got a job as a ski tech out there because I was just like, I was, was watching this Warren Miller movie, and he said, if you don't pack up everything that you have and move to Big Sky, Montana, you only be one year older when you do. <laughs> and I was like, so I got a job out there in a ski shop, uh, fixing skis. And so I worked out there, came back. Did you know anything about skiing? Yeah, I had, I mean, my idea of skiing, like, I hate them. Like I basically just like stole the skis, like, and I would. I had a pair of wire snippers, and that's how I learned how to ski. Um, my parents did take me on like a youth group thing one, but I spent most of the time trying to like make out with a girl, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then get saved on the next Sunday, <laughs> get forgiveness. But I uh, no, I would. Um, I would go up with a pair of like wire snippers, and you know, used to have the old yeah. things, and I would like snip them off and put them on my jacket. And that's how I would ski. And I would ski all the time like that. Um, I know it sounds terrible. And I'm sorry if you're listening and I did that to you. It's for your forgiveness. But, <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's how I was, you know. I mean, I didn't really, I didn't, have, right. I didn't have, you know, a lot of things. And so, um, so anyway, I went out there and I worked in the ski shop. And I was just basically was a ski bum. And it was awesome. And I met my, um, I met my first and only ex-wife. So, uh <laughs> she was like a work exchange program from Brazil, a little spotty on the English, so it worked mm -hmm. well. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so, so I ended up, you know, working out there for basically about a year coming back and then getting on a line crew. And that's when I decided I was going to join the military. And then how'd you figure out the Navy? Well, um, I tried to join the army cause I had seen like everything, Roberts Ridge and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, I didn't know like a ton about the military and, I, they, you know, of course the army's trying to get me to go in the infantry and you work your way up and this is where it starts. And I'm like, mm, I didn't. So a Navy guy <laughs> actually came out 
and like saw me and I kept going to the mall because the recruiting station was in the mall, um, which meant, you know, go try to get in the military. And if it didn't work out, get an orange Julius and eat a pretzel. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what it's kind of my Is first. orange Julius still around? Is that still a thing? Uh, I think all thing. their customers died. <laughs> <laughs> One leg at a time. Yeah, freaking diabetes, all of them. <laughs> diabetes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So Far. eventually, a Navy recruiter sees you. He see well. He's like, he starts chatting it up with me. He's like coming back for lunch in one day, and he's like, "Oh, hey, I've like seen you coming here a bunch. Like, what are you doing? You're always like here." I'm like, "Well, they're like, I'm trying to get a rain, go in the Rangers." And uh, he's like, "Well, why do you want to do that?" And I was like, "Oh, because you know they're the best in the world." He goes, "No, they're not." <laughs> and he's like, "Let." Me you got a minute, let me show you a video. And he brings me in there and shows me like the CJ Croc is kind of video. Like <laughs> it's, it's like the dudes doing flutter kicks of the shorts and they're like in the desert. Like, I mean, it was <laughs> at the time, the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. And I was just like enthralled. I and mean, these dudes are like doing the triangle defense and like they're, so I was like, man, he's like, yeah, the Navy SEALs, like they're the best. And I was like, Whoa, man, what do I got to do? He's like, man, you got to just sign up, take a little PT test. Like, I was like, great. Like, so I go through all this stuff and it took me a little while to get longer to get in than I had wanted because I had a, had a couple like little altercations mm -hmm. in my life. I had to get cleared up. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So I, uh, ended up started doing like a bunch of research and I was like, I could barely swim. I, I could swim, but I wasn't like that kind of swimmer. Mm -hmm. So I started, uh, I started training. Uh, I bought the, uh, like a Navy SEAL workout book <laughs> and, uh, I started boxing again. Cause you grew up boxing. I grew up boxing. Yeah. How much did you box when you were a kid? Uh, on and off pretty much since I was like about 10. Nice. Yeah. I started in Catskill, New York, same place Mike Tyson learned mm -hmm. Catskill village boxing. There you go. Yeah. And, uh, I so actually you, continued. So you understood working out. Cause if you never yeah. did that. You, you but working really out back in the day was kind of like it, the toe touchers, you know, you're doing the side. Yeah. It was not as like, you know, scientific as it is today. No, I remember getting ready to come in the Navy and thinking like, dude, you know, I did whatever, five sets of eight pull-ups. Like uh, what a good workout. Cause you just had no idea. I mean, this is like 89. So yeah. there's no, well, at least there was no information available that I had. I mean, I wasn't going to go to the libra library. You couldn't just Google shit and figure it out. So, and at least if you box, like you knew, even if you just knew, like you got to push yourself, like you obviously, did yeah. you compete in boxing? Yeah. Boxing oh, then, you, then you knew, yeah. like you, you knew how to push yourself hard in a workout. At yeah, least. Absolutely. But that was like a different kind of like, in the sense, basically the workouts I was doing was, was running, push us, pull. So like I was, I would get up in the morning, I would get up before work. So I had a job. I started working for a roofing contractor once I was working for a line guy. That job kind of foiled out, and thank God, these guys were crazy. I was working up in Glens Falls. Anyway, Lauren Cruz got some crazy people in it. You know, they got a lot of problems. Like, I find myself living in a trailer in Glens Falls with this dude, Johnny, because he didn't want to pay my hotel or whatever. But anyway, so I'm, like, doing that. I ended up getting a job for this roofing company, so I'm roofing all day. I'm working at a pizzeria at night, and on the weekends, I worked for this guy, Sanja, this Ugandan guy, <laughs> who had a bunch of slums, and I would go in there and basically patch everything up temporarily, you know? <laughs> I wish flex tape was around, <laughs> because I was, <laughs> was basically, you know, flex taping everything, just to make it, like, you know, pass the sniff test for the renters. And uh, so I was working three jobs, and, you know, busting my ass making pizzas. And matter of fact, this is, so when I went to Bud's, I had a bicycle that I bought uh, from a guy that came in the pizzeria. Uh, it was a really cool um, specialized stump jumper, mm -hmm. like for the day. It was oh, like it sure. had like the shocks. I mean, it was okay. like it was sick. And I took that to Buds with me. I bought it for sixty bucks and at the pizzeria. And I sold that bike to Mike Evert, who was my neighbor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, just a little factoid, but um, so if he still has that, you know, I don't know if the number. Oh, you hot. mean Mikey Everett? Mikey Everett, the know? team guy. Yeah. Oh, wait, he was your neighbor? Yeah, he was my neighbor when I lived in Buds. I lived in Imperial Beach. Okay. And I lived like two blocks over him. And how I met him was I was going through Buds. Of course, I show up with you know I got the tow head, and. I, he was selling a Jeep and I had seen the movie. I wanted a Jeep as Navy SEALs and I did end up getting one. Uh, 
I mean, I, I once I went in, I like bought into it like big time. I became like a Navy SEAL historian. I bought every single book. I've read everything, you know, uh, from hunters and shooters, you know, men of devils with green. I read everything, the stories that, I mean, I was like obsessed. And uh, that's how I am. I'm like a total immersion guy. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> Mikey was I li when I lived in Coronado when yeah. I was at Team One. Yeah. Mikey was at Team One. Mikey was in my platoon at Team One. We lived in the upstairs apartment, and he lived in the downstairs apartment. So I have many, 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 many Mikey stories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so freaking awesome. I would go over like so. I met him, and he's like, I went over there, and I was like, oh, how, like how much for your Jeep? He's like, are you in buds? And I was like, yeah. He's like. Phew. The fuck out of here. He said something like that to me or something. I was like, if you come back when you get a brown t shirt or something, he said to me. I ended up like getting him known through Buds. I and he's like the nicest guy ever. He's the nicest, he's the guy. nicest guy ever. And his wife, you know, just yeah. a little gal. Um, just great, great people. For sure. Yeah, his dad was like a Hell's Angel and he was like on Easy Riders and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, um, super cool people. The, the best, man. The best. But yeah. Mike and I used to get crazy with stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So I was like, so I went over. I remember I sold my bike to him. Uh, I needed like the money. I forget, I forget was why I was selling. I wish I never sold it. Um, but I sold him that bike that I bought at the pizzeria and uh, for 60 bucks. Mm -hmm. I think I sold him for 150 So Damn, ripping off. Shout Mikey. out to the business mind. <laughs> Got you, Mike. So. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm like, so I'm training for buds. I'm like, basically order the baits, like six, two sixes or whatever they were and the pants and, and I just start working out and, and training my ass off and I ended up meeting a guy named through my recruiter, a guy named Drew Bissett. Do you know who he is? An, an old so. team guy. He was a, he was a commander. I don't think I know. Yeah. And he start start off in UDTs and went on and they ran this like seal, um, training course in Greenwich, Connecticut. So you would go down there and you're supposed to get this like letter of approval or like recommendation. And I never got shit from it, but it was a great experience because I met a bunch of guys that later on I would go on and serve with. Um, and we would train like on the once a month together for like a whole weekend. And I'd never done anything like that. And so it was a really good experience. I, you know, worked out tons and you know, I'd work out in the morning, work out in the evening. I show up to Bud's, uh, you know, go through uh, boot camp, which was like, I'll never forget it because I remember the boot camp guy was like, I had, I got busted taking the lunches for the sick people and eating them at night. <laughs> and I was so hungry because I would like go work out in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. and I was so nervous about failing. Yeah. Um, and I got busted. And so they, you know, they had all these restrictions going on. Then they had that dive motivator program going on run by, uh, Jody McIntyre was running right at the on. time. And so I would like go over there and I'd get these little passes. And then I started knowing all the scruffs waiting to go to buds. And so they would give me these passes. And then eventually I was just kind of filling them out and leaving like, <laughs> and wandering around boot camp, Right. <laughs> so I started calling my, 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 my now ex-wife, um, and I'd go in the phone booth and I got busted by the chief like right before graduation. So I never really got to see my family. They restricted me before I left to go to Bud's or whatever. Uh, I was eating M&Ms and I was like in the booth and I was like, I saw my chief and I was like, I just timed it wrong. Like literally I was, I was walking out with like chips on my chin. I like walked out. He's like, looks at me and I was like, I have a pass. And, and he's, and he's like, give me your pass. I it look at it. He's like, apart. who signed this? And I was like, uh, uh, Petty Officer Johnson, like, <laughs> oh shit, like, I got it. that was my first taste of like the military has you by the balls, mm. and um, yeah, so I show up, uh, class up with class two five four. Matter of fact, Brian, I graduated with Brian Bourgeois. Oh, right on. Yeah, Brian was a, was a buddy of mine, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I classed up with them, and yeah, cruise through. Uh, I think we graduated thirteen original guys out of that class. Graduated with, like. Guys like Ryan Bates and, uh, uh, yeah, I remember I didn't shout out to Ryan Bates. For I, didn't, sure. I didn't like him at first because everyone's like, hey, Ryan's like, he does like, he wrestles at the lion's den. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is the lion's den? <laughs> you know, and everyone's like, he's like in the best shape ever. <laughs> like everyone was there. I was like, freaking beat his ass. Like I, I just was like not having it. You know? We ended up becoming super good buds, you know, but. He's awesome. Yeah. I, was, I, I tell a story a lot but I don't say his name, Brian, but uh, it's like one of those moments where I was, they were going through training and through workup training yeah. and I was running the training 
and there's like total chaos going on in the mount town and there's just like everyone's getting shot up with paintball or whatever and no one's making any decisions and i could already i a guy like him he stood out because he's just like he's was stud. freaking stud and was yeah. squared away and I don't think I had trained with, because eventually you know, we trained together in jujitsu and whatnot. So I think I kind of knew that or whatever, but that wasn't, he was good a, as an operator, you know, yeah. beyond jujitsu, he was good as an operator and I knew it. And you could all, you could tell like in a platoon, there'd be like two guys that were good or three guys that were good or whatever. And it might be the OIC, it might be the platoon chief, it might be the LPO, or it might be some for freaking random E5. So I'd been watching him and there's some total mayhem and chaos going on. And he's like crouched down behind a wall. And I walk over to him like, hey, bro, what's going on? He's like, just, just get crazy. And I, I said, what do you think you should do right now? And he's like, we should, we should freaking strong point that building. And I go, why don't you make it happen? He, and he, it was beautiful. The look on his face was like, oh, I can do that. And he just is like, hey, we're strong pointing that building over there. And here's like, you know, I don't even know if he's a new guy or maybe he's a one cruise wonder or whatever. Yeah. He started making calls and people just listened and they did what they're supposed to do. And uh, yeah, I love that guy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, you know, I, I have, so uh, Van Wilson, he was a team guy that uh, uh, got killed in a car crash day after we graduated, but uh, Academy grad officer. Oof. He was an NCAA wrestling champ. Monster. I know we're all heartbroken. We all got like tattoos the night before or whatever together and you know, we're all all super tight and yeah, that was uh that that you know, being in buds and that like that changed my life, you know, that whole that whole experience, you know, I was like finally like a part of something, you know. Did you have trouble with anything? You said you weren't that great of a swimmer, did you figure it out? No, I aced everything <laughs> except for the last swim of buds. Uh as a matter of fact I would have been the first time every time had I not dragged another friend of mine who's getting ready to get out uh, because he was he was done after that. If he didn't pass that, it was over for him. And he was like sandbagging like crazy Ugh. and had to drag him. But yeah, that's pretty good that you were able to not really be like a water guy and pass everything. That's yeah, I mean, later on I would become, you know, I started competing in a, you know, a free dive spearfishing you know, around the world. Um, so, I mean, I that water experience and then being an SDV guy, which was like, if they, they should just have the STV at Bud's like day one, <laughs> everyone get into this. We're going to sink it under the water into the dark. Mm -hmm. You would, you would, it would, you would weed out like 75% of the people. A it, lot of people. It's terrifying. And, um, so I got out, went, you know, went to 18 Delta, went to the soccer meta course and then, uh, um, got sent to STV team one. How tall are you? Six, four. Do they even think about that at all? I mean, that just doesn't make sense, bro. No. Uh, <laughs> so if you don't, know, STV yeah. is like a mini sub, yeah. and it's it's a it's what's called a wet submersible, which means when you're in it, it's filled with water. So it's not like you're in a little submarine, like James Bond, all listening to iTunes with <laughs> with the freaking heater on. It's it's like this tiny. They're not big. They're small, and they fill up with water. Ocean water, <laughs> like not yeah. like warm water. Ocean water is around you. You can't move in it. There's a guy in front of you. And so like the dive profiles get so, um, you know, I went to STV school. I crashed the STV like before I graduated, which was great because I ended up becoming a backseat guy and I got to do the real world mish. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> I was like, I'll never forget. I had an officer next to me. I can't remember his name. He was a total dick. And <laughs> and he was like so bossy. He's a new officer. He yeah. knows he wants to, he wants to lead me. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm, but we drive. <laughs> They nav. Mm -hmm. So I got the stick. I'm like, you know, controlling the ballast. I'm like, you know, and I was like, hey, uh, sir, I think there's like, there's something in front of us. I think he's like, just stay on this course. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. He's like, it's just artifact. I'm like, I think that's a thing. Like, <laughs> and I was like, so I was, I was like, okay, fine. So I like crank accelerate, it up. Accelerate. And I'm like, accelerate. <laughs> and I hit it. And it was like out in the middle of the ocean. It was like one of those like, rock little jetties uh, with the with the little lighthouse on it uh, and all of a sudden it was like you know we come rocketing out and all of a sudden it's like all the water drains out it's like shh. i'm like hmm so i like open up the door and i like look down and there's like land <laughs> and i look at him he's like oh shit like we're there and so that was the end of my driving career um and he was he was pissed because i i did i said okay fine and i just accelerated right into it so um graduated stv school go out to the team and uh you know that's when i started learning like how sophisticated that really is mm -hmm. and how you know it's super complicated you're diving mixed gas rebreathers 
an open circuit all in these various profiles throughout a very long dives under under pressure and like very, 12 and hours eight hours eight like hours. yeah and you you'll switch on and off so you'll be like you know you can't be on uh, a rebreather you know because you get oxygen toxicity toxicity or you you can't be on all heliox or nitrox or you can't be on all open circuit because of nitrogen narcosis so you're like and then you have these like computers with all these like lights that blink and like these huge like screens and i could never remember like i knew that double red was not good <laughs> even like, i know that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it was I like double that. red and i'd be like uh manually enter the air like and i'm like oh double green i i, I think it's okay solid i'm good and so there's a guy right in front of you and you can't move so he sits in between your legs all your gear and all your equipment gets shoved in the back and then everything is pitch black so when we were training for the national tasking like everything's by memory every single thing has a knot every single light has a signal you know because you're not using the under the ots system you know because it can be heard so everything is by feel so everything begins like you know first you're in these huge tanks and then you're graduating up until you're in the ocean so everything in this in the pitch black so like when things get out of sync it gets very confusing and then you have to FSA at the end. You have to take your rigs, click it to the outside, and then the sub will surface. And then you, like, blow out, close your rebreather, and kick away. And then the sub leaves, and then you're on the surface. And then you swim ashore, you know. And then you have underwater pingers that find you, like, all that kind of stuff. So it was, like, at first, like, not what I had, like, signed up to do. <laughs> like, meanwhile, I'm, like, watching the news, you know. It's like, kah, 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 like let's go. Like, right. And I'm, like, underwater, like. <laughs> like hand signal. So um, I wouldn't change it for anything in the world because of the team I got to be a part of, what we got to do, um, and the knowledge that I gained of that mobility platform. Uh, it was something that I think like within the teams is so like niche. And most people think, you know, because the STV guys always get like bad rap, you know, like, oh, freaking like yeah, STV guys. Like, um, but I got out of that and then I got to augment damn neck. So uh, seven days later after that deployment. So, yeah, the, it's, I, the, the attitude of like, Oh, SDV guys. Like I, I don't know at some point, And I was pretty young when I was like, yeah, you know what? That those guys freaking get my respect. Yeah. And cause it's a, I, I don't know. I, I, mean, I talked to some of my friends. One of my friends in particular was like, who came from SDV and was at whatever team we were at. And I remember he's a good dude, a solid dude, and a like team, a reliable team guy that you would want to go with you on op. And one time we were talking, he was like, "Hey man, we were doing like some exercise off of Korea, and you know it's winter time." And he was like, <laughs> "He told me the story, and he's all like, he's all like in the like it starts filling up with water, and he's like, I don't want to do this anymore.'" Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like he's like, I don't want to do this. I don't. Want, this is not what I. This is not what I want to do. I don't yeah. want to do this anymore. Like literally having dor thoughts. Like he wants to quit after he's been in the team for ten years, bro. People bolt. We've had team guys. I won't call them out, but like there was team guys that would freak panic. I mean, you can get. We had a we had a chief uh, in my second platoon who drowned and died. Yeah. Um, I mean, he got tangled up in the lines on a bottom up. You know, because they would bottom up underneath stuff, and mm -hmm. it was. Uh, it's sketchy. There's lines everywhere. There's God. stuff going. Everything's by merit. You have all this gear, all this equipment, all this stuff. Like it is, you have to maintain like a totally cool mind. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you get into like dry dock sheltering and in the real world and all those kind of things, like things can go sideways quick. There's no, there's no mistakes. Matter of fact, I remember we were training for that, for that mission. I was at 80 feet on a rebreather with my buddy. Um, my my best friend actually like we're down in the bottom i remember like i had like a leak in my mask and i was like looking i was like pointing you know doing the signal like, like there's a problem he's like typical he's like you're good and i remember i was like and the whole piece goes and i was like like and i was like and he looked at me he's like there is no buddy breathing you're in like a full face mask he's like and i just remember him like gonna watch you die he just he just looks at me like you're dead like and i remember i just was like and started, so you just blow and go hey blow and go 80 feet yeah it was wild uh, he's like i'll never forget your face it was hilarious <laughs> i was like it was hilarious because i could never make that piece again unless i'm about to die <laughs> we did we used to do more sub ops in the regular teams yeah and so 
you know, like I did a, a few trips of doing lockouts and stuff. And yeah. even that, you know, you're in this little freaking chamber and it's filling up with water and it's freezing cold and you got it. What do we have? We'd have like weapons bags and engine bags and all this stuff in there. And it's all claustrophobic, and I'm 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 very comfortable in the water. Yeah. But like guys did not like even that, and that's one you know one hundredth of what it's actually like. Because when we do that, we'd be like, cool, hey, we're gonna do we're gonna do sub ops for a week or whatever, two weeks. Yeah. You guys just like, oh, what are we doing for the rest of our lives? Sub ops. <laughs> just <laughs> it's like God. It's like so you could kind of gut through something, right? You know, you oh, learn you're gonna just yeah. gut through something, but if that's just your life. And you know what? Yo, we, we just did a 12 hour dive today. Cool. What are we doing tomorrow? A 12 hour dive. Oh, man. It never, it's like, you, sucks. you had to, uh, I mean, you, you got to learn to relax. Like, you can't freak out in those situations at all. No. No, like, you know, we used to always say, like, those who panic first die. If you panic, you'll die. I mean, the, the, what happened to, uh, you know, that chief that died was, he got tangled up in some lines and you know then his mask got pulled off and there was no getting at, there's no getting out like there's no you're it's pitch black you know and the worst is you know the bioluminescence like all that kind of you're like completely blinded um you know and then working all the way up to a national tasking with those guys and doing all that stuff um matter of fact uh we had a, we were like getting to the point we didn't know where we were going we didn't know any of that information uh still you know still classified to this day probably always will be and you're just getting sick of the same people. You know, you're the same prop, same personalities, the same dirty coffee cup, the same dude, the same, you know, it's the same. And we were traveling all around the country in different environments, like, you know, preparing for anything. And uh, I remember finally our chief at the time was like, he called us smokers. And he got in big trouble because he's like, okay, this is it. We got to settle all these beefs before we leave and oh, deploy. Jack. You were like, oh, I'm uh, in. <laughs> well, at first, I didn't really have problems with anybody. I was oh, kind okay. of just like, whatever. And um, So you were a new guy when this was going down? Was yeah. this your first? First, oh, first. Damn, that's freaking savage, man. New guy. And so um, I was like, you know, I'm super moto guy. Like, I was just like so, you know fired up and did you know what you were getting into into when you got assigned sdvs were you just no like, cool, well whatever. i had read the old books about the dudes like in the tortito like Tor getting covered in grease and like squirting out of like a sewage pipe or whatever <laughs> old school you know but that's that's really all i knew about it. i had no idea um and uh yeah so like he had calls us smokers and we're getting ready to leave and he's like hey we're gonna put the board up here officers and it doesn't matter everybody write your name on the board one five minute round Sorry. By the way, yeah, that's just so if you don't know, Echo, you know what Smokers is? Yes, sir. Okay. Smokers is, hey, we're going to, it's usually boxing. It's like we're just going to spot boxing. boxing yeah. yeah. And they do it on ships too. They do it, well, at least they used to. They used to have smokers on ships and smokers on Navy bases. We're just going to go and box other people. Yeah. So that's what, it, like, the military was, like, tough back in the day. But it was Jack. a great, let me tell you something. It leveled the scores between a lot of people. And I didn't, so everybody, like, got up and you had to write your name on the board with the guy that you wanted to <laughs> fight. And, of course, like, some guys jumped up right away and, like, wrote the guy's name down. And, <laughs> and I just kind of sat back. I'm like, and then this dude gets up, and he's one of the divers, and he writes my name on the board. Jack. I was like, hmm, I didn't know we had, like, a problem. So I was like. So we go. And he didn't know you freaking box since <laughs> you were 10 years old. Well, I wore all my shit. So we like, so everybody starts coming to me and they're like, hey, like, help me out. They're all nervous now. And then, so I'm working with some guys. A week goes by. It's like a Friday night or something. We show up there and, and I wore like my old boxing trunks. I got like, you know, custom gloves. I got all my stuff. No headgear. I didn't want anything. I had my gold teeth, like mouthpiece. And I put it in. I'm like. <laughs> and so when I was in the medic course, I actually um, was sparring partner for Ray Mercer. Um, Dang. Yeah. That kind of ended my hopes of like thinking that I was going to be like great someday. I don't know. You know how we, you know, men are like, we just kind of think like, <laughs> <laughs> but I ended up, I, so like to backtrack a little bit, I started boxing again while I was going through the medic course in Fort Bragg for a year. And, um, I end up fighting in the North Carolina state prison. So boxing like guys like Bernard Hopkins and them, they come up out of the prison programs. And so I went in there, went through all the security stuff, whatever. And I fight like a, you know, various rounds, kind of like a, a tournament style. And I ended up winning to like the top guy. Well, we it was a draw, the top guy. And he was like the scariest. <laughs> dude. I'm telling you, he was like the biggest, 
scariest dude. <laughs> he was doing like 17 to life and Ray Mercer was there. And so his coach saw me boxing or whatever and was like, hey, Ray's like getting back in the game, which he did. And he ended up fighting like Tim Sylvia. Oh, that's right. And crushed his face in. Yeah. Okay. Ray Mercer, people don't remember, like that guy was an animal. Beast. Okay. He, he crushed. also unfortunately lost to Kimbo Slice. Kimbo. In, Ray Mercer did? Yep. In MMA. Yep. Uh, he got, but the funny thing is they didn't box. Like somehow, I think I, if I remember right, Kimbo Slice got him in a guillotine. Mm. And Ray and Ray was like, I don't know what this is, but I thought we were gonna fight. They ain't fair. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's <laughs> like so I thought we were gonna fight. So yeah, so like I started. I was. So did you do like a camp with him? Or so did you just no, he, him a few yeah. Times? So I started boxing with him on the weekends, like sparring partner, getting him in shape. And so, uh, you know, I grew up watching Ray Mercer. You know, he devastated Tommy Morrison. He lost to Lennox Lewis. He was a brutal dude. He'd never been knocked down. He had a head like a you know like a giant block of cheese. And <laughs> and. He was merciless. I mean, if you watch that knockout against Ty Morrison, who was like my hero at the time, you know, before he got AIDS. And, uh, but like, I mean, when he beat him down, I remember what he said, he's like, you know, you can kill somebody in boxing. He, that's like all he said. It was like very like, not like, is he okay or anything? <laughs> and when he lost to Lennox Lewis, which was controversial, mm -hmm. actually, um, I kind of ended his career. He had some more fights like along the way. But um, when he hit Tim Sylvia, he, he caved his whole head in i mean he if you watch that clip on youtube i mean it's brutal so i'm in there boxing with him i have a couple great shots of me and him boxing together and he hit me so hard one time that for the first time i like i had to like kneel down on the ground i wasn't really sure like i'm on like roller skates <laughs> like i and i i remember i was like hurt for like a week and i started thinking in my head like man if this is how like people are hitting like at this <laughs> level i don't I think I'll die because like, I don't have a huge neck. Like, I don't know. I just got like more of like a noodle neck. Like uh, no matter how hard I work, I, I need the iron neck or whatever. But um, I, yeah, so I so I, I boxed with him, and then I just kept, I just stayed in shape, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Once I left there, I had three amateur fights, and then boxed with Ray, and then whatever went in the teams. And so we show up at the Smokers, and so I got all my trunks, I got all my stuff, I got my shoes on, my little tassels, and everything, and you know, I got the whole thing in there. And the, he's looking at me over there with his, like, you know, I don't know, off-brand boxing gloves <laughs> or whatever. And he just comes over. He's like, hey, man, I just – I don't – I don't know why I signed up for that. I don't really have a problem with you or anything like that. I mean, it's just, are we good? I'm like, you're dead. <laughs> and we got in there, and I let him, like, punch me around for, like, 30 seconds. I hit him one time, knocked him out. Cold. And so the shout-out to my chief because, like, he got in big trouble because some guys got hurt, and they couldn't mm. die because, they're, they're, cause, you know, their noses. And it was like, dudes, dudes, dudes got beat up. Um, so, yeah, so it was it was a good experience. You know, I uh, – Really, uh, really fortunate that I went there. You know, it was it was a unique experience. And then I, and then seven days later, well, while underway, I got told I was getting getting augmented to TF three seven three. So, and where where'd you go for that? Uh, well, I went to Damn Neck, and did like a train up with them, and then went to Afghanistan to an outstation. And how was that deployment? That one was rough. That one we lost uh, Josh Harris. So I was with him when he died. Um, right next to him and then uh um jason freewald and john markham so oh, that was a that was a tough one and so uh you know that was my first experience in real war you know i mean what i had just come off though like the implications were so high like the intensity that if anything went wrong like literally no one's coming to get you like you know it's uh not going to be good. So, but it was completely different, mm -hmm. you know, uh, than being shot at in the desert. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, that was a really good experience. And then it kind of just like, you know, up to my aspirations, I got to work with some incredible people and, uh, do a lot of really cool missions and kind of do the stuff that I had been hoping to do from when I was sitting there at nine 11 and I had a, you know, an envision of what I was going to do. You know, What were you guys doing? Like pretty much just DAs? Yeah. Was that, was that what you were doing? Do a, DAs, uh, a lot of like SRs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of overwatches for the Army, you know, in various areas. We were at a lot of remote outstations. And then we were with the uh, um, the people that I later went on to work for. Uh, we were kind of the military component for mm -hmm. them. So and so the, the op tempo was high. Op tempo was high. It was 2008. So and you're just living the dream. 
living the dream. Like, I mean, riding dirt bikes, like I'm just like living the dream. Uh, and then, uh, when Josh died, you know, that was my first experience with losing somebody. And then it just was like really real to me that how, you know, it just, it, everything changed after that for me. Um, and that, that mission was, you know, he drowned. Uh, so that was, uh, the way that whole thing went down. That was, that was tough. That was, that was a tough one. And then the guys that were with us, you know, uh, Jason got killed on entry. Uh, he got shot in the stomach and then John Markham got shot in the neck on that. So that was a huge loss in 2008, you know, for the teams. So, so when you, when you say, when you say like things changed or you changed or it changed, what was, what was like the change? Was it, Hey, all of a sudden, Oh, we're not immortal or what was the change that you were, you were yeah, feeling? I think that was it. Like, I think I had this, like, Im I had this like immortality idea in my head where I could outsmart, outrun, outshoot, outdo anything. And then, uh, the realism when someone's wrapped in a flag on a helicopter, you know, as a young guy, I was just like, the implications were so high. I have a great picture at my house. Um, I don't have a lot of military stuff at my house. I have some stuff in my office, but because I don't want to influence my son, you know, I try to, uh, you know, I don't want him to feel that, you know, and, uh, um, it's a picture that was taken by an OGA guy of me that he sent to me later on. And I was standing out looking over the corn gall and, uh, I couldn't believe like where I'd come from and that I'm like standing here with these people, like these men, you know, like who are, were giants to me. You know, because like I said, I became like a historian. I read every book, everything, every, there's probably not a book on the teams that I didn't read. And this was before like a lot of books were coming out. They're like old school books. And I really believe like in the brotherhood, like in the old school, like do everything together kind of mentality. Uh, matter of fact, Kirby Harrell, he's like an old school team guy. Uh, and he was like, I'll never forget. We were like sitting drinking a beer one day when I was a new guy and he's like, He's like, you and you know, this other guy, he's like, you guys are like the spirit of like the old teams, like the old teams, like just, and I, I mean, I was, I like lived it. I loved it. And, uh, um, so, you know, going to actual war though, it's very humbling, you know, and it kind of puts you like in a place where you realize like, this is like super dangerous. Cause to be honest with you, I didn't really think that way at the time, you know? Real quick, Kirby Harrell story because it's just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 Kirby. He, he was on the podcast and he's talking. Oh, really? He's talking about the Phoenix program and yeah. and he's like, yeah. He goes, so he he we'd we'd go up and I was talking to him because you know I have a little bit of perspective of like what doing missions are like. So I was like, so so how would you know what what like hut you're going into in a village? And he's like, oh well. I would, I would a source tell you like, hey, it's three huts down on the right? And he's like, yep, that's what happened. I go, oh, that's cool. And so this one op, they're in a, in a little sampan, him and one other guy, and they go into this village, and, he, and so he's telling the story, and he goes, yeah, you know, so I went in there, and I went into the third hut on the right or whatever it was, knocked the guy out, I come out, throw him in the boat. And so I'm thinking, I'm like, that's cool. And I go, I go, uh, how did you knock him out? He goes, and he goes, without missing a beat. I go, I go, how'd you knock him out? He goes, ball peen hammer. <laughs> <laughs> so like, you see him on his web gear, he's got a ball peen oh, hammer man. and his freaking web gear just whack a dude in the head and that's that. <laughs> that's so bad. That's so badass. <sighs> Back when the men were iron and the ships were wooden. <clears throat> yeah. How long was that deployment to Afghanistan that you did? Uh, I think we were, so four months. Yeah, months like working up, getting ready, and then. Were you still actually technically attached to SDV and yeah. you were there TAD? Yep, yep, that was their TAD. So, so when you got done with that deployment, what happened? I went into, uh, well, I went into another platoon. Like, basically, uh, I got home. My girlfriend, now wife, we've been together for 15 years now, um, married for 10 and she picked me up at the airport and I showed up to drop all my gear off. I got my car. This is coming home from deployment. Coming home from deployment. I get picked up. Uh, no fanfare, obviously, at the command. Like, going to just get all your stuff. And um, hung out with some of the guys for a couple of days and then headed out. And 
uh, I get back to the command, and so I was with Slab. Uh, mm-hmm. So after Josh died, I got went to another base, got to kind of know him, and um, which obviously is like was an icon, you know, looking up to him or whatever. Just like a really great leader, like real, real quiet, real steady. Like you know, um, got to meet him, and I was like, oh, I want to go screen and go to the command or whatever. And so some guys like reached out about me, you know, putting my package in and all that kind of stuff. And so I, it's like a Saturday or something. I get to the, I get my car, I get all my stuff, tell my girlfriend that I'm going to meet her and I'm going to drop everything off and the master chief's there. And so he sees me in the locker room. He's like, come on up. This is the SDV master, master chief. chief track. Yeah. Who I didn't like. And so <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm down there like getting all my stuff just home from deployment like and to be honest with you like looking back like that whole like there was a lot that happened like that was like a lot because i just did back to back so i mean i was like hadn't been there in like a long time and all this stuff had gone down and here i am like checking in thinking i'm gonna like get some time off or whatever and he goes up in the office and he's like hey i want to talk to you come on upstairs and he goes so uh you know you just got back i'm like yeah i just got back like right now you know and he's like, so you think you're going to, like, go over there and, like, screen? Is that what you think? And I was like, w- I'm like, what? Like, apparently some people had sent some emails and said, hey, we want him to come over, blah, 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 whatever. And and I was like, yeah. He's like, well, you know, they're not in charge of manning. I am, he says to me. And I was like, I, thinking about my headspace at the time, you know, I was, like, not in a good headspace. And I was like... I, I said something inflammatory, I think. And he went like crazy and started like screaming at me. He came over the desk, like got in my face, you know, and he's like, you'll go where I tell you to go and da, da, da. And I was like, then I'll fucking get out. You know, like, I, I mean, I've had that kind of attitude. And so we get in this huge thing. I get a text message from the chief. He tells me, hey, um, gear ready on Sunday, 96 hour SR. I'm like, okay. So I like unpack my gear call my girlfriend tell her I'm like packing out so I roll right into another platoon uh, two days later and uh, I was pretty bitter about that uh, nobody like asked me how I was doing nobody was like hey like what's going on like or you know wh- how was your trip like next thing I know I'm like literally like dudes with orange vests walking around looking for me with like rubber shape I'm, like laying in the bushes like, <laughs> <laughs> like I was so mad I can't describe how mad I was uh, the only thing I could do was think about how mad I was and how it would be impossible for me to get any madder. Like, <laughs> or like I would explode. So, um, I go through, you know, I go through that. I ended up, I hurt my hand, uh, and end up rolling out of that platoon right before the tasking. I got a pretty severe arterial injury in my hand. And, uh, so then I go to, like he said, go to trade at, I made E6 and go to trade at. Is this like SDV trade at? Or did you go to? Oh, tr- it was like standoff weapons that we had. It was like no, it was S- like SDV so, trade at so, troop. Th- I forget what it's called. Something. Th- so you're still at SDV. Yeah, but you're in the training. I'm in the training detachment. department, so okay. I'm like going to Seattle a lot and you know working over in those regions or whatever. And then, uh, and then I got out uh, because, and then I tried to screen for. Well, I went into the reserves immediately and then tried to screen for CAG. Uh, and the reserve unit wouldn't let me go. So then I tried to go from the reserve unit. And I remember the master chief at the time, and he wanted me to go sell res uh, for two years and serve my time at the reserves before I could go over there. Because this isn't going to be a stepping stone. Everything I was trying to do was try to get the opportunity to go over there. So then uh, I ended up, uh, I won't say his name because he ended up getting in a lot of trouble, but I ended up meeting, getting picked up and doing a job in Iraq for uh, during the. I think it was a status of forces agreement that was going on at the time, doing like PSD stuff. So, so now you're a contractor. So now I'm a contractor. Still, still, still in the reserves. reserves still in the reserves. But you're so, a contractor. Yep. Yeah, and I was like picking up schools and stuff and going to schools or whatever and trying to like we- figure out how I could like weasel my way like back into active duty. That's all I wanted to do. And I was just really got out of pure spite. I was just so angry like and I look back at like my state and I was like man like luckily I'm like a fairly I mean not sound like it but I'm like a steady-headed person because I was like really like a roller coaster of emotions like I hadn't I had just experienced all this stuff in a nutshell and next thing you know I'm like felt like I was being shitted on you know so I um I'm in Iraq 
and I'm like standing at the green bean and I see a guy who knows me and he's like starts talking to me. He's like, Oh, Hey, what are you doing? I was like, I told him what I was doing. And he's like, give me your email. I, I got another job for you. And so I ended up going over to, uh, you know, contracting for the CIA. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I did like almost four years over there. And did you go, what, what did that, you know, from what you can say, that's cool to say, what was that, did you get some immediate training? Were they like, hey, you're good on your training? What did no. you have to do? I was the only team guy that made it out of the training. Me and three other guys. Uh, first of all, I didn't really, like, I had an idea, but he wouldn't tell me anything. And I got, how it went down was, like, I got a random email being, like, you know, you've been, like, recommended for training. Can you be here on, uh, you know, whatever the date was? And I was in Iraq. So I remember I went to this guy. It was like a total tool bag. He was like some like army guy or something. And I was like, oh, hey, I got to like get out of here. I got like a family health problem. <laughs> and he's like, you can't leave here. I was like, I'll walk right out of this gate and I'll get on my airplane. I'm like, you don't own me. I'll do whatever I want. You know? So finally, like, I, they, they like, they, they made me fly calm air. So I'm like, Micah, like the- <laughs> I do whatever I want. Think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was like, I'm taking this job. Like, I want this job. And mm-hmm. so I couldn't have got out of there and made it the training. So I ended up flying calm air out and i'm like rethinking everything i was about to like baghdad airport like (laughs) there's no orange julius is there (laughs) and (laughs) and i'm like one of these guys is not (laughs) like the others so i fly back and two days later i'm in training and uh at an undisclosed facility Mm -hmm. and it's like go time like can you perform like show up here on the line? Nobody talk, nobody's saying anything. Like nobody's like, I mean, it's like vetting and it's like, I don't know, it's like four or five weeks all over in various locations. And, uh, I show up, it was really funny cause I'm checking into the hotel in one of the States. And of course I'm in the lobby and I look around and it's like, typical contractors like you know huge like american flag had some beards like everyone's like low pro I'm like, okay. <laughs> clearly like clearly we're all here together you know everyone's calling everyone brother like and <laughs> like even the even the guy at the front desk is a brother and and so we check into the uh we check we check in and, and i my roommate is a team guy buddy of mine and so uh as we're like in like He's like a good buddy of mine and I didn't even know he was there. So we're there and, um, he didn't make it, but the, so I get a text message from overseas, like watch the news tonight. Okay. Bin Laden goes down and I'm in the hotel, like no way, you know? And of course, you know, then you got all, you got all the seal experts on there describing exactly how they did it. Like, right. It was like, it was like the, uh, it was like the captain Phillips thing. You know, they had that dude with like, I forget who it was, like Brandon Webb or something. It was like a watermelon, like swinging slowly. And he's like shooting it with a 50 cal, like showing how like difficult it would have been to hit the watermelon. But so I'm like glued to the news show up the next morning. We got like selection starts and, um, you know, PT tests, all those kind of things. And the quals were super hard. Shooting quals? Yeah. They were very difficult. Like, that's what got most people was the quals. And then the CQB, um, I mean, it's – and then they never, like – there's no coaching. There's no, like, if you don't make pass these tests at this time, you're just – you just go away. Mm-hmm. Like, a van just pulls up and you just leave. <laughs> there's no, like, hey, bro, you think you can do better next time? Like <laughs> – I mean, I've, I mean, we're, I was there with cat guys, team guys, like everybody. And so I get to the end, there's only four of us left. And now I'm kind of figuring, I'm in a total state of paranoia too. Cause every movie I ever watched about the CIA is like playing in my head. You know, I like turn the sink on, I'm waiting for like a cable to come out and like, look at me or whatever, you know, like everything, everybody is like, all, everybody's on it, which is kind of funny because when I went through the surveillance course and, uh, I actually got busted by like a big fat lady in a KFC. She like busted me. Uh, so I was like, you know, there is those kind of people. So yeah. they don't discriminate. By the I, way. I was doing like some counter surveillance thing and I was, I was in San Diego and I was all dressed up like a bum and, uh, <laughs> and I'm like sitting there and I'm all freaking dirty and <laughs> shitty and, and I got busted and I got busted cause I had my watch on and mm. like uh, this, you know, so this like whoever yeah. we were surveilling, yeah. 
whatever it was, surveilling the surveillers or whatever. Yeah. And like we got back to the debrief and they're like, hey, you know, Jocko, freaking nice watch. They're like, you got rolled up because yeah. of that. You know, they, everyone, everyone was like, look at you, look like a bum with this freaking uh, Iron Man watch on. It yeah. and this this is, is the healthiest bum ever. Yeah, this was before <laughs> everyone had like the big tactical watches that everybody has now. Yeah. You know, the, but at, back in the day, I guess this was sort of like a big tactical watch, Burke. <laughs> yeah. Know? So, yeah, the old school. That's funny. So not so only a few of you get few through of us thing. make it through, yeah. And so some of the guys got the opportunity to try. It. You know, they were good dudes, and they had them try again. But the quals were like, I mean, were you always a good shooter? Yeah, I was always a good shooter. Uh, I don't not that I grew up. I grew up like you know deer hunting, like mm-hmm. but like I always laugh because now I'm like big archery hunter and stuff, and and a, and actually a hunter. But when I grew up, like hunting was like you know <laughs> shooting out of the back of the truck at like a deer, like in a cornfield, and like. <laughs> You know, like that, that was hunting. Like, you know, like our hunting gear was like, you know, like a onesie snowsuit with like that you bought at Walmart. Six pack. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a six pack. It was like Bubba hunting. Um, but, uh, well, you must have good hand eye coordination from maybe from boxing and everything yeah. to just go in there and knock the shit out of a course like that. That's legit. Yeah. And the pistol, I mean, the pistol shooting was like, they had this one called the rundown. Uh, so it was, you lined up on the 100. All right, and then you would sprint to the two hundred, drop down two shots prone, damn, and then you'd sprint pistol. to the. Damn. No, no, no. This is rifle. Oh, so, I thought you were talking pistol. I was like, damn, no, <laughs> this no, is no, no. joke. No, like, two hundred yards, <laughs> freaking shots, yeah, double <laughs> oh nine. So, um, no, but this was a tough one. So it's full kit on, and then you would start. You had to have six mags and with two rounds in each mag. You'd start at the one hundred, sprint to the two hundred, drop down two shots prone. Then sprint to the 100, two shots kneeling. And then sprint to the 50, two shots standing. Then to the 25, two headshots. Then to the seven, two headshots. Mag change in between every one. You had two minutes and minimum score 24 on a IPSC. Um, that got a lot of guys. And then six seconds, four shots from the concealed, 25 yards um, on the pistol. So that was, and you can't miss. Yeah, that's going to. And then there's like, you know, then sure. by the time you get through all that, then you got like CQB. So I'm like, thinking, and this is the interesting thing about this is no workup. It's not like you went through, no. you came off some shooting school mm-hmm. or you like, okay, hey, let's get you guys all dialed in. Here's your test. It's just like, hey, welcome. Here's your test. Yes. And you're, you're basically testing the whole time because it's like a vetting. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was really funny because we show up and we're at like the, uh, the Dwayne Dieter thing mm. so i thought i was done with that because i went through that in sqt you know <laughs> okay you hit me in the head with a thing it hurts and i i know this is deadly like but you know how they got to do the muzzle, level one yeah. everyone's a level three yeah. it depends who you you know if you got somebody a meathead they're gonna hit you with it so i'm thinking i'm done with that i show up there and i'm like oh no <laughs> like karate chops to the head like so <laughs> we go through all that stuff we get done there's another series of quals at the end you finish that off and then you get offered a job and get ready to start deploying. And then every two years you have to redo it. Uh, and if you fail, you're done. So there's like this looming pressure of like, I have to redo all these things. Uh, and then it gets more like, I went through that and then it gets more like uh, training. There's like, you still have to qual, but there's more training involved. Um, but that the initial one was just the vetting out. And that, that was tough. That was some of the toughest training that I ever went through. So now you get to that job and you're starting to conduct operations. Obviously, there's only so much we can say about the operations, yeah. and, you know, where you're conducting them and kind of what you're doing. But broadly speaking, what was your what was your tasking? Yeah, so um, tasking was to you know protect uh, you know CIA personnel, like you know around the world. Mm-hmm. You know, they conduct their missions. Uh, so it's uh it's intense and you work all the time. There is no moratorium, there is no standing down, there is no you know, you're you're employed and it's onesies and twosies. Um and then there's also like the high vis military side where you're doing the paramilitary stuff depending on what bases you're at. So I was a team leader at a couple of bases where it's like full on I mean, it's full on military. Mm-hmm. Like you're you know, you got a whole you got a whole team of guys underneath you. And uh yeah, it's uh, looking at it from that side and looking at it from the military side is just so different. Like it's unbelievable. Um, and so yeah, it was uh, the team of guys that you're talking about are not Americans. Yeah, or, not yeah. Americans. Yeah, and uh, and you know, 
people can say what they want about those guys and I wouldn't say I trust in all of them, but you really develop a relationship, you know, you, you rely on these guys and, you know, watching Afghanistan fall and it was hard, you know, it was hard. Matter of fact, I met some of the guys recently that got out of the country, uh, last month, uh, they reached out to me and they're, they're here somewhere living in the refugee camp basically. And, uh, they were telling me about what happened to a bunch of our guys. I mean, held against the walls, shish kebab spears stuff through their hearts, you know I mean? Like brutally killed. Um, so it was, uh, it was tough. Uh, I had a good relationship with those guys. So, uh, some of them are here in the States actually, uh, <laughs> funny enough, like one of them, like re I don't know, they don't, we don't use our names, but one of the guys somehow like found me and like reached out to like my secretary. <laughs> Like, I was like, my name is like so-and-so Muhammad. Like, you know, I'm looking for Mike. And they sent it to me. I'm like, <laughs> take everything off the internet. Like, <laughs> <it's> like <laughs> yeah, that's bizarre. It is bizarre. And he, you know, it was, uh, I sat down for a uh, matter of fact, what happened was I was, I won't say where I was, but I was in a, a state for work a, a month ago. My plane gets canceled. Um, so I'm like kind of wandering around like, oh my God, I got to like get another hotel and do all this stuff. I walk into the parking garage and I hear somebody calling me by my call sign. Of course, like my spidey senses like just perk up. I don't, there's not a lot of people that know that. And I like turn and look and it's two of my guys, like where I was the team leader of that place for three deployments. And, uh, and he's like, you know, I'm like, like what's happening right now? So I ended up like, going back to their house with them and having dinner at this, which is like, it's a wicked refugee camp. I just ran into him at the airport. That's all right. Funny. So I sit down and when we go off, I'll show you some pictures of me with them. But, uh, yeah, they started telling me like what happened to all these guys. I mean, dude, it's like, man, that guy is all he's ever done since he was 20 years old was work for the Americans. I mean, his family's been killed. Their houses burned down. People have been beheaded. Um, I mean, they've been tortured. I mean, it's, it's, it's rough. Yeah. This, the amount of people that worked with America in Afghanistan is like a massive number. It's a massive number to think like, oh, well, there's only a small amount of people that are going to bear the burden. It's like, there's a massive number of people that work with Americans. Well, if you look at, uh, you know, kind of in my work with my foundation, um, if you look at the number of, of people that have served in the war, Americans, right? 2.7 million Americans served in the global war on terrorism 20 years right so 7,000 died in the war over 20 years 1,500 are amputated so that's 0. 0.00026 percent um, 0. 0.0056 percent are, are those who have died right and then you look at the fallout though from the war so we just we look at those hard numbers right but we don't look at the cost of it and you look at uh only 4.5% of them are, temp you know, American veterans attempting to start businesses or be entrepreneurs. You know, there's 50,000 nonprofits in North America, two and six vets are on, you know, psychiatric medications. Um, and between 2005 and the end of 2020, 155,000 guys have killed themselves. So <clears throat> people say, well, you know, some of those guys were other vets or whatever, you know, they didn't serve in there. They were Vietnam vets or it doesn't matter. Like <clears throat> that's a huge number. That's every 64 minutes. And so we look at those numbers and the fallout on American culture. And then you got to look at the fallout on the, on the host nation culture. And that, that will be felt for generations. Like, and then what we did, like, Le I don't mean we, but like what our nation did, like we're no longer like a force of righteousness and of good. Like we are, we are colonialists that have destroyed the foundation and fabric. Matter of fact, I was talking to Andy said like, what is it? 98% of all people in Afghanistan didn't know who Osama bin Laden was mm -hmm. and didn't know 9-11 had happened. Right. So, <clears throat> so we just think about our cost of war. But then you got to look at the long-term cost of, of what's the displacement within societies. And it's going to come home to roost. I mean, I was listening to, there was a general who supported us when I worked on the other side of the house. He was a badass. Matter of fact, I have a t-shirt with his face on it. I work out with it all the time. He was a, he was a real, he was committed to the cause. And he was, a, he was, a, we just, we just abandoned him. And they, uh, 
they tore these guys told me they just tortured him viciously and this is a guy that for for 15 years 15 years dedicated his whole life to our nation and they you know they told me what they did what they did to him and i was just like whew, man it's not like there's a cost there's a huge cost you know and i think the cost is felt on our uh on our soldiers here uh <clears throat> you know i think that the enemy that we were fighting is not it's not like the it's not like you know they're not like chinese or like russians you know these guys didn't have drones they didn't have bombers they don't have any of that kind of stuff you know they they had you know weapons that were uh you know that they took from the russians in the 70s and run around in flip-flops and like pajamas and uh and the ones that fought alongside of us believed in us that we they took us at our word that we would you know that we would honor our commitment to them as a people and as a nation and think about the girls and going to school and the children and um, <clears throat> my heart breaks for it. There's nothing I can do. I'm a pawn. I'm a minion, like it, in the scope of things. But, uh, but I, you know, I think that uh, the karma is going to come home and it's going to haunt this nation. You know, I think you look. I look at my little children. I got, you know, my fifth kid about to be born, and and I think about what does 50 years look like, right? 50 years. Um, it's, it's going to come home. It's going to come home to us. And you could see the hurt. And you know what? These guys, I'm sitting there eating dinner with them. And I'm eating the footbread. I'm sitting in there. Of course, I'm waiting for somebody to come out and stab like a antenna in the side of my head. I'm like, <laughs> I cannot believe I'm in this situation. But I show you these pictures. I'm like, I'm like, I can't. First of all, they're in like abject poverty. All right. They're like in these refugee camps where it's like no wheels on the vehicles, shit everywhere. And like here, here you go. Thanks for helping us out. And um, <clears throat> you know, I just uh, you know, I have a heart. I have a heart for people. That's my life. My life is people, and I see that hurt, whether they're you know Afghani or American or whatever. Um, I see the hurt because it adds to the global collective, you know. And you can everybody can feel it. They can feel the whole world changing right now. And you know, I think that hammer is going to come home. I think it's going to hit us right in the face. You know. So how long did you continue to work um, doing that job with OGA? Yeah, so I, uh, I did it for almost four years. Um, and uh, and what was the op tempo? How often were you going on deployment? How often were you home? It was, I was every 60 days to 90 days, depending on where I was and what I was doing. Sometimes I get extended or whatever. Um, and that's about all you could take of that job before you just got completely burned out. So it's a 60 to 90 day deployment, 30 days home and then 30 days home. Mm -hmm. Is it yeah, Like when you come home, how long does it take you to reset and freaking enjoy your life before you're like, well, I got to go back again in four days or whatever. You don't, you don't, I never get out of that zone. I would come home uh, and be, I was so intense, you know, I was a, I was an intense person and I didn't have, I wasn't on Facebook. I didn't, I'm not, I didn't live that. My whole life was isolated. I have like the same friends, like the same people, you know, the same job. I, I, I didn't like, I wasn't out there. My, I would come home and I would be very distracted. Like I, because I always knew that I had to like leave again. And then in, um, in 2014, I was in a, really significant ordeal um I, I would say it was like up there in my top two or three events i had in my you know military paramilitary career was uh actually i would say it's probably the top like it was the most insane gunfire and combat and carnage that i'd ever been involved in and um you know that's when i kind of was like enough was enough for me i'd had enough at that point you know, so, um, <clears throat> and that's kind of when my whole world fell apart, really, because I didn't have that anchor anymore. And that, that, that had become my identity. Like, when that identity went away, you know, I was kind of left spiraled with all these experiences and skills and things, and now I had, 
no p- mission, no purpose. Like, uh, what, what was different about that event that, I mean, you'd had your buddies been killed before, you'd done missions where there's a ton of pressure, you've been in gunfights. Like, what was, why was that particular event the straw that broke the camel's back? Because there's no community. Uh, you know, you're a gun for hire. And there's no community. It's not like I come home and I'm like with the team. I'm with all my buddies. I'm in my platoon. I got the people. I got the things. I got this culture. I show up and I'm with different people from different units. I got two CAD guys here and a Green Beret here and a, you know, a CCT guy here. I, you know, and you become friends and you, yeah, there is a brotherhood. But then I may never see those. I may never work with them again. I may be over here, you know. So that so when you go home, it's kind of just like oh, you're just like. You just get on the airplane. I mean, when I came home, I flew through D.C. I still had, like, you know, pieces of concrete. Like, you know, I was still banged up. Like, and I just, like, arrive home at the airport. Like, and then that's just it. There's no, nobody calls and says, like, you okay? Like, what's going on? Like, how's the family? Like, nothing. You're just, I'm living in a rural area by myself with my wife and kids. And I'm, you know, there's, I've. You feel like you have nobody. Does your wife have any idea what's going on? <sighs> Not re. I mean, yeah. I mean, I didn't like tell her stuff, but she could just tell. Um, matter of fact, when I left and I and I resigned, I um, <clears throat> there and there was a lot of reasons for that. But um, I remember my my daughter, my middle daughter, said to me, "Mom always sits in the car and cries every day and by herself." And I was like, and I was like. About what? You know, like, so, like, I went over there, and I remember I was like, why are you crying in the car? Like, what's going on? And she's like, you're just, you're so intense. Like, and I, I didn't say anything. I mean, I wasn't, like, chatting it up, but I just radiated a form of intensity. Like, at any minute, I'm ready to go. And, yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for horses and what I'm doing right now, I'm probably, I don't know, I look at the state of veterans today, and... I don't think that people understand the severity of what's happening to our culture, it's especially like kind of where we come from, you know, and my, my, my career is a, just a fraction of, of, of you living a lifetime in that, you know, and, uh, but it has a huge impact on you long term and we forget about those people. And like, I was kind of rattling off some of those statistics. Like, I mean, if you look at, having 50,000 nonprofits in North America for vets, 50,000. Between 2012 and the end of 2020, we spent $92 billion, all right? The top five nonprofits for veterans have billions of dollars, all right? There's organizations in those top five that, you know, spent $28 million last year on postage stamps, all right? $18 million on TV ads, all right? The, the addiction rate of what I see of guys coming and applying to my program, a couple hundred a year, I can only look at those hard numbers, right? But 75% of those guys are on at least two. My maximum guy I had come to Heroes and Horses had was on 13 medications. Last year we had a guy come on 11 medications, come off all and lose 37 pounds in 41 days in the program, right? Nobody cares about, nobody looks at any of those kind of things, the joblessness, the suicide. And then there's a conversation about living and being alive. We say, oh, this is a success story because he didn't kill himself. And, I, and I've looked at guys and I told them, you're, you're, you're dead. You're already dead. You haven't pulled the trigger, but you're dead. You're not living any form of life. And, <clears throat> you know, if it wasn't, if I didn't happen to fall into... I guess you could say, or, or be directed, I guess, serendipitously, or, you know, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know because I was, uh, I was just, I was so wrapped up in anger, you know, and I felt alone in the world because it's not like you don't have anybody around you. You're just, you're just done, you know, and you realize like, you're just, uh, you're just a number. You are literally, if the tool breaks, they throw the tool away. You never hear these stories. I could tell you stories about guys that have been shot and busted. They're, you know, crippled and they're, they can't even pay their bills. They're living in a one-room shack and, you know, trying to get medical payments. Like, 
contractors, like it's, um, and then tie that into their military career and it just becomes this caustic cocktail. And, uh, that's why I've dedicated my life to this because I think that there's something special, whether no matter what you did in the military, that, that you went and signed up knowing that you could die in a time of war and because you believed in something. And I think people think that means fighting for the government, but I think it means fighting for your country and, uh, fighting for what is good. And somewhere when that gets lost and gets twisted, I think a whole person loses their anchor point and they spiral out of control. And yeah, I mean, I, yeah, so that's why today the program that I run is, it's so intensive. And when, so when you got out, when you, when you left that contracting job, did you have a plan? No. Well, yeah, kind of, I guess I, I left because I remember I was, it was, I got home on Christmas Eve and I was like putting together all this, like my wife picks me up from the airport and I remember I'm driving, she's driving. Are you living on the East coast at this no, point? No, I'm living in Montana oh, okay. and uh, it's snowing out and she's driving and she just starts like hysterically crying. And I'm like, you know, what's your problem? <laughs> and she's like, oh, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And she's like, I just like, I can feel your energy coming off you. You're like a furnace right now. I was like, fine. Like, and she's like, okay, like, well, we got to like, you know, put the Christmas stuff together. And I got extended. So I'd been on like a long trip. So Christmas Eve, I go back and I remember I'm like, it was the uh, frozen, the oh, frozen God, that's thing. That's enough to drive anyone freaking over the <laughs> Listen, you want to talk a, about freaking snapping? Yeah. Like I had the frozen <laughs> car, like I'm trying to put the wheels on, like, and I remember I was shaking so bad and I was like, I was just so in my head because, you know, after that we had, you know, some things happened. We got chased, the suicide bomb went off. We had all these like things that happened. And I remember like, I just, could, I, I couldn't down regulate. I, I mean, I just couldn't down regulate. Even just driving in the car, I felt like I was there. Like everything was happening around me. Yeah, when you said that 30 days, coming home for 30 days, I can remember coming home off of deployments and it takes like a 30 day period to where you're like, okay, like my first deployment to Iraq, we, we there was this big paranoia about getting you know IED'd when you went under bridges or yeah. were ambushed when you went under bridges, and so you know you'd always kind of like take a little breath before you'd go under a bridge in a in a in a convoy, and and I remember when I came home, you know I'm like it, I'm like I'm I'm not trying to say I was freaking out or anything, but when you when when I would be driving my car from work back home and go under a bridge, it'd be like. You'd have that just like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Just this little something in your mind, right? Yeah. And it would take like a month for me to go away. So I'm thinking you're coming home for 30 days. That's not enough time to get any sort of like to, 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 to what'd you say, downgrade or whatever? Yeah, downregulate. Downregulate. Yeah. There's no time. Yeah. 30 days is not enough to downregulate, period. And when you're all you're doing is coming home and you know you're going on another deployment in that 30 days, you might as well. I, I kind of feel like you might as well not even come home because it's just what is what good is it going to do? That's freaking crazy. It is, and uh, it's 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 crazy that the amount of work that's carried out by contractors around the world. I don't think people understand the scope of it, especially when it pertains to like you know the DIA, the NSA, the CIA, like you know these institutions that use contractors. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough transition for sure, and uh, I happen to uh, you know for me like going back to work, you know, I started you know, working on a ranch. I met some guys. And so I would kind of like immerse myself in that. And so Christmas Eve. Yeah. So I Chris, kind of oh, yeah, cut so, off your story. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is, you just had this sort of what you called the biggest incident in your career. Yeah. Had I would happened. say one, one of the, the top three for sure. Like, definitely and now happened. you get into the freaking aluminum tube and you f wake up and you're in freaking Montana again. I'm in Montana and I'm like, and I remember I was trying to put I couldn't focus to like even put the wheels on the thing. I was just so, and I remember like I, I stayed up all night, you know, I got in late, I got in basically Christmas morning and like the kids got out. And of course, you know, they're like, you know, American consumerism, like ah, my child, they're not even <laughs> looking at the thing and ripping stuff, stuff <laughs> so, you know, everywhere. And I'm like, you know, the waste, like, <laughs> like the dolphin's going to eat that. So we're like, uh, you know, and I remember I'm like trying to cook breakfast that morning. I've been up now for, I don't know, probably 48 hours or something. And and I remember cooking breakfast and looking out the window and I was like, my wife came over and kind of put her arm on me. You know, I'm trying to like be happy and everything. But 
I just looked at her. I was like, oh, I'm just like, I need some more time home, you know. So I email and say, hey, like, I need some time home. And obviously, like, this huge thing happened, and it was huge. And, like, you know, the highest levels were involved, and it came overseas. Like, uh, so, like, is that, like, you know, they didn't know or anything. And uh, and they're like, well, we, like, need you to go back, like, you know, take this team, blah, blah, blah. And, and if you don't come back, we're going to dock your pay. <laughs> and that's when I was, like, <laughs> back to, like, my Master Chief story, you know. I was like, zzz like and uh and i was just i was just done I, I really wasn't sure i had i had started um you know i'd started my foundation uh and and so then i did a film called 180 out you had already started your foundation yeah at i had, this point? I had okay, filed cool. the paperwork and done Got i hadn't it. run anything or done anything yet and so but that, did you have a vision for what the foundation actually was yeah okay. and that's evolved significantly to what it is today um but yeah so and then I ended up in 2015 running my first season, which was like come out for two weeks, go home, come out for two weeks, go home. And so I did a film with Yeti called 180 Out. Um, and I had met a guy. Strangely enough, my wife had this like mommy's workout thing. I watched a video. He's a big hunter, uh, Mark Seacap. And uh, he was like Sitka's main guy, Yeti's main guy, big archery. He, wrote a, he made a video called Searching for West. And it's about him being this prolific archer and how his son's born and he's kind of like thinking about why he, he should be there with him. And, you know, so I watched this video overseas with a bunch of guys and he's, they're like, oh, this guy lives in Bozeman. So I send the video to my wife. She launches this like mommy's workout thing and his wife comes. And strangely enough, like, so I was like, this is the guy from the video. Like <laughs> this is the hunting guy. And so we ended up like meeting and he goes, Hey, I want to do a video on you. Uh, a Yeti video. And he was making all the Yeti videos at the time, like a bunch of them. And so, uh, initially it was about me, like being an archery elk hunter or whatever. And, uh, and then he got to know me and he's like, Hey, I want to like do it on your standing up this foundation on your first season. And that first season was, I don't know how that year didn't kill me, honestly. Uh, I mean, it was one of the, it was the, probably the hardest year I've had in my entire life. Uh, I got to, you know, I bought my house, basically broke, no paycheck. I started trimming trees for a guy. I'm like working on the side. Like, you know, I've, my relationship was like touch and go. I was, you know, started shoeing horses. I'm trying to bring these vets out. I'm self-funding everything. Um, I am basically down to, you know, a few thousand dollars in the bank account. Um, and uh, I ended up meeting a gentleman that over over a beer, totally randomly for a friend of mine that gave me a $25,000 check. And before he gives me the check, and I was 24500 in debt with the nonprofit. And I never met this guy before. I'm on my way to Wyoming to shoot for National Geographic. And I got in a huge fight. I'm charging up my credit cards. Nonprofit, you're supposed to raise money. The people donate. Then you use that money to do good. I didn't really know anything about that. So I started a nonprofit and started pitting putting my own money into the nonprofit and going broke. I missed that page. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll never forget it. This guy comes, I got horses on the trailer. I'm heading into Wyoming to shoot for national geographic, packing some guys. Buddy calls me up. Oh, stop and get a beer with this guy. I'm like, I can't, I'm just, I'm like a lot of problems right now. And I couldn't pay for the vets to come back. So I had all these vets supposed to come back. And I, the last words I have with my wife was like, I'm doing this and I'm charging up the cards and I'm going to finish what I start. I don't care what it costs. I don't care if we sink the whole family. I'm doing this. I'm finishing this. So on my way to Wyoming, my buddy's like, Hey dude, it's Marine. He's like, let's get a beer with this guy. And, and I, and I refuse, refuse. He keeps persistently calling me. So finally I stop. I grab one beer with the guy. I sit there, I kind of talk for like, I don't know, 45 minutes. I was like, I got to get going. He's like, can I talk to you outside? So I go outside and he looks at me and he goes, he wanted to pet the, one of the horses and he's allergic. So he puts a glove on, he's out there petting it, wealthy guy. And he looks at me and he goes, you're the worst nonprofit guy I've ever met in my life. And I've been working with charities for 40 years. And I was like, of course, my ego's like... You know, fuck hell! Like, how dare you? But he was right. I was. I didn't know what I. Was. I didn't know anything. And he t hands me a check, and he goes, "I want you to call me. I, I, I like what you're trying to do." So he gives me, he gives me a check. I drive down the road. I look at it it's for twenty five grand, and that's when I knew I was doing the right thing. And so, um, you know, I think like initially looking back, 
I think really I was like trying to find a way to help myself, you know? And, um, because I, I, I felt so lost, you know, I just, I felt lost. I had no purpose. I had no mission. Um, you know, and working with horses and shoeing horses and just that world just took me out of where the focus was all on myself and my focus became on managing these animals and learning about them and learning and learning about myself through the animal. Um, I didn't really know that then because my, my, the guys that I was with were force fear and repetition. You know, they were old school cowboys putting me on a horse. I was getting bucked off and kicked and all those things and whiskey drinking. And that was perfect for me at the time. Um, but you know, through that relationship over the years, horses became a, a mirror reflection to who I was, you know, because they're a, they're a prey animal. Um, and they're designed to stay away from things with eyes in front of their head. You know, they're, they're instinctually, um, highly intelligent, cerebrally, very stupid <laughs> horse is a dumb animal. And, um, but instinctually they're highly evolved. And so, um, you know, I brought these guys out, I finish out the season with them. I start the next season. I start getting some fundraising behind me. I have the first class. A guy leaves the two weeks, goes home at ODs and dies. Uh, Army officer. And dies in his house, ODs. Um, he was a lieutenant. And so then I extended the program to realize I still have this letter I wrote the class. And so um, I extended it. And today the program is now 41 days long. I'll kind of skip ahead to that. But um what I realized is that it's actually struggle that gives everything in life value. And so everything designed for veterans is designed to take the struggle away. Like people that wanted to help me wanted to take the struggle away when it was the reengaging in the struggle that helped me reestablish a foundation and who I am as a person or who I was. And I really just became an identity. I lost a baseline to that connection with myself and, you know, so many times a job is what you do, but a purpose is how you live your life. And so when that job went away, I didn't have that purpose because I'd never really learned that, you know, um, that deeper connection uh, to um, something that is, uh, you know, I think that, that that's what makes us human. I think that uh, we live inside of our minds and we live a series of ideas and we, we level up through all these things and we get some stuff and we get some things and we get to some places, we achieve some heights. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, the real question is like, what is it all for? What is meaning in life? And I think when those identities fade and people stop waving the flag and nobody really cares that you're in the Air Force for 20 years and it's, you know, and no, nobody cares that you were overseas, like your kind of life kind of goes on, everything spirals out of control. And you're, the problem is always you. And I think that, um, you know, now today, looking at what happens over 41 days, it's really one long continual conversation with yourself. Who am I as a person? Because, you know, the average person I was reading yesterday spends between 15 and 23 years in front of the TV. Okay. God. All right. <laughs> I, disgusting. Matter, like I started, like I started, I was, I was verifying it this morning because I was like, that is the craziest thing ever. Cause the average person lives, well, let's say 80 80 years, that's 30,000 days, right? So if you spend between 15 on the low end or 23 years watching television, right? Then you're not working for 24 hours, right? You have eight hours of sleep every day. And then, you know, ages one to five, what are you doing? You're eating shit off the floor, you're pooping your pants, you don't know anything, you can't even talk, right? You're just like wandering around, people are stuffing you in seats and putting weird clothes on you, right? And then they do the same thing to you when you're old, right? So you gotta knock off a few years at the end where they're putting weird things in you and putting diapers on you and doing, you kind of revert back, right? So how much time do you really have? Well, I was just crunching some rough math, so, between 37 and 38 years, roughly, because you spend, you know, uh, what is it, 419 hours on the toilet, you know, you spend, you know, a year and a half showering, uh, you know, there's all these other things that you look at. <laughs> I mean, the question is, like, what is this all about, you know, and, and what I realize is that success and failures are one and the same. You can have a success and that success can be the worst thing that ever happened to you. And you can have a failure and that can be the worst thing that ever happened to you because the byproducts are the same. They inhibit growth. 
and they, they stop evolution because you have an experience, then you perpetuate that identity associated with that experience, and then you live and create your future. So human beings are constantly the victim of their own choices. And everything in society is saying, no, it's not your choices. It's everything else around you. And so, you know, over 41 days, I I always say, like, I don't have any ideas for you. I'm not advertising. Come to me and I'm going to tell you what to do. I say, come here and I'll put you in a place where you're going to learn what that is. And I'm not going to judge you for whatever the outcome is because that's your life to live. That's your 37 years that you have. <laughs> Get off the TV. But um, I, the state of the American veteran is absolutely in dismal condition. Um, I didn't know a lot about nonprofits when I started. Matter of fact, I didn't know anything. Um, and along the way, I've met every crook liar and charlatan from here to the Rio Grande um, because it's a it's a people make billions off the backs of other people's pain I'm sorry if you serve 10 years in the military the answer for you is not to float in a tube and eat donuts like or you know to go to Texas and you know shoot a deer that's tied to a tree in front of a corn feeder like nothing's more healing than that right like um you know, I'm sorry. Like, and people hate me for saying that. My thing is like, you're your own. <laughs> Fuck you. Like, I don't care. Like, because I see it. I see the state of these guys that show up and they are completely fractured. And they've been to 15, 16 institutions. They're on this. They've been injected with that. They're on these pills. They're on these psych meds. They're on this Medicaid. They're on this. And I look and I'm like, the pandemic, uh, of suicide in the veterans community can't be understated. And the numbers, like, I don't even know if you would ever even be able to find the real numbers, um, really. Uh, but it's substantial, you know, and, and this whole catch thing, you know, 22 a day, like, like if you're doing 22 pushups a day for veteran suicide, you're an asshole. Like 22 push, my kid can do a hundred. He's eight. Okay. Like <laughs> at least have some dignity. And then it's like, you know, you're on there filming like, Hey guys, vets are killing themselves. <sighs> um, shout out to my sponsor for my new t-shirt. I'm going to be doing 22 pushups today. Um, new Lycra, by the way, go online 10%, use my code Bob. <laughs> and I mean, this is the world that we're living in. And I'm like, we have to get back into the business of developing human beings. You know, we have a, uh, um, we have a desire, you know, human beings are now in such a state of like hyper complexity where everything is integrated, everything is connected, that there is no individuality, there is no original thought. You become an amalgamation of everything that you've heard and been exposed to, but you really do nothing, right? Like the jury's out, like wake up, do hard work, learn about yourself, turn the shit off, like meditate, like, you know, eat a carrot every now and then, like, and, and life is going to be pretty good for you. Um, doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but you'll have the built-in tools and you'll begin to learn about your higher self. And, you know, people can say like, you know, oh, this is like woo-woo magic or whatever, but like there is like, I don't care. You're in war. You're like, you got the spidey senses. What is that? What is that? What is that thing? What is meaning, right? What is this? What is this thing of meaning that we all have? We're all going to answer that question at some point in our life, whether you get hit by a you know a skateboarder like and whack your head in the curb, or you die in combat, or you you know eat yourself to death. Like you're all going to face those those things. And to me, the hero's journey is the journey of learning about yourself and using those tools to overcome the external circumstances that you face. And so, like over the 41 days, like we have. You know, that every guy walks at least 80 miles in the program just to meals. They'll spend 22 days in the wilderness. They won't eat a piece of sugar. They won't eat dairy. They won't eat, they won't have juice. They will only eat meat, vegetables, salt, water, and black coffee. And they will learn to meditate. They'll get into an ice tank every single day. They will start their day with mindfulness. They'll read books. They'll go through leadership courses. They'll learn to shoe horses, ride horses. They'll learn to see themselves you know, working with wild Mustangs. They'll be put in very dangerous situations. All these are just tools to shift focus from a person that is always looking out for answers 
to a person that is looking in for answers and then using those answers to then change the material world around them with their choices that are authentically theirs. And that's called purpose. And when you start to do that, there's always a dragon that steps out right in front of you, right? The, the dragon steps out in front of you. And, and then you find out how much you really want it because everything is designed today to keep you from knowing what you are. Like social media doesn't exist if you're not there. The internet doesn't exist if you're not there. You are the energy source that feeds your own demise. So, so you give your energy to feed your own destruction and then you complain about the very thing that you're feeding when it's always you. You're the one. I always tell people like, oh God, like the guys, like the Twitters, the this and that, you know, whatever. It's like, <laughs> it's like, oh God, he did that. But it, it's not there if you're not there. You feed it. You are feeding and you are clothing and you are arming your own captors. You are. And everything is designed to keep you sound asleep. Consume, 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 consume. Yum, 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 food. Yum, 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 yum. Let's get something. You know, everything is designed to fulfill these physical desires that then override you from searching from the real energy source that the people that are aware know of. They know I need you to feed what I'm building. You will serve, serve, serve as the cog in a gigantic organism. And you will give your energy 40, 50 years of it, and you get your little plaque. Thanks for Bob, employee of the month. And, and, and then what? You go down to South Florida and you sit there and you just wait. Your car, you're sitting in the same traffic. Yeah, maybe it's a Ferrari. So what? You're in the same traffic. Eh, yeah, maybe you get a little bit of better beef. You know, maybe this one was massaged by 50 Japanese ladies or whatever, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because then the fear starts to build. And then the clock just starts going. And next thing you know, what are they doing? They're like, ah, it's too late. It's too late. You've missed the meaning of life. You've missed it. And veterans are out there like perpetuating these identities. That's why I don't do like... You know, these guys, they show up and it's just like, dude, you got out in 2005. It's 2022, okay? They're putting chips in people's brains, man. No one cares about the logistics department and Bagram in 05 that, you know, may or may not have been mortared, right? Like, like think about the numbers. You would think that every veteran is burned and every veteran has been amputated. 1,500 amputees, 0.00026% of, of veterans have been amputated. There's billions of dollars of organizations to help the amputated, billions. We got this guy a wheelchair ramp. A ramp? How about like a ramp made of like wood? Like that's like 800 bucks. Right, but 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 this is what's happening. We have to get back to where we start developing ourselves, push ourselves away, reunite as a community, and start getting serious about human development, and begin giving our energy to things that matter, like our food, our water, our shelter, like the community around us, doing things that are good, turning off that stuff. Don't spend twenty three years in, of your life in front of the TV, like. We have to change. We have to change our minds. We have to change our bodies. We have, to, we have to become the governors of our own perceptions. We're no longer the governors of our own perceptions. Perceptions, they create actions and behaviors, and they're being governed by something else. And you know, my message is that I don't have the answers, but you do. And the jury's out on greatness. It's, it's, it's spattered on walls and caves and books and tablets throughout all of mankind. The jury is out. Know thyself. Know thyself. There's a reason why everybody wants your energy because you're building an empire. And that empire just turns out that you're its unwinning prisoner. And you can walk away. And you can let yourself out. And you can change. 
You can do it. We can do it. And I'm not going to sit back and be a participant and watch Generation. Like, I'm nobody special. I'm nobody of notoriety. I'm not like, all I do is I believe in the dignity of the human experience. And there's people that have done some really great things throughout all of the history of mankind. And they did it by knowing themselves. And then whatever, you know, we love to watch the brave hearts and we love to watch the patriots and we love to be that person, be that person. It's not about dying and be, being burned at the stake when you're 23. Well, do you spend 23 years of your life watching TV? That's a great 23 years that a guy like William Wallace had. He was able to do that because he understood it, something. Giordano Van Bruno, who was burned at the stake by the Catholic Church in the 1500s for writing the Pope of Vu, he... Uh, he looked at them when they were going to burn him at the stake, and they cut his tongue out, and they nailed it to him over his head, and they were getting ready to burn him. And they tried to get him to recount, you know, that the you know earth revolves around the sun and all these things. You know, that was heresy. And he looked at him, and he understood the deeper meaning of life. And he said, it's not his last words were, it's not I who is afraid. It's you. And then they lit the fire. <laughs> what a badass way to go, you know. Um, so... I've just dedicated my life to, you know, right now the program is a 41 day long program. You know, at the end of it, we have a Lakota sweat lodge. I've had the opportunity to uh, um, get to know some of those medicine men. And, uh, you know, that's an ancient tradition that is uh, 16,000 years old that dates back. And, uh, and, you know, they say you go into the womb of the earth and when you come out, you know, um, you're reborn. And it's, it's really like, a, it's like an insane sauna. Uh, that uh, has chanting and all those other kinds of things. And you, you're you in there in the heat and you kind of go, the heat brings you from the kind of physical into the spiritual. And so every guy will pass through those windows um, and they'll do a four window ceremony upon graduation. And then, and then people are like, and then what? And I'm like, and then go and live your life because now you know. And if you want to go participate in those same things, you can do it, but not ignorantly because you know you know that, wow, I'm creating my own experience. Like the, the whole idea of free will, I believe, is what Project Earth is all about. It's about free will. Well, the experiment in free will is coming to an end because everybody's been programmed. Everyone's, it's coming to an end. And um, I'm not going to let it come to an end in my life. I'm going to take power of that because free will is powerful. I could get up from this table right now sell my rental car illegally to a chop shop and go climb Mount Everest. I could do anything, anything, but people do nothing. They do nothing. They don't understand the power that they have. Instead, they give that unknown power away and then they blame life and they're the, they become the victims of this experience. We can change. We can change right now. People can change. And in turn, the goodness can be restored. The goodness of this nation you know, the goodness that made you sign up and say, you know what, I want to fight against evil. I want to stand again. If I lose my limb, if I get burned, if I get, I don't care. I want to do it. And and return to those values that represent not only as, us as Americans, but us as human beings. And, you know, that's, that's, that's my message, you know, to the world is like that book right there about face. Wake up. And turn around and do 180 degrees from what you're doing, and your life will change. You will change. It will change. And it will change for the better. Take that journey. Reject the easiness of life that is being sold because it is a poison and it is a cancer. And uh, and you will, maybe you'll be rich, maybe you won't be. It, does, it won't matter because you will be wealthy in heart and wealthy in mind and wealthy in spirit. You know, and that's, uh, you know, that's kind of what I want to share with the world. Well, so what's this look like? First question, do horse, do you need to know how to ride a horse to show up? No, no. Matter of fact, like the majority of guys that come have never even seen, a, you know, never even ridden a horse before in their life. Had you ridden horses before? Um, when did you start riding horses? I had one horse growing up. I never, I rode it like a couple of times and uh, that was about my experience. 
<laughs> that was it. And then you were, I'm going for this? Uh, yeah. What so, was the introduction to horses? So I ended up meeting some, uh, I was, uh, right before I got out, so this is like 2013, I ended up meeting some cowboys uh, with horses in the backcountry. And I got to know them, and they invited me to the ranch. I met them on a hiking. I was just hiking with my daughter, and I met them. And uh, that's how I started shoeing horses. So I first started shoeing horses with a guy um, on a tipping table. So they put mm-hmm. them in a huge machine, tip them on their sides. And then I just, my job was to run like the wheel grinder. And I was just like helping out. And eventually I started learning how to shoe horses and start colts. And these guys, like I kind of thought initially they were all about like helping vets and all this kind of stuff. They were like the most like crooked human beings I've ever met in my <laughs> life. Like real legit crooks uh oh, you know because the equine business is tough like in the cowboy world and all that kind of stuff so um but i did learn a tremendous amount those guys were mentors to me you know all that shit aside and then um and then i just and so pre- then you start riding horses all the time obviously oh, every single day day in and day out yeah i mean i uh like i said I just crossed my 18th wilderness on a horse you know so uh I, we have 70 horses today. Um, and I've been breaking and training wild Mustangs for five years now, like straight from the wild. And I always tell people, I'm like, if you like think you're like a legit tough guy, like you like, I will put you in there with a completely wild horse and you're going to find out real quick how tough you are because the horse is immediately going to sense if you're afraid. And like I had this, I had this horse two years ago. I never did quite get him. I'll show you a cool picture of him going straight up in the air, and I'm on the end of this rope. Um, he's the only horse I ever had actually, like, just straight up attack me um, and, uh, like, attack me. And what would happen was is that he would, like, you know, you get in there, and he'd start moving around. And if you even take one step back, they're one step forward. Okay, because in the horse world, you know, there is a, there is a hierarchy. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's the alpha male and the alpha female, and they lead the herd, and then everybody else falls subsequently underneath. So the alpha male runs, roams around, looks for predators, you know, keeps everybody at bay, and the mare is leading them to food and water in the wild. They eat first, they do everything first, and then it slowly goes down. So you're falling somewhere in that horse hierarchy, and you know, to think about horses, a horse is the highest VO2 max out of any land animal on earth. All right, they have binocular and monocular vision. They can see out of both eyes completely independently. The right brain and left brain doesn't know. So they're looking at something on the left, the right brain has no idea. Just like my ex girlfriend. <laughs> and <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, when they put their heads down, they can see almost 360 degrees while they're eating. And, but they can't see four feet in front of their nose and they can't see four feet behind them. Um, and a horse is designed really to do one thing, run. So they have, you know, 50 liters of fluid in their stomach at any given time, which sloshes around this fleet free floating intestinal system. So as the horse moves, that fluid sloshes and slaps in the diaphragm, which causes them to go <laughs> to breathe in. So it's like boom, boom. So they're, they're breathing in super hard and, uh, they can't breathe through their mouth. So they breathe through their nose and their noses are flared. So it's like an air ram system. And so a horse is designed like, you know, I, I, I can be a mile away. I was out in Wyoming. There's wild horses on horseback and they can feel the vibrations in the ground mm-hmm. and you just can see them on your binos. They just, whoosh, they sense you, right? So they're highly evolved at getting away from predators. So now here comes human beings like, hello, I want to ride you. And, <laughs> and so you have to one, become their leader first. So you have to have an ability of self leadership. Right, because they can sense that. And then and then, you know, two, you have to gain their trust. And you gain that trust uh, with that animal um, by, you know, pressure and release. So applying pressure to that animal, releasing that pressure and essentially talking to them, you know. So if you watch me working wild horses, I can, it doesn't really look like I'm doing much, but I'm controlling the direction of that animal because in horse language, whoever moves their feet first loses. So what happens is, especially with the students when they're first working with wild horses, as the program progresses, it's a couple of days they get with wild animals. You'll see the guy, I don't know, 20 year green beret or whatever horse takes a step towards him. You'll see him take a step back. Well, that horse is like, okay, now you are my bitch. <laughs> and, and, and the next time around he's on you. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and you know, horses are, are, are like people. Some are, you know, docile, some are nice, some are psychotic, whatever in terms of the wild ones. And, um, so yeah, I had this horse and he's, uh, you know, I, I get him like finally where I can get him saddled and everything like that. And it takes me like three or four days and I can get hands on him, starting to like pick his feet up. And one day he just came in and he just never was a trusting horse. And I kind of pushed him more than I think he was capable of at the time. And 
I just kind of like he was just there. I said, oh, I'm going to let him like sulk or just let him stand there and rest. And it was a pretty rough morning. And and I turn around and he just like rears back and tries to strike me in the back of my head. You know, and I kind of like fall forward and then he bites me on my back, you know, and kind of throws me to the side or whatever. You know, of course, I'm like can't crawl up the round pen fast enough you know like i mean <laughs> that's a large beast and you know How, so this was three or four days into you working with him yeah and he so we we adopt him completely wild uh i think 28 of our 70 horses are wild horses um i've been been uh five years ago i did a film called the 500 mile project where i rode 16 wild mustangs um from new mexico to arizona 760 miles um, after training them for three months with a couple guys. And it was the story of the unpurposed horse and the unpurposed human being. And so here you have the wild horse, which is facing the same thing as the American veteran, which is huge government monies, right? So there's, there's you know, 50, 100,000, whatever it is today, I haven't looked, uh, wild Mustangs in captivity. So in 1979, they had the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. So they started ran, rounding them up off the ranch lands and putting them into long-term holding facilities. And today it's a 60 or $70 million program. And the problem's only worsening. They've tried shooting them out of helicopters with birth control and all these kind of things. And and so the whole thing's a disaster, and adoption doesn't really work either. It works on a small scale, but there's too many being produced to adopt them out. Um, so we uh, we go there and we adopt them. Um, we sort them out. We figure them out. And if you watch the film and the opening scenes of the films, it's very intense. I mean, these horses have never been around people, so they're terrified because they're designed to run away from us. And so, you know, through a series of shoots and sorting things, um, you know, we pick out what we want out of hundreds of them, and then we load them into trailers and we bring them back, and then we start training them. And those are the horses that then go into the program. So, you know, a horse is a, is a mirror reflection to who you are because a horse is designed at sensing your predatorial instincts. So you may say, I'm not scared, and I, or, or maybe I am going to hurt you because I'm going to be very aggressive with you, and then the animal becomes very afraid of you. Now, you may not be per, you know, portraying that on the outside, but on the inside, that's what the horse is looking at. You could look like you're totally calm, but your heart's going 140 beats a minute. And the horse feels that. So then he starts thinking, what are you going to do to me? And then they'll test you because where are you going to be on the hierarchy? And if you watch them in the pens, you know, there will be this one horse that will come along. Everybody's eating. And as soon as he starts walking over, everybody goes away. And there'd be one horse that's like, eh, maybe I'm not going to go. And then this horse like double barrel kicks him. He's like, yeah, I'm going to go. <laughs> so you're, they don't, <laughs> you're somewhere on that scale. And so horses, a lot of the program happens in the 41 days with these horses without talking. Because what happens is the horse reflects back what you really are. And so people blame the animal. This horse is an idiot. Well, <laughs> you're an idiot. Now, we don't say that. Sometimes I do. Um, but, but these guys begin to realize. And when they change their internal compass, their relationship with their horse instantaneously change it is the most beautiful thing you see this union where all of a sudden okay you're my leader you're the alpha male or alpha mare and i'll kill myself for you and when a horse believes in you that might like some of my like rope horses and my really good horses like the one you know, kind of like that video i sent you or whatever you know they'll kill themselves they will run for you until they die they will run through a fence they will they will do anything for you because they trust their leader um, but a lot of guys initially are just passengers on an animal that hates them because they hate themselves mm -hmm. and they're not able to have that internal compass be calibrated. So throughout that relationship and throughout them learning about horses, they're really learning about themselves through the medium of the horse. And so from day one, you know, guys apply to the program. It's a really comprehensive, uh, application process. And it's, it's a hundred percent veterans, all veterans, all veterans. All veterans. <laughs> yep. And, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky application. You know, most nonprofits, you kind of like fill out the thing and it's like, you know, you do like pretzels or peanuts, like you're welcome. Like, thanks for like, this is like gets in your head. And then, you know, through that process, you get selected, you know, we kind of rate guys one to five, you know, we can only take so many guys, you know, we get a couple hundred applications a year. And then, um, and then we send them two books communicate with them every week, help them lose weight, change their diet. We send them articles on testosterone suppression through SSRIs and medications and all these kind of unhealthy lifestyle. We help them kind of level up as they're preparing. And then when they arrive, um, 
it's uh you know kind of indoctrination get in the ice tanks this is how this works this is our morning routine so you wake up it's a mile walk in the dark off the ranch uh, they walk down to the main area. Um, they'll, you know, mobility work with Jim Jones. So they designed our workout program all based, you know, these guys are not trying to get jacked or anything, but they, some of them are like straight off the mission of the kitchen. So, you know, they, they, they like, I mean, we have guys that like, haven't, I had a guy last year that said he hadn't walked up a flight of stairs in seven years. Yeah. All right. So now like you're entering into like, you want, I mean, <laughs> pain, uh, pain. When, when you're scoping out applicants, are you trying to create a, what do you call it? A class? What do you call them? Yeah, so I create a class, but I... Are but, you trying to create a class of like, do you look at the people and go, look, this guy's probably, he's going to need some help, but he's probably going to do well. This other person's going to, like, this is a train wreck over here. Or are you just looking for train wrecks? I just take the worst of the worst guys. Okay, so you're looking for... And I put them all together and there's no science to that. Because it, to me, it's like, you to get through this, you have to work as a team. But it's about the individual. Mm-hmm. You're on your own journey, and you're going to need other people to help you along the way. But I don't care if they ever talk to those guys again. Um, a lot of them maintained some of the closest friendships ever. Um, matter of fact, on the way here, some guys, uh, um, Canadian Special Operations, sent me a guy and uh, last year, and he um, changed his life. And this guy was in a real bad way and uh um they've maintained relationships with each other but ultimately it's about the individual because they're on the hero's journey and the hero's journey is that you have to walk through those flames you have to go through those fires you have to feel it and so you know 4 30 in the morning they wake up they walk a mile down to the main camp then they intentionally move their bodies they get done with that um we do a meditation um and then they do breath work the wim hof breath holding and then they get into an ice tank and then that scales up to you know the end they're sitting there for like 10 minutes um and that's pretty rough on guys that are like straight off like and then and then it's all about horses and so then in the evening we have what we call the uh um, the Maxim Lab, which is a leadership course based on stoicism. So I don't tell them any ideas. I'll present a question. What does it mean? You know, choose to be harmed and you're harmed. Choose not to be harmed and you haven't been. What does that mean? And guys will go around and let them talk things out. And so throughout the program, they'll do that for 40 days. And then after, uh, after six days, they'll head into the back country for eight days. They are given a horse and a mule. So wait, six days they've been there. Yep. They've been doing this routine. Yep. They've been learning about horses. Well, at this point, everybody can lope a horse, cut a dead run. Everybody can, you know, rein, control their horse, and pack a mule, and understands equine medicine, trucks, trailers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, They get all that in six days, so it's very intensive. Those are some long days. Extremely long days. Um, Matter of fact, like, (laughs) there was, like, a guy, the vet came out, and he's like, um, like, there's, like, guys sleeping, like, right next to the horse i'm like i know I'm, guys come on like, we're not in the military now we have to stand up and <laughs> like uh but but so then. six days of so the, the beginning of the program they're there they're getting all this good stuff that you're giving them yep. and they're only eating like meat vegetables what do you say salt water and coffee that's it okay there's no juice there's no dairy there's no honey nothing no. and and then after six days of that then it's we're going in the wilderness yep on and horseback with a hor- you on your horse and your mule. Correct. As a team. As a team. So How then those guys are, are they're paired together, eight guys in a the class, they're paired yeah. together and they gotta pack their own stuff. And then of course there's camp gear and all that stuff. We have duties all lined up for everybody. And that's a progressive trip, so there is no main camp. So every day they pack up and move. Okay. So, um, you know, all, all ultralight stuff, you know, most of the time I never use a tent. I'm just I just sleep out unless it rains. Um, and they'll spend eight days. We'll do like around eighty or ninety miles on that trip. Then they'll come back and they'll start the next morning what's called ranch week. So now they're going to learn how to rope. They're going to, we have, you know, cows. They're going to learn how to rope cows, how to do stock management. They're going to learn more advanced riding. They're going to learn um, how to work on a ranch, how to be in a working ranch. And so that's called ranch week. It's all about ranch stuff. Um, they'll drive tractors and they'll, they'll learn all these things in different groups throughout, you know, the whole facility. Then a lot of times we'll move, we'll go to another ranch. We'll help them gather and sort and ship cows and do stuff depending on what's going on. Mm-hmm. So that's ranch week. And then they start, you know, I guess you could say like phase two or something where they're another six days of training. So that training is 
blacksmithing so they'll learn how to shoe a horse they'll learn how to trim they'll learn how to pair they'll learn equine medicine they'll work with wild mustangs they'll do colt starting they'll do reining they'll do more advanced riding they'll do roping well they'll actually rope live cows and they'll learn how to you know how to manage them how to operate on a working ranch in terms of all the agricultural components and they'll learn more packing and learn how to put, you know, seven, eight, ten animals at a time, pull them together, how to drive trucks, how to drive trailers, how to do chains, how to run chainsaws, how to run axes, all those kind of things. And then uh, and then they'll head into the backcountry for 11 days. Um, and then that's a so time. How many days deep are we into this program right now? Uh, like... Is the eleven day thirty the, days or something? So like is that. the eleven days sort of like the final days in the field? Yeah, and okay. that's a tough trip. Like it's tough on me. It's tough. Like you know, eleven or twelve days in the wilderness like that, progressively moving wares on you. Um, plus, the animals have their own personalities, and there's, you know, we run our stock loose, so we tie, you know, we hobble them and we turn them loose in the mountains. And so, you know, you got to get up and you got to gather in the morning. It's cold. It's snowing in August. You know, all, the, all those kind of challenges. Last year, we rode across the Wind Rivers. We did 120 miles across Wind River Range. And that was a brutal trip. It was incredible, but it, it's just tough. And then, you know, you're shoeing horses. You're constantly where you're building camp. You're cooking everything. Um, and it's all this, you know, like whole food stuff. So guys are, it's a tough trip. And then they lead every day. So every day a different guy leads. He has the map, he has the routes, he makes all the decisions. I let them fail, I let them fall flat on their face, I let them make mistakes as long as nobody's gonna get hurt and let them feel that. Take you know ownership of all those kind of, you know that leadership component and confidence and stuff. And so, um, and then they get back and then when they get back from that trip, obviously everyone's decimated. So the average guy last year lost 20 pounds in the program. Um, our record th- last year was, um, 37 pounds in 41 days and uh yeah and then and then the med count was 11 psych meds a guy a guy walked away from so um and then of course you have the guys on the onesies and the twosies mm-hmm. and stuff like that so they get back then we wake them up at one o'clock in the morning they usually get to bed around 10 that night after we because you know horses come first so you got to doctor horses clean horses you got to do shoes you got to do all those things and then we'll wake them up drive them to a mountain make them climb Sacagawea peak so 10,000 foot peak in the dark because the metaphor is that nobody really cares what you just accomplished because behind every mountain is another mountain. And so we want them to feel that. And in that video, you can see the guy standing on that peak and then one guy's kind of rubbing the other guy in the back, you know, none of that's acting or anything. You know, that was a real emotional moment because they have lived a lifetime and it is real life. It's not like you're coming here and this is fake life and now you're going to leave and go back to real life. It's all real life. There is no fake life, right? It's all real, right? <laughs> you put the virtual reality goggles on for nine hours. That's real life, right? Right? It's not, time doesn't stop. And so um, they climb that mountain. They come down, pack up all their gear, and then the next day is graduation day. So then they get into the sweat lodge. So they graduate, get into the sweat lodge. Uh, they go through that. We do some sound stuff with them. And then uh, we have a year-long take-home course called Stay the Course, where the guys have diet, reading, you know, suggested reading, you know, fitness stuff, access to an app, um, and uh, kind of like, you know, whole food eating and stuff like that. And, uh, and then the guys that want to, we plug them into an internship, and then they go for four to six weeks to Alaska, Wyoming, Montana, Utah. They go to work in ranches. They go to cowboy outfits. They go to outfitters and all, you know in the Yukon. Um, and at this point in their life, when they're done, they've moved on. And I had an interesting guy this year who came straight out of the Marine Corps, basically like weeks and came here and he showed up and he was like straight up like Ranger Rick, you know, he had the, like the Oakley's on, you know, he had the, 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 the like you were like, he's straight, everything was the military. Everything was the military. When he left, he had left all his military clothes in a garbage bag, had you know cowboy hats, like the whole thing, <laughs> and had essentially he's been worked on. He's Mexican. I got him. I happen to know a team guy buddy of mine, awesome guy, and who works for a guy that has a ranch in Mexico. So he's been ranching in Mexico. Like his whole life is like completely different. I think what would happen if more people got out? and immediately took on the next challenge in their life in the face of everything and where would they be today and you know that's my overarching goal is that like you know the sweat lodge is a super powerful thing and it can be terrifying how hot is the sweat lodge fucking really hot like like (laughs) like 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 really hot hotter than normal sauna hot oh yeah 
yeah. So, so, so the rocks that they use, they go out and gather the rocks. They're lava rocks. They haven't been heated up since the last, you know, y- younger Dryas impact, um, their last major volcanic uh, eruptions. And you know, they put them in there, and there's a lot of drumming and songs. Um, they honor everything, the water and the earth and all those things. Um, and it's called the Anipi Wakan, which is one of like seven sacred ceremonies. So like the sun dance, which is hanging by your mm. flesh uh, from a pole uh, for three days with no food or water. And then um, to come off that, they hook buffalo skulls to you and you have to run into the desert until they rip out of your back. Um, these guys have all done this numerous times. Um, and then there's the, when um, you say these guys, you're talking about the, the, the guys, guys that yeah. you work with. Yeah. And, uh, they, um, they're some of the, they're some of the deepest, most special people that I've ever met. They are people that when you meet them, you're like, these people are good. They're like good Pete. Like there's a wholeness to them that is, um, attractive. Like there is a balance to them and uh so these guys of course are terrified you know everybody's like you go into this little tiny lodge and you're in there you can't see your hand in front of your face and it the heat begins to increase in the songs and they um you know they welcome in you know all kinds of different things and animal spirits and all that kind of stuff and when you come out how uh, long are you in there for um well the door open closes four times but the whole thing's like a couple hours and uh, so then there's the then there's the vision quest where you go in there for 24 hours with no food or water alone. Um, that's uh, and then there's the four days. We've had people on our ranch that gone up there for four days with no food or water by themselves in the mountain, and they sit up there. Um, in the sweat lodge? No. The, the, oh, just so that's one of the other rights. God. So the sweat lodge was banned in North America until 1976. Um, it was illegal. Uh, matter of fact, dancing was illegal. Native American dancing was illegal. So when Columbus arrived in the North American continent, there were 60 million natives here. At the start of World War One, there was 800,000 left. Um, and Buffalo, had, um, almost 60 million had been killed to, almost to extinction. So <clears throat> those rights were banned, and it was illegal. Uh, matter of fact, it was illegal to carry those names uh, unless you were, like, on a reservation. So there's a real uh, tradition in history. You know, you're not taking psychedelics or anything like that. It's, it's the heat, and, uh, and it's the prayers. And it does change you, and it leaves an impact. And the first time I ever did it, I'll tell you right now, I, like, I was ready to, like, dig my way out of there. Like, I did not like it because your mind's like, of course, I start watching YouTube videos, you know, I'm like, oh, no, like, I get it. I was like, oh, I'm going to die. I can't get out of like, SDV, like, no. And, <laughs> like, I'm back in the black tube of death. And and I, uh, it's had such an impact on I me. Mean, I've done eight of them now. And, uh, you know, I've really, like, uh, learned, I guess, like, in a way to honor myself, like, in a, in a way that is, uh, you know, my mind, my body, my spirit, by, like, what I eat and, and how, who I am in relationship with, who I expose my, my life to, my energy to, like what I put my intentions towards, like all these things begin to kind of open up to you as the weeks in, of your life go on. And uh, so it's something that we've integrated into the program that's been really effective. And do, do you hallucinate? Is that what you're talking about? So like I had a interesting, I, I guess you could say not every time, every time has been different. Mm-hmm. Not one has been the same. Uh, some have been like incredible other ones. I feel like I just suffered like, um, they're all different. Um, but I actually had a really interesting thing is that like, I was in there and I saw a baby in the womb appear over the fire and, but there's no fire. That's a hallucination. I think, (laughs) well, um, I think I'm not sure though. Uh, it, there's no fire. The rocks are just red, but you can't really see them. Then they're in this hole. Um, so there's no fire. It's hot rocks, and they keep, and then people open the door and bring them in and put them in there. And then they have buffalo horns, and they add the water. Mm-hmm. They keep dumping water on it with buffalo horns, and they're singing and drums and chanting and all that stuff. And I saw like a baby in the womb, like in a fetus, and it appeared like over the fire. And I thought like, oh man, like I'm like the children like are dying or something. I don't know. I had this like thing. And then like a week later, my, my wife found out she was pregnant. Um, and then I, I instantaneously knew like, that's what I saw. I knew that I would have another child. Um, and I don't believe that children come from you. I think they pass through you. 
And, uh, you know, I think they're here for particular times. I think we can become derailed as human beings um, because we, you know, we get enticed, you know, by gross materialism and and all these things that detract us from ourselves. And then somebody else has got to come along. Um, But yeah, so, so that experience has been powerful. So I added it to the program and people are always like, so what book did you read? Who did you do? Like, what did you, I'm like, nothing, zero. It's just my own journey. It's all the things that I've done in my life that have helped me um, really become united with myself. I had become homesick from who I was as a person, whether it was the wild and crazy religious stuff of the day or, you know, casting the demons or whatever, or it was the military or it was the agency or it was all these other experiences. Um, you know, I had lost a footing, um, and a connection to myself. And now that that connection and that link has been restored, um, you know, I feel a balance that I've never felt before in my life. I, you know, I always tell people, I'm like, I, I don't have a retirement. I, I don't have any um, 401k. I, I told my kids, I'm not paying for your college and I'm not buying you a car. Like, I'm not doing any of those things, but I will build an ecosystem here and teach you how to hunt and how to work the land and how to honor the animals and do all those things. And I will support you, but you're going to have to do it yourself. And, you know, I'm not going to, if I go tomorrow and they're like, you got cancer, I'm like, okay, I'm going out like Bob Marley. Like, I'm just going to be like, all right, cool. You're not poking me and sticking me and doing anything. I'll just like, <laughs> I'm not, uh, you know, so these experiences have given me a connection to a place where you find true peace. It doesn't mean the world around you is peaceful, <laughs> but, and it doesn't mean you're weak and you're some kind of like, you know, snowflake or whatever. It's a it's a balance that you when you read about the great warriors the 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 Sun Tzu's and you read the Tao Jings and you read about the Alexander the Greats and you read about the peoples that Ulysses and all these great people there was a balance they had they were artists they were calligraphers they would also kill you in fifty seven different ways but not out of anger and not out of hate and they were such a place of balance and so you know my life now is about restoring that balance and then bringing that balance to other people but i can't do it for you and over the course of 41 days you know it is a it is is a conversation how much do you do you really want it more often than not we fall in love with getting in shape you know um, we fall in love with being healthy or we fall in love with you know having things or whatever but we don't like the idea of what it takes to get there. You know, we, we don't like that. We, we don't like to feel uncomfortable. And, and we have to become comfortable in the uncomfortable. And in turn, the things that are holding you back, they, they dissipate and go away. You know, so that's what the 41 days is about. Yeah, you know, when you and I didn't talk before you showed up here today. And, and, and so when, like, I was putting together your words, and I, I'm glad you've hit this a couple times today, and I'm, I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure, but certainly I was pretty confident that idea that you are introducing situations to people that then they figure out like what the answers are to their questions. And then you said it multiple times today, like, Hey, I don't have the answer for you and I can't tell you what to do here, what to do there, but I can take you to a place where you're going to start looking in, you're going to start looking inside and you're going to start asking some questions and finding the answers. Yeah, it's exactly. And that that's everybody is trying to tell you how to be, you know, like you go to Tony Robbins, you know, I don't want to diss Tony Robbins or anything cuz he's like probably will send assassins after me. <laughs> <laughs> but like <laughs> good luck to those assassins. <laughs> bring it. Yeah. Bring it. I dare you. Um but yeah, you know, like they're going to track you up in the mountains on horseback <laughs> themselves. Are you kidding yeah, me? Tony, Not you happen. ain't coming there, dude. I dare you. I challenge you, Tony. I saw Shao Hao. Um but you know, like people get so fired up and they get so amped up and they spend their life watching all this stuff and all these things and going to these things, but they don't actually do anything. If you did one tenth of the information that's contained in your brain, you wouldn't be in the situation you're in. We just become addicted to getting more information. You know, it's like, you know, 12 steps to purpose. Like, oh man, like you're going to get to the end and it's 12. It's like, woo. But then what does the guy come out with? Nine steps. Yeah. You're like, oh shit, I got to get the other book. There's only nine. Like, <laughs> you know, like now he's got, he's got, he's got nine more books to write. Uh, to me, the jury is out on what it means to really be a human, but we've lost that. We've lost that knowledge um, in pursuit of a construct 
that if I if I get to the end of an idea that never was mine in the first place, I'll achieve some end state, right? I'll retire or um, I'll achieve happiness, you know? Maybe it's a, it used to be in the 80s, you know, become a millionaire. Now, if you're a millionaire, who gives a <laughs> shit? A million bucks, like, I mean, it's like, a million bucks is like nothing nowadays, right? You know, it, it's, what was it? Like they had that spending bill or whatever. And it's like, if you took $1 trillion and you stacked it on end to end, it'd go a third of the way to the moon. Okay, so 3.5 trillion goes to the moon in part of the way back, <laughs> right? Like, so, but there, those things like that really matter in life are, are your food, your water, your shelter, and your relationships in your life. And um, if you're not in balance with those things, there's not there's no things in life that are going to help you find a place of completion because eventually you will face the man in the mirror. You will eventually, no matter what, no matter how many cars, no matter what it is. Like I was using the example of like Warren Buffett was like laying in the desert and dying, like about to die. And I came like walking by with some water and I was like, hey, Warren. Give me all the money that you have, and I'll give you this water. He would take it. He would 100% take it. He wouldn't be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, he'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> like he'd want it, right? So it puts everything in relative perspective. And the most exciting adventure you can go on is the adventure with yourself. That is the most exciting adventure. And then your whole life opens up. We spend our time like, in shitty relationships with shitty people, afraid to change, in jobs that we hate, doing things that we don't want to do to get to places that we never wanted to go in the first place. And then we bl- and then they, when I was using this example, I'm like, okay, if you're depressed, okay, and everyone's like, you know, this for a while it was like the mental health month and the mental, all this mental health stuff was going on like crazy. Like, you know, everyone's like, hey guys, mental health month. I'm, you know, skydiving for mental health. Like I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm conducting a uh, boxing clinic uh, for mental health and bringing awareness to it and, and mental health. So then you're like, I'm depressed. And it's like, okay, I'm depressed. So then you go to the person that's in charge of the construct and they say, what's the matter? You don't like your life? well, I don't know, something's wrong. They're like, hmm, well, we're going to give you some things to get you back to work, okay? We're going to get you back in love with the very thing that you hate. It's never something is wrong with the thing, the construct itself. It's always something wrong with you. So then you're like, okay, so you take the stuff and you feel good for a while and you're like butterflies and everything's going around, but then it wears off in six months and you go back. And then the people tell you, okay, we got to get you back in love. We got to get you back to work. We got to get you back undepressed. It's never about making massive lifestyle changes. Like it's never about throwing the keys away, getting radically committed to yourself. It's always about changing you to get you back in love with the very thing that's causing the depression. Right? It's never about like radical change. It's always like, "Mm, you have a chemical imbalance. So we'll give you some chemicals to get you back in balance. (laughs) <laughs> that'll work by the way 79 bucks a month and and so i think that like we have to stop like we have to pump the brakes like you know we have to return back to the basics of what it means to be a human and and you know my work with veterans is like they're basically involved in a socialist system right mm-hmm. they show up to an institution it's a one size fits all right my greater goal is to create a board of the smart innovators people that that maybe there's a wellness arm like a fedex for veterans right and the post office doesn't work where guys can say you know what red pill blue pill mm, six weeks in therapy meds this that counseling for 10 years all these other things institutions meetings or whatever or or maybe there's an eight-week program i'm going to go to that'll be the sh- suckiest thing i've ever done in my life it'll be the true hero's journey but when i come out the other side I will have learned what I am and I will take that knowledge and I will begin to change the world around me with my own energy, my own impetus and my own identity from the inside out. We should give people that opportunity. But instead, you know, you show up to these, like you said, these false prophets that what are they there really, really to do? Yeah. What's scary about this is so much of the stuff that, that people get like prescribed or advised it actually 
you know, in, in some of the talks that you, you talk about, like peeling away layers to get to you, all those other things are actually added layers. They're <laughs> adding layers on top of layers on top of layers that seem to smooth things over for a month or, you know, three months or whatever. And then all of a sudden that whatever's in there is starting to burn through and cause, you know, caustic material to rise to the surface. And so you're like, wait a second, I don't know if this is it. So you go back and they say, cool. Oh, oh, you got a little uh, friction coming out, L- little caustic materials coming out. Cool. Let's put another layer on that and put another layer on that. And then we, you know, what are you going to put over it yourself? You're going to put, you know, a car or a watch or a whatever expensive item that is another layer on top of this. It, it It's not a solution. No, it's not. It's not. A, it's like this. Is, I So I just went through yesterday with my wife. We like threw out like a shit ton of stuff. Right. Because the average American household has over 300,000 items in it. Okay? <laughs> and I walked in there. You have all, a weird like a uh, nerdy freaking. Uh, uh, what is it? Statistical <laughs> analytical mind. Well, you know, I like listen, it. I actually just watched like a thing when I was traveling back from Florida about these like minimalist people or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, of course, went in there and it's like. And I told my wife, so we're down in Florida, and what does she want to do? She's, like, obsessed with the Goodwill. We don't buy anything new, nothing. And the kids, nothing new, zero. Everything we buy, use, or, you know, Goodwill or whatever. But that in and of itself is an addiction, right? Because I'm like, she's like, oh, my gosh, I got this flannel. I'm like, you have, like, 90 flannel. (laughs) She's like, I know, but this one was, like, three bucks. And I'm like, that's the problem, right? Like, you don't need that, right? So, So we went, we were like, okay, once a week, we're going to target one portion of the house and get rid of stuff. So yesterday, we threw out, we were taking to the Goodwill. We, I mean, I don't, we took out an entire like Ford Expedition full of things, okay? And then like we were done at like three o'clock in the afternoon and I looked around and I was like, it doesn't even look like we took anything out. I mean, like how many potato peelers did we have? I was like, we had like nine potato peelers. Meanwhile, in Ethiopia, I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm like, we had so many things. And what do things represent? They're measurements of time. They're measurements of time because you have to have time expended and energy to get that thing, right? And so then I get this thing. And then there's always another thing that you need to get. Well, the attachment for the mixer that goes in the thing that does the pasta. Like, you know what doing that shit. But like, well, it's an extra 10, you know, we'll add it on there. Like, and so we started going through and just getting rid of tons of stuff, you know. And, and the scariest thing is going to be like going to my closet, you know, like, and, and realizing that, wow, I've spent a lot of time in my life getting these things. And I'm like, never have time. I had a time and I don't have enough time. What am I doing with my time? I'm using my time to get things that I don't need. And so it's like Gandhi was asked the question, what confuses him most about modern man? He said, modern man spends all his time to get money, then spends all his money to get his time back. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's pretty profound, right? Like, yeah. and um, I remember running that calculus as like a young, well, not, not a young seal, but I'd been in the teams for a while. And there was people, I guess, as sort of maybe remember the adventure racing things as that oh, started yeah. coming out. But then, Eco that, and then that became sort of extreme sport and like that whole thing. And then I thought to myself, man, uh, people like work hard to get money to pay for to learn how to skydive or scuba dive. And I get to do that. That's just freaking cool. Like yeah. I thought I had the whole system beat, man. And I kind of did in a little bit, you know, it's like, hey man, I'm doing, you're working your ass off to go do this. I'm literally getting paid to do that stuff in the first place. I, I one, one thing that I, that I think was probably, it might be, it's a very important part of my life. Um, when I was in the teams, I, my first platoon and I like, figured out to take a step back and look around. I call it detachment now because I don't know, that's the word that I figured out to call it. But like you're in a situation, there's shit going on and no no one's making a decision. And I like learned, hey, take a step back, look around and you'll be able to see infinitely more than if you keep staring down the, the sights of your weapon or whatever. And I learned that clearing oil rigs and training and then I started applying it and everything I did but but then at some point I started applying it to like you know having a conversation with my platoon chief and my platoon chief starts getting mad about something and I'm thinking instead of me being in the moment like in my own head getting mad back and escalating the situation and now all of a sudden 
I'm yell- in a yelling match with my platoon chest. I never, I never did that. I'd be like, oh, hey, got it, chief. And I would take a step back. And, and I feel like that was helpful and is helpful to me, I guess, all the time. Because I'm always like taking a step back and saying, hey, what, what am I really doing? Like, what's, what am I, what, what's driving this, me to do this particular thing? Or what's making me do this other thing? Or why am I not doing something else? And it seems like uh, when you go into these extreme situations, it's another time where it happens. Like when you're freaking dog ass tired or you're freezing cold. And you know, it's like I was telling that story about my, my uh, SDV buddy that was just like, I don't want to be doing this anymore. <laughs> and you t- take that step back. Do you feel anything like that? Like in these sweat lodges where, bro, you can only suffer so much. And then you got to just like take a step back and look at your whole f- life. Except you, ha- you have to let go. See, it's like, you have it's it's the art of like letting go it's the art of detaching like and that's when you go from that kind of physical to spiritual where where you're no longer holding on to anything and you're just being and that's when (laughs) we spend so much time asking and wanting things but no time listening (laughs) just being still and listening. Well, you know, it, it, in those places, the you know, I'm like, you know, your mind's going a million miles an hour, and you're like, I gotta get out, like all these things, like ah, this and things are popping up everywhere. I don't know, Betty. I wonder if she, uh, who's Betty? Like, I don't, like all these things are coming, right? And and then all of a sudden, when you when you learn to quiet your mind and be still and begin to listen, the things that you need for your life. Out of the nothingness comes to you. I don't know how to explain it scientifically or you know, like in a lab or like whatever, but I'm telling you right now, the, the, if you look at like Jesus, for instance, right? Like Jesus really like, I mean, out, Jesus wasn't a religion, okay? Jesus basically said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, to love yourself, you have to know who self is or you only love the idea of self. So you have to know what yourself is, right? And then the kingdom of God, it's in you, okay? It's actually within you. And then like those leaders of the day is like, by the way, those dudes are liars and they're gonna kill me, (laughs) but you know, whatever. So he was a cataclysm. He was a nuclear bomb dropped on culture of the day, okay? So we think of cataclysm, we think of meteorites or floods or earth fractures or whatever, solar flares. But a powerful idea that speaks to the core of who we all are as people is a cataclysm, and he was a cataclysm of the day. But his message was simple, right? You have to love what you have to you have to love yourself. Well, you have to know who itself is, and you have to love yourself. Then you have to love your neighbor the same way, right? And then the kingdom of God is it's in you. It's it's in you. So you have to go within. And so what does he do? He goes up there and he doesn't have food or water for forty days, right? And then you know they kill him. And then, by the way, he comes walking through a wall. He's like, by the way, you never die. Okay, thanks for the message, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the message. Like, if you look at through all about history, it's always the same. Know thyself. It's inscribed in the Oracle of Delhi. And every year we have a different saying at Heroes and Horses that's on the belt buckles that the guys get when they graduate, this coveted belt buckle. And uh, everyone, they have a different saying. And this year is gonna is the saying is "Know thyself." And um, uh, you know, one year we had "Think greater than you feel." You know, we have all these other ones. But know thyself, and I think that's just gonna kind of stay there forever. Now I'm done making up slogans. Uh, I I think like know thyself is a is a powerful thing, right? And so that is inscribed in gold at the Oracle of Delhi, 1400 BCE. It hasn't nothing has changed except for know thyself i'll caveat that or else other people that actually know what you are will use you to create their own kingdom and enslave you that's that's what it is this is this is this is reminding me of a uh i don't know we were doing a podcast a while ago and we got asked a question some it was like legit i think it was legitimate dating advice someone was asking or they got dumped or something like this oh that's heartbreaking and so I was saying, and I've given this answer a few times on the podcast. Hey, when you're when you get dumped and you get broke up and you're all heartbroken, 
I, I try and explain that like, hey, the person that you were in love with that cheated on you or that you know ran away or whatever they did, the person that you were in love with actually didn't exist. It, it, they, they didn't exist. That girl that seemed so sweet but then she cheated on you or whatever, you were in love with this idea of this person and, and now it's gone. You have to accept the fact that the person that you were in love with actually didn't exist and it, it kind of is a good thing. You go, oh, wait a second. I'm all heartbroken now, who am I gonna marry? Now who am I gonna spend the rest of my life with? Oh no, actually the person that I thought I was gonna marry and the person I thought I was gonna spend the rest of my life with didn't exist. The, this girl was not a good person. And now I got to learn that, now I can move forward. But what I'm relating this to what you're talking about is when people look at themselves and they got this idea of themselves that they're kind of maybe not in love with, but they at least like, yeah, you know, I'm this or I'm that. I'm a fighter, I'm a soldier, I'm a Wall Street dude or whatever you are. You have this idea of yourself like, hey, you know, I kind of love who I am. And then there's something going on where you actually don't love that person and because you know that that person that you're portraying doesn't actually exist. It's a projection. It's a projection and so that's a rude awakening. And I think that can be a rude awakening when someone gets out of the military and is all of a sudden saying, oh, the person that I was, which was a soldier, a sailor, an airman, a marine, that person, all of a sudden they literally don't exist anymore. And you can try and hang on to it, but it's got it's it's not gonna be there. You don't, like you said, you don't have, your, your friends, you don't have a work, you don't have a platoon anymore. You don't have a platoon anymore. It's, think about how heartbreaking it is when you don't have a platoon anymore. It's a freaking horror show. It's everything. I love a SEAL platoon. And all of a sudden you don't have a SEAL platoon anymore. You don't have it. It doesn't exist anymore for you. Mm-hmm. And so you can't, you, you have to figure out, okay, what, what am I really? And you've got to dig in there and figure that out. And you know, I think for me, again, I was always like a rebellious kid growing up, blah, blah, blah. And I always was like questioning myself. And I don't know, I think when, when even when I was in the SEAL teams, like there was, I'd look at some leadership and be like, this guy's whatever. This, this guy's not me. Right, this guy's legitimately not me. Like, I know who my guys are, yeah. and I know what we're like, but that guy's, he's not really one of us. Yeah. And there's a bunch of people that aren't really one of us. Mm-hmm. So I always kind of felt that. And it was okay when, okay, now I'm gonna move on to my next job or whatever. I got out of the Navy, retired from the Navy. But man, f- trying to figure out, trying to make sure that you know who you are and make sure that who you are isn't a construct I just used your word of the day, construct. Mm, I normally don't use that word. That's an interesting word. I don't normally use that word. That construct that you built, it might not be for real. And if it's not for real, that's gonna, it's gonna sting and all, but it's gonna sting, it's gonna hurt, but cool, now you know that, now you can figure it out. Now you can get in there, start Damn. doing work. Baseline. You gotta hit the, you gotta hit the bottom of the bowl, you know, where, where, where the projection doesn't protect you anymore. Listen, you can, you can you can dress up all day and put on the MMA stuff or whatever and until, you know, you get freaking spun kicked in the side of your head and then the projection doesn't work anymore, right? Like, and, that, and that's life. We, we're all, you know, it, everybody's living some form of projection at some point in their life. And, you know, the thing is, is as those projections fade, you become depressed and you become disenfranchised. And, and the thing is, like, you don't have to be. If you have one job really in your life is to wake up and just be yourself and then you can't fail you, it's impossible like sure it doesn't mean i do dumb shit i do dumb shit i say things i have second guess myself oh shit i don't call my wife i should have never said that she's like honey and <laughs> but then she's like it doesn't matter because that's just how you are just be okay with that and so you just if everybody just woke up and just and just were their authentic self the entire world would be a completely different place like think about like think about filters Think about a filter on a cell phone, right? You got some like lady where like, you know, the Botox is failing, shit's going down, probably was hot, <laughs> ex-husband's in Dallas, like, you know, <laughs> but you know, she's kind of like this, she's kind of a little droopy. And then, and then she puts the filter on, you're like, boom, right? In love with a projection of themselves, you know? It's like the worst thing is you see everybody, 
sitting on the bus and I'm sitting on the bus, you know, the today and, and everyone's like, you know, you can see them over there like liking they're like, and they're like this, they're like, LOL, LOL, like heart, heart, LOL, like happy smiley face, <laughs> right? Like they're the saddest looking people, you know, dudes like bellies are gross, their mask is on crooked, you know, their hair is <laughs> fucked up. They got two cell phones, right? LOL, 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 <laughs> right? It's all a projection. <laughs> it's a total projection. And so like we have to stop being projections and get back to the basics of who we are. But unfortunately, we put projections in these places where we try to be like somebody else rather than being ourselves. And that's destroying the fabric of humanity. And, you know, if you look at, you know, you look at Chinese culture, um, they're all simulated. Everyone's wearing the same clothes. Everyone's doing the same things. Everyone's serving the same people. They're all born from Chinese mothers. They're all, you know, they all have this, they all have this plan in place, this 10,000 year destiny. Okay, what are we trying to do? We're trying to like, you know, we're trying to make the rent, you know, we're trying to like, you know, we're trying to pass the bill, you know, we're trying to, you know, you look at the, these people. Well, I don't want that either. That is a nightmare. There is no individuality. Like, what do you exist? You exist to serve the state. Well, you exist here in North America to serve the projection, the projection. Oh, I'm going to go. Why? I'm going to buy the car so that when people see me, they'll think I'm successful, even though I work at in and out which I'm not, no dings on in and out You Actually, props uh, to in and outs pretty good to go oh yeah, yeah by okay. the way didn't they just do some great stuff or something they wouldn't do the covid vax or something i don't know shout out to in and out okay, good burgers but like you know or whatever like you you but like you'll see people will buy things and do things and extend themselves to a point to to fulfill a projection and it's so empty because there's never enough there's always a new thing. There's always another thing. And so your whole life is giving you a projection. And that's why people are quintessentially lost. They are, they are literally have their self standing next to them in their life. And they're completely in the material realm. Everything is material. The five senses. There's nothing else beyond that. So in that case, I have to chase these projections down, get that one get the next one, get the next one, so on and so forth. That's why like filters and all those things, like they're cancer because they, they, they are nothing more than a project. You don't look like that. You don't, you're not that way. It's like, like a great, it's, if you take a step back and think about this, hey, I gotta, f when I send a picture to my friends, I'm gonna run it through a computer program that makes me look better. Like it's that's a so, crazy thing, it's right? It's so crazy. That's a crazy thing. Yeah, because it because it and it drives it it it's put us into all forms of chaos as a society, right? Like where I mean, you think about you know, this whole thing on climate change, and everything that's happening in the world is like, I think the debate is like, are we causing climate change or are we just destroying the environment, right? Well, we are 100% destroying the environment. Um, and for what? So you can have like another table, <laughs> another mahogany table, <laughs> okay? Like, or more diamonds, you know, because I love you. And I want you to have this diamond that was mined by children <laughs> in Africa and smuggled over here so that we can be together for a year <laughs> and then you can take half of everything I have. But <clears throat> you know, it, it's, it's this whole bizarre thing where it's like, we don't even care about anything except for enforcing our own projections. So it's like, Hey, maybe we shouldn't like chop down every tree because maybe what I breathe out, the tree breathes in with tree breathes out. I breathe in. Maybe we shouldn't be dumping the chemicals into the rivers. What is it? Almost every river in North America now contains glycophate in it, right? So it's bleeding in from, um, NPK from mass farming and agriculture. The soil's dying. I mean, I'm with ranchers. I'm in rural, I'm in agricultural people. That's my life. And you, you listen to these old guys kneel down and pick up the soil. It's dead right and where is all this stuff going where is all these things going what's happening around us uh is that people only care about their own projections and the very things that give them life they're destroying to further something that does only exist fictitiously as an idea and it's a scary time to be living in right now it's like you know here we are like ukraine like russia like look out like wow like they're coming they're gonna get us ah like they're russians and and it's like, okay, but you're really concerned about their borders, but like, what about like our borders? <laughs> like, aren't those important too? No, 
only the ones in Ukraine, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and it's it's you get sold these illusions, and and in turn we destroy every single thing around us, including ourselves. And if we don't change, we are coming into an epoch. We are coming into a time, a real time, that we will become unrecognizable to ourselves. And when I see guys coming and they're on 11 medications or on eight medications or been in therapy for 10 years, and all, they're unrecognizable to themselves. They are unrecognizable. They look in the mirror. They don't know what they are. They only exist as a projection of an identity. And, you know. Yeah, it's like. Um, sorry for the doom and gloom, y'all. No, uh, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> you have, you listen to this podcast a little bit more. We got doom. Okay. We, we, got a, we, okay. got a, we got plenty. I mean, of there is like, yeah, there is like a 1940s like machete. Like, I, <laughs> a, I get. The, 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 the weird thing is. Is as you look at this stuff in a in a large scale, all these things are in place, and you you know when you just were saying that about vets, and you're on a bunch of medications and you're being basically subdued. You know you're being subdued, and it's not just vets. It's like humans. Humans. Humans are being subdued. Look, we don't really actually want you to do anything. We don't actually want you to come up with your own ideas. We don't actually want you to write your own freaking books. We don't want you to create something. What we want you to do is continue to, to feed our machine that we've got working over here. That's what we want. We want to feed our machine and we don't want you to feed your own machine. And that that's, that's like what is actually happening. Because people spend, as I don't know what the, what did you say, 37 years in front of a screen or whatever it was. Yeah. You're not gaining when you're doing that. That's not that's not for you. That's for them. That's so they can sell your that they, they can sell you to whoever their advertisers are so you can buy more of their stuff. That's what's happening. It's your energy. They need your energy. See, <laughs> everything is energy. They need you and I say they, okay? Like uh, corporateocracies, governments, whatever it is, marketing companies, data capture people, whatever. You see, they need your attention, and your attention is your energy, and that is the impetus for them to grow. But if you're using your own energy to do your own thing, they that's hate, problematic. That. That's scary. That's really that's scary. scary for them. Right. It's terrible, and they can't have everybody running around. So what they, they want you running around with a projection. You need all these things to help your projection. And it is – this is a, like almost cliche right now. It's cliche for me to say what I'm about to say. There are free psychologists and scientists and computer programmers or whatever they're called sitting, figuring out literal ways to make you look at the screen more, yeah. to addict you to that. That's what they're actually doing. They're actually doing that. They're actually doing that. And you're, by the way, you're paying them to do it in many ways. You're actually giving them money to do this so that they can get you to not think for yourself and I'm not saying like, oh, think for yourself, come up with some crazy. No, think for yourself. Yeah. Like actually think about what's going on around you. Instead, you're just receiving what someone else is telling you, which what they're telling you to do is waste more time looking at this and, and, and to buy whatever product it is that they're making. This is what, what's actually happening. Think about like what, have you ever heard of the Milgram experiments? Oh, yeah. It's crazy, right? Yeah. What, two thirds of the people killed the person because mm -hmm. the guy in the white coat told them to, right? So it's already figured out. We already understand how to like corral human beings and to get them to give their energy and focus into developing what, what, whatever it is is vying for your attention it needs you. It doesn't exist without you. I mean, our founding fathers are pretty smart. We the people, okay? Um, you know, they understood that there is a power associated with the people, you know, the people united, the people, you know, believing in the goodness and the opportunity that was afforded by this nation. And, and, and instead we, we have fractured ourselves among the most trivial things and then given our energy. And then we complain about the very thing that we feed to build. We complain about it when we are responsible for paying for the bricks, the prison keepers, the uniforms, everything. And so 
turn your attention to something else. If you took that same time, you know, between 14 and 23 years watching TV in your life, let's just say take one year out of that. Maybe you get 22 years in Netflix in, all right? Take one of those years and, and, and just solely dedicate it to yourself. And if you do, well, you will regain time because time is accelerating extremely fast. And it's accelerating because because time is only realized by the experiences that are contained in it, right? So like, like you know, uh, I've heard it said like one million years with one event or, or 10 minutes with 50,000 events. Every moment of our life is filled with an, with, with an experience. And so we realize time and time accelerates and we accelerate our own time in life. It's like at the end of the day, you're like, man, like you feel like you lived a lifetime because you realized every moment of that day and none of it was spent with you. None of it. And so you feel disconnected, right? Well, don't worry. Take a vacation down to Disney. We're going to get you patched up, <laughs> you know, have a couple margaritas, you know, <laughs> eat four meals a day. It's vacation. <laughs> Consume, right? And so this built-in acceleration that's happening that we feel in the world right now is caused because all of our energy is directed towards that. And so I think that we can walk away. And, you know, I've, I've walked away, you know, I kind of started out when I first started this, I didn't know with social media, I had nothing. I'm like, okay, I'm starting a foundation. Like I got to get an Instagram, you know? So I used to look back at like the Instagram I had and it was like, I didn't, I didn't even know what a hashtag was, you know? Um, I, I was like, it, I it was like, you know, it was like me like chopping wood, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> do work or something. I, I had the worst things, but then it kind of grew and I got to like almost 20,000 people and I was like sharing ideas. And then, and then I, you know, throughout, you know, my experience of going through the program every season, cause I'm out there doing it. Right. I'm not out there like standing there, like, you know, I'm living it with the guys. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the ice. I'm feeling the cold. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hitting the ground. I'm riding the Colts. I'm like at 10,000, 11,000 feet. I'm building the camp. I'm feeling every moment. I'm in the sweat lodge. I'm doing, I'm not like this, like kind of passive participant. I'm there. And then I just realized I have to walk away. Like I have to just do it. So I just, I just deleted it and I just walked away man, all these like anxieties and things like it went away, you know, of course, like my foundation has it and all those kind of things. And then like, I don't know, like a year later, I was like, I'm going to start it up again. I, I got a message to share the world. And what do I start doing? Next thing I know, I'm sucking back in the hole. I'm in there and I'm doing this. I'm doing, and then I just, and then I just stopped. I just deleted. I'm like, I'm done for the rest of my life. I'm never doing that again. And, and it's like, it's the battered wife syndrome, you know, and it's like, that's what I had. And, and, and I look and listen, people can choose whatever they want to do or whatever. But I'm just saying for my life, I needed to realize that my energy needed to be directed at something else and that I wasn't being, you know, I wasn't fulfilling and maximizing my potential as a person because I was spending my time to start. And I was like, you know, consciously like, this is not a projection. This is who I am. This is, but then of course I'm like, eh, I don't like that little love handle. Like, get, you know, honey, get on another side shot here with the ax. Thanks I'm in the, the remote room. wilderness here. <laughs> Photoshop. Right, like, right. Yeah. Like Photoshop, like, you know, just, you know, three bucks, you get the abs. It's no big deal. This is the freaking man wilderness <laughs> filter. From, yeah, exactly. From Micah Finn, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, so I, I'm trying longer. to change. Like I, I, we haven't bought meat from the store in four years. You know, I sold my beloved pickup truck to my good buddy, uh, team guy, and I bought a 66 foot by 17 foot wide geothermal greenhouse and an excavator and work on my land. And, you know, we have the ranch and, you know, uh, training my horses and like my kids, like they don't have any tech, they don't have any uh, screen, they don't have any iPad, they don't have any of those things. Teaching them the real basic things like, and I started realizing how much time I was actually spending doing the things that I'm actually railing against, you know? And so um, little tiny changes, one step at a time, you know? So do you not have a vehicle? 
No, I have, I have, a, I have oh, a vehicle. Okay. But no, I had this truck. I had this 75 Ford High Boy. I put a 429 Cobra Jet in it. And I Jesus. souped it all up. It was sick, red, lifted. It was all, you know, it was a cool guy, like one mile to the gallon. And I started <laughs> like a bird died, you know? It was like <laughs> that kind of truck. And I loved it. And I always wanted that growing up as a kid, you know? I mean, the, the Ford High Boy was cool <laughs> when I was a kid. And, um, but I sold that and I bought things and, and I've really, um, I've changed the relationships in my life. And even the things that I expose myself to and the content and those kind of things, um, radical quiet time in the morning, you know, like, like not just like working out and getting in my sauna or whatever, but like, like learning to just sit there and be still and thoughtless and then like, you know, get to the place where I can do that for 40 minutes without, without a thought and just breathe nothing. And then all of a sudden I have all these realizations about things. I don't know where they come from. I ha well, I do know where they come from, right? You get plugged in. That energy is real, and you get plugged into it, and that's what guys find. Listen, there's days in the backcountry where it's like everyone's kind of chatty, and then there'll be like days where you're on a horse, and it's like <laughs> nobody says a word. Yeah. And it's just like, man, you can like... It's amazing. Everyone's real talkative at the first like twelve minutes of a forced road march, you know, with a rucksack. Oh yeah, this is gonna smell. Blah, 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 blah. And then like thirty minutes in, dead silence for the next four hours as you just hump it out. You're trapped in there in your own little brain. Do you think that you were? Uh, do you think that you made the SEAL teams, or SEAL teams made you? <sighs> Probably a little bit of both. Well, yes, a little bit of both. Um, I can I can tell you like from my experience of like going through buds I, I was never gonna quit I never thought about quitting I was just like I was so stoked and happy like this is what we're doing this is what I'm doing uh, I, it took me a while to figure out like I wanted to be a good seal you know that's what I wanted to be once I got in the teams I wanted to be a good seal and it took me a while to figure out what that actually was and I, I don't think I really figured it out until probably about five years after I retired <laughs> Yeah. And I think I would still be mod I'm, I'm still working on it right now. But, you know, there was different things that I did along the way where it seemed like the team guy thing to do. And then as I got older and figured out, oh, yeah, that wasn't really exactly a good team guy thing to do. Now, there's some core tenants that never changed. And I think the ultimate one is, like, if you're a good team guy, you put your team in front of yourself. And that seemed clear to me from day one. And, and I think that, that is the ultimate sort of the ultimate quality of a good team guys like oh that guy he will do he, he will he, he's gonna put you ahead of him and if you have a platoon full of guys and they're all putting each other ahead of themselves like that's a freaking kick-ass platoon so i kind of knew that or i kind of felt that way like even with the friends i had growing up it was sort of that same mentality about not being selfish and not putting yourself, like not looking out for yourself. And and so when I got in the teams, that core belief was probably it was probably in existence when I got when I was when I got in the teams of like, hey, you don't put yourself ahead of your friends. I think uh that's what I was kind of that's what me and my friends were like when I was a kid. And I think that was that core tenant was there. So did it get honed? Hell yeah, it got honed. But I'd say it was kind of there, man. Yeah. It's like something I feel like when I showed up at Buds, it was like I felt really inferior to everybody. Like in the sense that everyone was like ripped and like they were like all had like, you know, played football and everybody was like sports athletes and everyone was there. And I just felt so inferior. I had like this shitty tattoo. <laughs> Like everyone made fun of, well, not the classmates, but all the instructors. What they, was the shitty tattoo? Uh, I have a, I still have it. Um, it. I have like a transformer tattoo, well, but it's just like a shitty outline that was done uh, by a friend of mine, like check. on this arm and, uh, yeah, and, uh, whatever. But like, I got this thing and they used to always say, fake it up here and show everyone your stupid tattoo. And then I'd have to get up on the truck and then they would be like, everyone laugh. And of course, everyone, you know, everyone would laugh and then Dude, so they would come girl. down. And I remember we had this one, we had this one chief, my instructor, I'll never forget. He's like, he was the one that was constantly calling me out. He's like, get up here and show everyone your stupid tattoo. And I was like, whatever. So I'd like go up there and show them the tattoo. Everyone would do the laugh and then we'd take off on the run, you know, yeah. kind of the thing. And uh, and then one day he's up there and I was like, he's like, you know, 
if I had that tattoo like that, I, I think I would just kill myself. And I was like, well, if I had legs like yours, I would kill myself. Oh, damn. And everybody was like, and then everybody laughed for real. <laughs> so I, I proceeded to eat a mouthful of sand, and I did the run. Every time I lost the sand, because I would slowly do a little, <laughs> like I would stop it after refill. <laughs> refill. Yeah. And I would refill, and I'd put the sand in, and I'd run. But all the instructors came up to me, and they were like, we got props for you for doing that. We know that like really sucked. And they're like, they all like gave, gave props, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I, I just kind of like going through that, like I did have that belief in myself. Like I, I had a belief in myself and I would look at that the instructors, not in a sense of like, they're out to get me, but that like, if they could be on the other side of this experience, then I could be too. Mm. That's all I ever thought about was like, if he can do it, I can do it. You know, it's like the, what was that movie, The Edge or whatever, uh, with uh, Anthony Hopkins and uh, who's the dude that just shot the guy? Oh, Alec, Alec Baldwin. Baldwin. He just shot a, guy. a female, there? actually. He did. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a female. Yeah, that's right. And um, yeah, but remember he did that movie, The Edge? And, yeah, it was a wilderness and, and, yeah, movie, right? Yeah, and he's like, what one man can do, another man can do. <laughs> like, And I kind of like, I mean, I wouldn't say I was like thinking about that movie, but like in my own way, I think... I thought like, man, if somebody else can be standing there with that shirt on, I could be uh-huh. standing there with that shirt on, you know? And I think pressure, and I think those experiences just reveal who we really are. And I think that everybody could make it if they had the ability to look in at that, you know, that fire in the gut or whatever. Uh-huh. But too often not, it's too enticing to ring out. I was, uh, <clears throat> I was not great at anything, right? I wasn't the fastest runner. I wasn't the fastest swimmer. I guess like you, I wasn't like a great athlete. I was like a maybe slightly below average athlete in high school. And then even when I got to the teams, it was like I was never going to win anything. Yeah. So I always felt like I had to work harder and yeah. to be a good team guy. And the quitting thing is crazy, actually. Yeah. When you look at the things that happen with people, like incredible athletes, like I was literally a, a below average athlete and I was young, you know? So like even if, if you went to college, you're, you're more just developed. I mean, the difference between a 18 year old and a 22 year old is a big freaking difference. Big yeah. But you know, I, I had college athletes, D1 college athletes, had an Olympic alternate for gymnastics, which is crazy quit. Uh, wrestler, D1 wrestler quit. Wrestler, really? Yep. Wrestlers are tough. You think? I think so. <laughs> I think so. I, I'm actually, I, my, one of my swim buddies rang out in like um, the after Hell Week in dive phase. We're doing something in the pool, and I'm. I think we're doing buddy breathing in the pool. Yeah. And so I'm passing him my regulator, and I'm taking two breaths, and he's taking nine. <laughs> <laughs> and this dude was from like Iowa or something. He'd never been in the ocean before. And he was super pale. So he was just sunburnt. He looked bright red like Ooh, the entire time. Yeah. And and so I'm doing, you know, taking whatever two breaths given to him, he's taking nine. And finally he just stands up. We're in four feet of water in the pool. He just stands up and he goes to the surface. And I'm like down there and I think, whoa, whoa, okay. So I stand up and he's just calling out, like, hey, I quit. I'm out of here. This is I'm not doing this. After Hell Week. Wow. So that water thing can get a little bit crazy on some people. Uh, yeah, the water thing is legit. You know, I've had some. So, I mean, I almost drowned in Afghanistan. Uh, and, yeah, I had like some. I've had How'd some, that happen? I had some um, crossing a river. Uh, and the uh, a, a rope that I was attached to got wrapped around a rock. And I don't, I don't really know how much I can say about because of the nature of where we were and mm-hmm. all those things. At well, the you were in a river. I was in a river, yeah. And so basically um, I had gone down there once, checked it out. Um, it was much more intense than anticipated. Uh, you know, and I had this like idea like about this water op and all this kind of thing. So I began studying it and there was a really, there was a mission that we needed to get done that had not been successful previously. and. I was in this 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 base with with some guys and was kind of like really amped up on this you know first water op all the things. So go down there the second time with like a two, hundred meters of one inch tubular nylon mm-hmm. all tied together in a, in a Alice pack, and I, the plan was that I would go upstream and offset 
and then swim down to the other side, then pull the equipment, set off a hoist system so that, you know, we could zip line all this stuff and get everybody across. This sounds good. So it was like, uh, uh, you know, class four rapids way, way, way North. And, uh, so it starts off, I'm down there. I got like my, my boots on, I got my stuff This is my second time done. Now I've been watching this thing, drone footage, all the things I've been observing this for a long time. I understood the flow of the river and there was a, dog leg which was like the point of no return like if you went there there was a huge cave and i would watch on the footage like logs and like trees did go in there and like days later would be like bloop and like would come out so i knew if i went in there that i wouldn't live and uh so i go down there and I start going like upstream. So now this is the, you're executing the mission. So I'm at, well, I'm doing the. Or are you doing a recon? I, I'm basically doing a recon to see a proof of concept. And so we're down there. We got guys set up, security, the whole deal. I'm down there. I'm like really nervous. I'm like, whoa, this is like, I'm like in shorts and like, you know, this is like really a wild place. And there's huge cliffs. So there's only kind of one way in this wadi to the ocean, to the, uh, to the river. So I kind of start going up. Well, I end up getting like sucked into a cave that I couldn't see. It would just look like a dark spot on the on the on the aerial. And they like let all the rope go. The rope gets all <laughs> tangled up around me. I'm like a cat grabbing on the sides. Like I can't God. grab on anything. So I end up making it to the beach. Now I can't I can't get back. There's no way to get back unless I do that again. I'm not going in that cave. Nobody has any idea. It's like one o'clock in the morning. So finally I go up and I get the the rope and um, I get it taut and I'm on the beach and I'm like, I sit down and I have a riggers belt on with a carabiner, my boots, fins, and, uh, no shirt and a pair of shorts and a speedo underneath. Um, <clears throat> cause I have to contain that thing. <laughs> Just kidding. So <laughs> that's, that's a total lie. See, it's a projection. And, uh, so anyway, I'm like, so I'm sitting there and I can tell you, I honestly felt like a lot of fear. I felt afraid because like the waves were so big. It was like, Whoa. so I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Like, just like, just fucking Michael Phelps it. Like you can do it. And, I, and like, so I get into the water and I start like swimming as hard as I can. And I was unprepared for the violence of that water. It literally swept me away. And as I'm like flying down, I'm like, I kind of get, a, like almost to where the dog leg is to get to the other side. And so everybody's like in this wadi, there's guys up here on this mountain, these two mountains, and this is all like cliffs and it's kind of not cliffy on the other side. And you know, that was the plan. So as it's like turning like this, I kind of get to here and there's a boulder in the center and the rope goes right around the boulder, which just they're holding an anchor and I just become like a flapping parachute and it just sucks me underneath and my feet go underneath a boulder and it, I had a UDT life vest on. So I pulled a little thing, which I've never done mm -hmm. in my whole training. And I was like, Psh, and it just ripped right off. It was like a toy. It was like, Psh. and my shoes are gone. Everything's gone. Fin's gone. Shorts are gone. I'm in my speedo. All this is happening very quick. And I realized like I'm drowning. And I try to unhook the carabiner and I physically can't. I, I'm not strong enough. And I'm no like crane puff. Like I, I couldn't physically, the current was so strong yeah. and I'm trapped. You couldn't move the rope one and a half inches to no. get it out of that And it was carabiner. a stupid little like black issue, God. like locking carabiner, <laughs> you know, where I got to twist the thing a half turn. Oh, and like, Lord. and I'm like, and I started like really, I started drowning. And I started seeing like, you know, these kind of like, I guess like you would say a hallucination or whatever. I started like seeing all kinds of crazy images and I started feeling like I'm going out unconscious. Like this is like the end. I remember saying like, please God, don't let me like drown in Afghanistan. And, and then meanwhile, these guys are like, everyone's piling down off the hill, like thinking I'm like dead. They saw me like zip by. And so they're heave hoeing and they're like heave hoeing, heave hoeing. There's a lot of rope. So they end up like heave hoeing the rope off the rock. And like I, right when I'm like about to totally just drown. And I remember the saying in Buzz, dry drowning is better than wet drowning. Dry drowning is better. I mean, don't breathe in because you can be resuscitated. God. But if you suck in your toast, like all that water is going to go in your lungs. You know, being a medic like it too. And I just kept saying dry drowning is better than wet drowning. And I just refused to breathe in. And then all of a sudden I like pop up into the foam and I remember like gagging in and sucking all this foam and I'm like Ugh! and I just start washing down the river again I'm just like, hitting rocks I'm like doing cartwheels I don't know which way is up and I'm and I'm like screaming help like 
to nobody. <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, like, and I remember I'm like breathing in foam and I, and I get to the other side, which they could not access me because of the, the terrain. And I get to the other side and I'm like, I'm on land and I start like crawling, you know, super fast to get up on shore. And then they just start dragging me on my face, right? They're like, heave, ho, oh, like, and, and I'm like getting dragged back into the river. And so I get against this boulder and there's a lot of slack in the line. I do kind of like a squat, like, and I pop the beaner off and apparently everybody like fell down and they pull it back and they're like, he's alive. They thought I was dead. They thought I had drowned. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like in my speedo with no shoes on or anything in real bad guy land. Like, and there's like people with like lights collecting driftwood. There's like, and so I'm like, I crawl <laughs> underneath this like outcropping and I cover myself in mud because I saw it on predator. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and I mean, that's really what I did. I remember, you know, like that scene, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I cover myself in mud and I just lay there to like, almost like probably an hour before first light and I'm like thinking I'm gonna be the first seal to ever be captured like and I was like ah oh, like fuck that and I'm like and I got like sticks and like rocks like piled up and I'm just and I'm freezing the like one of the coldest moments I've ever been in my life what was life. the water temp what time Probably, of year was it it was uh August okay but it was cold yep, yep. super cold and we were uh, pretty damn close to as far north as you could go. And um, so I'm uh, I'm like laying there and then I see like some nods, like lights and the guys had made it around, come down there, scanning the shore. And I like popped out. I'm like, here's like mud dude with like, you know, cool guy no, with like a Speedo on, no shoes. Well, I had no shoes. So like they have my bag, they're like, we gotta get out of here now. Like, so I'm like, you you know, we're hugging, like I thought you were dead, we're doing that whole thing. So I get my clothes on, I have no shoes on. And to tell you the truth, I don't remember walking back. I, I think I just like blacked out or something, like, because I was so cold and I have my shoes on and I was so, you know, I got my gun, got all my stuff, got everything. We go back, we get to base. One of the guys there, one of the OGA guys, son's a team guy, he runs one of the branches now. Um so sun's up, we get back and he was there and he's like, he's like in tears. He's like, you want to have a drink? So we go up and we go in the skiff and he's like, I thought you were dead. And I was like, why did we do this? Like, this was terrible. Like we should have never done this. Like blah, blah, blah. And so he gives me a drink. We have a drink and I go back in my room. And I'm like, well, that was like, whoa. So back to like opping it up, whatever, move on. Well, my team leader comes to me like a week later and he's like, Hey brother, you think you could do that again? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, sure, definitely. Yeah. I like go in my room. I'm like, I'm so scared. I don't want to do that. Like that was the worst experience of my whole life. Like, I, but of course I'm like, yeah, I mean, definitely brother. Like for sure. Like, so I started like watching like all these YouTube videos and I started like river crossings, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay. Like, and so I order all this equipment from the, um, PJs and all this stuff comes up. I got throw bags, rescue stuff. I'm like inflatables, Protex, the whole deal. Long story short, I go back down there to prove the concept, and there was people down there. So we bagged ass, canked it, and didn't want to burn the air. Now everyone's hearing about this like water mission going down. And the night we were supposed to go and execute, we never did do it. And two hours before we left, I was switched out with Josh Harris, who drowned and died. And I was right next to him. Yeah, so there's a lot of little details in there I'll leave out, but it was uh, – it was a bad deal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that experience had an impact on me for sure. Uh, and so when I did the Ironman in 2012, one of the reasons why I did the Ironman was because as a free diver, I got into serious free diving, like serious. I'm Venezuela, Mexico, I go all over the world. That's why you were in the teams you were doing that? When I was contracting. Okay, <laughs> and But right. I started free diving in the teams. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, I came up with this whole thing called Spearfishing PT. Uh, cause we had surf uh, PT yeah. and I was like, that's not fair. It's discriminating. Yeah. Like we should have spearfishing PT, uh, <laughs> which was the greatest thing because we never got back to work on time. There was always some kind of issue. <laughs> and so we got the day off basically. Uh, <laughs> I know that that only lasted for like three weeks. Um, but yeah, so I, uh, I had developed even diving around the world. Like, I mean, I was going to very deep deaths, you know, 110 feet, like, uh, killing, you know, tuna in Panama and Ven I spent, you know, three weeks in Venezuela diving. I always had this wreck playing in my head 
of what had happened when I would get in situations. I got my arm caught in Venezuela underneath a rock at 80 feet, you know, and the next thing I know, it's like in my head, like I'm in Afghanistan, I'm drowning. Like it was crazy. I'm like, I got to kick this thing. So I ended up like signing up for the Ironman because I heard like the, the swim the is the most down. terrifying thing in the world, <laughs> which it was. No and kidding. I, yeah, I had like a panic. That's a bold statement coming from that freaking Afghanistan Listen, story. Holy shit. You want a bunch of like middle-aged men and women that are like, you know, hate their lives and trying to find themselves. <laughs> <laughs> like you don't want to be in the water with them because they're vicious. And But anyway, like I'm out there and I'll never forget it. Like I'm a fast swimmer. I, I was like finished, I think, 112 on the swim in the Ironman, which is, is really good, 2.4 miles. And I'm out there, and I started too far in advance for my skill. And then people started swimming over top of me like I was just a random buoy. I mean, they literally <laughs> just kicked me in the face and just – there was 2,400 people just like swimming. And I couldn't catch my breath. And I got kicked in the face. My goggles got kicked off. And, I, and I'm like, hey, God, like, guys, look out. Like, the paddleboard's like, you need help. You know, like, the race is over. Like, and I'm like, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm back. And I remember this guy was like, in a, I'll never forget it. He looks at me. He's in a panic like me. And I'm like, not panicking, panicking, but I'm just like, I can't catch my breath. Because every time I tried to breathe, I'd get some, like, you know, 45-year-old lady's foot, toe up my nose. And and so he grabs onto me, and he's holding onto me, and I'm at this buoy. And I remember he's pushing me down. He's like, I can't breathe. Like, and the paddle boards are trying to get in, and I'm, like, in this mix. And I remember I just looked at him, and I was just like, and that moment, I, like, faced it. And this dude was like pulling me down and I just like grabbed him by his like rubber cap and I punched him between the shoulder blades as hard as I could. And he was just like, this, like it was like electric <laughs> shock, like hit him. And I was like, ah, and I just like, ah, and I just started like swimming. And I, my wife has this great shot of me coming out. I look like, I look like I have like PTSD when I'm coming out of the water. Like I have like bags under my I, eyes. I got, I got news for you. You did. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. And I came out of the water and I was like, I was like totally terrified. And, uh, but I never had another bout with that ever again. And, uh, it was a moment where I was like, I knew I had like, I had like finally like face that thing down, which was like playing in the back of my head. It was really weird. Uh, when I would get into water situations where I'd be in drowning, which happened a lot, like in free dive spearfishing, you know? And, uh, so, and I never had another, another had another issue again. So it was, uh, it was a moment in my life that I'll, I will never forget as long as I live. When we go offline, I'll tell you some more details, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then what what do you got going on right now like with the the beef the ranch the cows like you're full on just going for it Yeah, I mean it just uh, I mean my goal is so we just purchased this ranch We got a capital campaign going on we've raised some money um, Building a human development center there. So which will be uh, it's a 10 person cold plunge a 10 person sauna um, a gym in the center and then a, a meditation room that's soundproof and then it vibrates at 528 me the megahertz of the earth. Mm -hmm. So it's very good grounding. Um, and uh, when something's vibrating 525 megahertz, do you hear it? Do you feel it? Or it it's no, like, it's, it's the it's earth. Like, it's yeah, the okay. earth. So like if you ever, if you know, I always tell people like if you're having like anxiety or something like that, like or you're just like, you know, sometimes you get that kind of like raciness or you feel like you got to like down regulate a little bit. Like the best thing you can go out is go outside, take your shoes off, stand on the ground, be in total silence and stand there. And it usually goes away within like three to four minutes mm -hmm. and I just breathe. It's very grounding. It, it it grounds you. And so, you know, frequencies are super important. So we actually do sound with the guys. And uh, last year, the guy said it was our first year doing it. Uh, almost every guy said it was the most profound experience of their life. We have uh, somebody that comes in and brings those sound bowls and they bring up the resonance outside on the ranch, like deep where the sweat lodge is, and it just vibrates. At, and they do these bowls and it's like, wow. Some people, it's so intense, they vomit from it. Uh, so wait, you sit? What? You lay there. And these are big bowls. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, they're way. bowls and they stir them and they... For the, each bowl produces a frequency and they can bring you up to the resonance, which ground, it grounds you. And so, um, you know, obviously like everything is frequency and everything is, is like, you know, how are you looking at somebody on their iPhone? They're like, how am I talking to you? How am I vibrating right now? And you are somehow interpreting what I'm saying to your brain. I'm literally vibrating to you. And somehow you're like, yeah, let's go do something. Right. <laughs> yeah, go over here. Like, and so, um, 
you know, that's, that's, that sound therapy is something that, uh, it works. It's very, very powerful. Uh, if you've, if you've never tried it, there's probably places here, go, go to a sound bath. They have all these bowls, all these things they'll bring you in there. And because your whole life is inundated with blue light and frequencies and, and Wi-Fi signals and all those kind of things. So what you're doing is you're reestablishing a baseline. Um, so, so yeah, so the ranch, we're building the human development center. We've got an arena going up a 100 by 200 indoor arena. So we can expand kind of into the winter time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then the guys live in non-electric wood cabins with outdoor showers and an outhouse total minimalist. So, um, when we'll you say the guys, the students, the, the students that yeah. are going through, yep. Are going through. So they live in like little lodge pole cabins that we're building that are just little bunks, a little wood stove and an outdoor shower and an outhouse. Uh, a double L house. You gotta get some of that. Yeah, get some of that. Yeah, matter of fact, <laughs> this year when we put the double L house out, we forgot to put the little blanket in the center. And like three days later, the guy's like, hey, do you have like a blanket or something? And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I totally forgot about that. But they were using it, Yeah, which is disturbing. That's one of those things. That's one of the like starkest rem- memories I have from Navy boot camp was that there's no stalls in the shitters. And you were just literally sitting down and there was someone sitting next to you, you know, a foot away taking a shit next to you. It's just the removal of whatever. It's kind of the removal of all privacy is gone. It's like, gone. Yeah, it's 100% We gone. own you. Yeah. Poop next to that guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much we own you. <laughs> Pooping that hole next to that other dude you never met before. And by the way, there's another dude <laughs> on the other side of you. That's also <laughs> shitty. So yeah, that's good nice. times. So you're so you're building this. F- so this is going to up our capacity to take more students yeah. and do more. Yeah, because right now, I mean, the guys are living in wall tents, uh, and everything's out. All the outdoor showers, all that kind of stuff. The ranch we bought has basically a tiny little cabin on it that you know Abraham Lincoln's contractor <laughs> built, and two pivots, you know, and uh, and a small shop that had no well or anything. So we popped in a well. We've done all this stuff, and so now we're raising money to to build that out and to expand the program uh, to year round. And you know, my goal is not to have some big giant program. Like I think that is the problem is that everybody thinks there's like one institution that can do it all. And uh, my idea is to kind of get to a sweet spot uh, with guys and then you know we're capturing data and then to go and to get other organizations to up level themselves and to begin to really start thinking about like human development and bringing forth change rather than like me saying like I can do it all and I can build this huge thing and I, I, I want to I wanna network with people and have them scale up and uh, that people that are really serious about human development and I think that will I think we'll look back and this will be a hub of, uh, um, you know, it'll be a place where a spark formed and uh, where people start looking at things different because the guys that graduate this program, uh, you know, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're changed. They're different. They're changed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and so um, I think that everybody deserves that opportunity, but I can't do it all. And I think that other people, like I said, there's 50,000 nonprofits in North America. You know, we spent $92 billion since 2012 in the end of 2020, and it's gotten worse. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm sorry. And a lot of people like, you know, they hate me because I say, you know, you know, you got organizations, they got Shetland ponies that you can take and they put sneakers on them and you walk them around town. <laughs> like my message is you know fuck you like that is that doesn't that doesn't do anything like like it takes time and it takes commitment and maybe that's not for everybody and and you'll have to walk your own path but i think that as all these existing institutions maybe i can find 10 maybe i can find 10 that are focused on human development maybe maybe it's saying like hey think about the change of a guy you take a guy he's 75 pounds overweight he's on meds he's like but he wants to change and he's got the fire and you put him in a 10 week fight camp right and then think about who that guy would be at the end of 10 weeks, right? Nutrition, diet, focus, meditation, ice baths, like working out, purpose, like feeling good, strong, like getting balanced, all those things. Like, I mean, it's, it's simple, but it's, 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 it takes effort and it takes work. And so my, my goal is to, is to start a new conversation and bringing people together about what it, you know, about restoring um, you know, these guys back to the dignity of who they are. It's crazy. Like the shit's not going to be easy. If you're going to reset your life and dig in and find out who you are, it, that's not going to, that's <laughs> not going to be an easy evolution. Yeah, there's no donuts. Like, yeah, it's like, mm, 
Yeah. And, and it's cr- it's crazy, you know, that, that, that opening that I read from you was like, li- literally, there are some people that are literally trying to give you a magic pill that's going to do all this work for you, like, which is a crazy thing. It's crazy. It's in- It's insane. Like when you think about it, but the thing is, we already know the secret sauce, right? <laughs> yeah. That's why, you know, the business people are like, hmm, let's create something called obstacle course races, <laughs> right? Like you literally climb over a log, flop into the mud, then some roided out dude hits you in the head with a foam bat, and then you get like a medal, and then the next day in the office, everyone's like, whoa, what's different about him? He faced an obstacle gym, <laughs> and he overcame. Right. I mean, that is the essence. Obstacle course races. Like, I mean, we so so set that challenge in front of yourself. I think we can like unite together, do different for me. Like I never thought, you know, we bought a ranch for three million bucks. I met this guy. He was delivering hay. I started talking to him. He goes, oh, my dad might be selling his ranch. You should meet him. Are you looking for a ranch? I'm like, sure. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. We worked seven years with no ranch. Leased everything, set it up every year. Mobile gypsy camp. It was a living hell. Imagine 70 horses not owning one sixteenth of an acre. It was a nightmare. And most people never saw that. And so here I am like going to this guy's place. I sit down with a cup of coffee, you know, big business guy. I sit down. I'm like, he's like, so are you interested in the ranch? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, do you have any money? And I'm like, no. no. <laughs> and he's like, well, thanks for coming. Like basically it was like really nice, but then never talked to me again. So then like a year later, he calls me up. He's like, I'm definitely going to sell the ranch. Are you interested? And I was like, absolutely. So I ride down there in my motorcycle and I'm like, I sit down with him. And he pours me a cup of coffee. He goes, do you have any money? And I'm like, no, but I'm going to get it. Cause I, it was like, it was like the jerk store with like, you know, with, with George Costanza, you know, I was like, thought of this, this comeback like the whole year. And he's like, well, I said, I'll give you my word, give me an opportunity and I'll, and I'll get it. And I, I didn't have any of that kind of resources. So we ended up getting a loan. What year was that? That was last year. So, so you got a loan ranch. against a, a charity? Is that, is yeah, that yeah, we got a loan. Yeah, we got a loan on the ranch, and so um, and I raised a million five from various donors and put the you know down payment or whatever. Took a loan out, and you know now we just launched a four year capital campaign to build the ranch out. So seven seven point five million bucks over four years, and uh, and then you know the funny thing is about nonprofits is that I don't own it. I'm basically even though I'm the founder, I'm I'm just an employee. I'll never have those assets. Like if the whole thing dissolved tomorrow, it goes to either the state or to another nonprofit. And so, you know, I exist in this solely for the development and betterment of my fellow man. And I think that, you know, whether it's a veteran or it's a stay at home mom or somebody recovering from a getting ran over by a dump truck or whatever it is, um, I think that people are going to once again begin looking um, to to partake in that hero's journey and that journey of self-discovery to get out of the places um, that they're currently in. And. So that, that's that's my goal, and we're capturing data. We're working with the university to get results and stuff like that, so that I can go to other nonprofits and sit down with that person and say, "Listen, I know you give five thousand dollars to critically injured soldiers. I also know that you have two hundred ninety million dollars in the bank because your financials are public and online as a nonprofit. Maybe you could run a program that actually does something for people beyond, you know." Uh, getting on their kids' iPads. Maybe we can do something to better mankind. You know, maybe we can do something to level up, you know, society, our society, our community in a way and, and stop giving handouts and start, you know, giving hand ups. You know, I, I think that handouts are a total failure. I think, yeah, of course, people have things and stuff like that, you know, critical things. But like for the most part, like you have to own it. You have to earn it and you have to own it. And I think we get in the opportunity business and we get out of the handout business. Oh, you served? Come on and float in a tube. And then we have a massage therapist online. Like, thank you for your Air Force time. Oh, here's a filet mignon and a carrot and a raspberry. Like, you know, then a jacket and some fishing gear, even though you live in Detroit and you live in a one bedroom apartment and you live below the poverty line, like most veterans do. Um, and, and, and maybe I'm going to give you an opportunity to change your own life but you're gonna have to do the work and we get back in the opportunity business that's that's what i want to see happen and then hopefully you know 
uh you know when the meteorite hits the world and dinosaurs come back or everything like that it'll, it'll be like a plaque somewhere it was like he tried to do good <laughs> but it was futile <laughs> they destroyed themselves aren't you aren't you trying to uh do something with with beef too like yeah so we what's going on with that yeah so uh so the beef model is kind of like so i I talked about the social hybrid is this nonprofits are in this perpetual starvation cycle, right? Where you're beholden to the donors where, you know, you have to raise money and then, you know, you're constantly in this state of having to raise money because you can't generate money because you're a nonprofit. I didn't know that by the name when I started. I'm like, why am I so broke? And then like five years later, I'm like, wait a second, nonprofit? Damn it. Like, so, um, but I was like, we have this ranch. Uh, you know, we're going to start a cattle company farm to table, you know, and I think that like the care of the animal from the moment it's born, living and dying on the ranch, treating that animal with respect. Um, you know, if you've ever been to mass agriculture and you saw what it's really about, it's one of the most disturbing things that you've ever seen in your life. And if you've ever been to a slaughterhouse or a packing plant where they're doing a thousand head a day, you know, they're picking them up with skid steers and eh, terrified adrenaline hormones, eh, like smack, it is very it's not good. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that carries over to the food. And so like, you know, raising that animal, honoring that animal, letting them graze, letting them live, letting them be out there, letting them live their lives, sustainably harvesting them, teaching people how to do that, you know, integrating that and then selling that beef to, um, donors that can then in turn support the program. So that the ranch stands on its own two legs. So it's a social hybrid. It won't exist to make money, mm -hmm. but it will exist to sustain, you know, the program then also expose people to that animal husbandry and to that ranching side of the house. And then also, you know, down the line with the beef. I, I, I think like to me, food, like where your food comes from is so important and it's so critical to the wellness of the individual. You can't expect to be happy if you're eating, you know, uh, Cheez-Its and garbage and all those kind. Of, it all is tied together. Your body is the subconscious mind and even down to the food that you eat. And, you know, what? I started getting exposed to this world and I started seeing things. I was like, man, this is like rough. Like when you really see what's happening put to the animals and those kind of things. And listen, I'm not like, you know, out there like – you know, whatever, like an activist or anything like that. But I'm like, there's a better way. Like the natives did it right. You know, they, they harvested, they took what they wanted. They, they used every component of the animal. Think about the waste that we have. They only take the best cuts. Everything's dog food or this or that. Or like, and so for me, it's like butchering the whole animal, using the bones to create bone broth, taking the hides and, and making boxing gloves and, and American made boxing gloves with the hides. And like, um, taking all the fat, taking all those things, taking the bones, making biochar out of them, right? So like using that as a, as a organic fertilizer that we could use on the ranch and we could give away and share with other people, like using the whole animal and teaching guys those things. Because when they become connected to their food, they start to understand the system that they're a part of. You know, I tell people the whole world is, it's like your life is held together by a wire, okay? A wire. So like if the wire breaks, meaning like the power goes out, millions will die within weeks from a wire. Like, oh, I'll hunt. You're not going to hunt. You're not going to make it out of your high rise. You're going to be like, you'll be in a $25 million tomb. Okay. The water comes out. What are you going to do? It's over. A cable, a cable breaks. The internet goes out and millions die. And I think that so many guys like come and they realize and they change their whole lives because they start to realize the role that we play in the system and how, you know, how everything is now handed to you and you take for granted all those aspects. Um, and so my goal is to stand up that, that system and that human development program and then begin to get other people to do the same thing. And I want to expand a community, you know, and, and that's my goal. So that's what's going on with the beef. And yeah, just to, I mean, I, I talk a lot. Well, not a lot. I talk about China. China. Yeah, China. And, you know, we saw a lot of this during COVID. Like, what are we dependent on? But we're dependent on China for food. And a lot of people don't recognize that. China? Let me, China? China is coming for us. I tell people, I'm like, if you look at Mao during the Chinese Industrial Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, 
Mao knew that he needed nuclear technology. There's been five emperors in China. Emperors, you want, uh, that's what I'll call them. Dictators, mm-hmm. whatever. Leaders, great ones, whatever. Dragon lords. So like microaggression. And <laughs> so, but if you look at what they did, he understood that they needed nuclear technology. So what did he do? He traded food to the Russians in exchange for nuclear technology, starved his own people. 30 million people died during peacetime, and he got the nuclear weapon. They have a 5,000-year plan, all right? They understand that by, by sl- enslaving their own people for cheap labor, because Americans exist for consumption. I want it now, and I want it cheap. And you know, it's like my house. I go in there. How many? How much shit do I need? Right? It's ah, it's cheap. It's only three bucks. Another potato peeler. You never know. So, so, so. China, how many potato peelers did you actually have in five. the house? Okay, there I did you. have five. That's a lot. I did have. I kept two. Okay. Shout out to Cuisinart. But I, uh, I was like. If you look at them, they're smart because what they did is they understood the American psychology. They understand that Americans are overconfident because from childhood they're told, you're the best, you're good. You get praised for things you never deserved. They're entitled and lazy. Chinese are the opposite, right? So they're like marching forward to their 5,000 year destiny. And so what do we do? We outsource everything to them for super cheap goods and in turn handcuff ourselves to them right? Including our medications. The world's most critical medications are made in China. And so, you know, China is on the move and their military is now expeditionary. They're providing aid to foreign countries. They've got their jets and let me, they got hypersonic missiles. And let me tell you something, they're not over here like trying to pass the PT test. Okay. Oh, didn't, you know, got to go to FEP because I didn't make it. By the way, my rights matter. You don't tow the line in the Chinese army. You wind up as biochar, okay? They don't, no need for you. And and Xi Jinping said that, uh, you know, if we try to stand against the Chinese, this was two months ago in a live speech. He stood on their show of force and he said, you will meet a great wall of steel made by 1.8 billion Chinese that are unified. What are we over here? Like, don't go over here. Like, I don't like you. Like, so they banned all girly men on TV. There is no boy bands allowed. Social media turns off at 10 o'clock at night. And, and what are they preparing for? To be a world leader. And who are they in lockstep with? The Russians, right? And, and because they see the United States dwindling because consumption, consumerism, entitlement, overconfidence, uh, and, and, and this desire to tell people what's right and wrong you know, like we have these things. Oh, and then the, what happened in Afghanistan, right? We're no longer a force for good. We are. We better rethink because this enemy is not like an Afghani running around in pajamas. These dudes are probably genetically modified. Who knows what they're going to do? They might unzip their fake Chinese bodies and come out and just be like, who knows, right? We, they are genetically modifying super soldiers. Forbes just, or was it a time or whatever, just had a thing on them. So... We are facing a time right now where this entitlement and all these things that we have are coming home to roost on us. And, you know, buyer beware. Because if the cable breaks, if the earth even burps, okay, if it just rumbles in the wrong place and the power goes out for, say, two months, millions upon mil- there won't be enough excavators to dig the holes for the bodies that will burn. People can say, oh, <gasps> Oh no, but it's the truth. Think about it. If you're living in a $25 million high rise on the 98th floor and the power goes out, where do you get your next sandwich from? By the time you make it down, every store will be gone. All the food will be gone. There will be no water. Your well pumps won't work. Just think about it. Life is held together by a cable and we never think that that cable is gonna ever break. And you know who's holding part of that cable? Network is China. And I don't think that China would have picked a fight with us, but I think we've picked a fight with them. And because here we are just bloating, 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 and, and, and they're refining, 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 refining. So, I mean, if, if Putin invades Ukraine, I bet you, I bet you, you see China, China go after Taiwan simultaneously. Mm-hmm.
I wouldn't be surprised. Yep. And then they, they could launch hypersonic missiles and vaporize our fleet in two seconds. And right. then it's either go nuclear or stand down. I, I think, I don't know what's, what's today, just for reference, today is the 24th of January. Nice. I think that Putin's going in. I think Ukraine's, I think yeah. it's on. I, and I think he's, he, what he's doing is he's looking at Biden, who's compromised, yeah. and he is... I, it I, it breaks it breaks my heart and Russia has a bone to pick because think about it we Eisenhower screwed them over because we were supposed to pay them all that money and we never did and then we chased them over to Russia, or over to Afghanistan what you know caused problems over there whooped on them over there did the Cold War ripped the walls down crushed your economy did all these things right and now we're telling them oh you can't go across those borders and they're just like. Meanwhile, the Russians are over there like every guy is like Khabib. Yeah. You know, he's over like, kill, 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 kill. You know, our guys are over here like, stand down. People are being mean. <laughs> or they're going to call yeah. us back up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not all Americans are like that. There's definitely too many that, I mean, there's definitely plenty of Americans. I, w- I work with a lot of young military folks, and man, they are, uh, Yeah. there's kids ready to rock and roll. But I don't know if the country is. Of the countries willing to sacrifice, like in those situations, our guts are ripped out. I mean, think about twenty-year war. You think you think about like the United States. There was a USA article last year. It's it's worth checking out, even though they're kind of like whatever. But like, they have a, a article with a moving map on it called the cost of war. If you go, if you look it up, or DuckDuckGo or whatever, brave it, and you will see a moving map. And it shows last year the United States, you know, waged war in eighty-eight countries okay so we we had we had an 88 country so we're getting look at the british empire they got so spread so thin in so many places right and they got so worn down they were facing conflicts in turkey and the conflicts in india and conflict next thing you know america you know you got george washington's like we're gonna kill you <laughs> right and and so america's become super extended and i think we need to restore what it means to be an american like I think we've lost. I think that term is synonymous with the wrong things, and and being a patriot is synonymous with the wrong things. And you think patriot, you think like dude riding a jacked up side by side, like woo, like <laughs> like freedom. Like no, there is no freedom. There's only free, and that's what America. Freedom means that someone's affording you that. To me, free is an inalienable right. Is 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 to live like as I see fit and fulfill my purpose and this nation affords me that. And in turn, I serve, you know, my country that gives me the opportunity and provides all this infrastructure and all those kind of things. We take all that for granted and we need to restore the message of what it means to be an American. I don't care what political parties and what color and your race and gender. I don't care about any of those things. What it is is a common thread that made this nation incredibly great. And we've taken it for granted and it's starting to get frayed. And what happens is, is that, it's like Lenin said, you give them a rope and let them pull it around their neck and they'll hang themselves. Matter of fact, they sold us the rope and we put it around our necks. And so I hope I hope we can change. I hope the noise can quiet down because if people got serious, just you change the world by changing yourself. That's the thing. There's not these big grandiose ideas where I get out there and I'm like, you have this huge idea. The idea is that on the really macro scale, I change myself. And when I change myself, I change the things around me. And when the people around me change themselves, the things around me change. And that's how mass change happens. Um, it happens inversely as well. And so, you know, uh, change for the negative. And I think like to restore what it means to be American, to be able to walk down the street and to be able to grab somebody by the hand, to be united, to uh, um, to restore kind of that 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 viewpoint of, of what's made us so great is, is the is is the common thread that runs through the hearts of every single one of us, and and we have to put all those things aside, all these projections aside, and get back to the basics of what it means to be a human. And I think that we can come back from this. Do I think we will? I don't know. Um, I don't know. But if we don't. Um, it will happen to us, and uh, and it will be more swift and more violent than we could ever imagine. Whether it comes from the planet, or whether it comes from another nation, um, the time to change is now, is right now. 
and 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 to readjust so yeah and like you just said all that starts with you yeah whoever you are you if you're listening to this right now it's you it's you change and don't be afraid to change you know we're so attached to these outcomes like don't be afraid to change and uh um yeah i I just like I I have I, I, I see it in the world and I see people like I like today on the bus I saw all these people and I'm like man we are so disconnected from each other just trying to walk out the door of the bus to the rental car company people are shoving each other just to get out first so they could do what <laughs> be one step in front of the other guy right like that's not who we are as a nation that's what makes us different and we got to get we got to get back to those cores core values all right this is a long one that's yeah, all good man um i want to make sure so you've been mentioning your your nonprofit yeah uh horses he, and he, heroes heroes and, heroes and horses did i get it backwards you did. it's heroes and horses yeah okay. heroes and horses heroes and horses you can go to heroesandhorses.org is in there you also have instagram and facebook and a yes. YouTube channel, Heroes and Horses. All, all of those can be found at the same spot. Um, Echo, you got anything? I do actually, Cape. So a long time ago, a few hours ago, you mentioned something about an experience with a black bear, and then you just sort of moved on. Dang. Oh, Good yeah. point. I wanted to come back. I kind of wanted to know what what happened yeah. with the black bear. Listen, you wearing it, that look, freaking look, thing look, claw look, around look, your neck <laughs> right now? <laughs> look, you know, you know what's really funny about that is I've had so many run-ins with bears at this point in the game. I look back at that one, and it and it's kind of makes me chuckle. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had you know we had a bear come out, horse go off a cliff, and get impaled. Like, I mean, I've I've run into them archery hunting all the time. And and now I'm like my black bear story when I was like a teenager coming back from my dark years, and this black bear like tapping this guy like if I see a black bear literally in the back of the I'm just You're like I just pick a stick up and I'm like ah and he's like ah and like take off a grizzly bear <laughs> is different <laughs> a grizzly bear is like you feel like you're hunted but yeah you know, no what had happened was I was out hiking. Um, I was kind of just like, you know, here I am returning from, you know, this kind of childhood, uh, um, you know, uh, I guess you could say prodigal son kind of experience. And um, I'm up there hiking and a gri- while I'm sleeping out, no tent, a small black bear kind of comes in and he's like literally sniffing around. He's all by me and everything. And all I had was like a Swiss army knife that I'd gotten from my grandfather. He had the kind with a little white toothpick you could pull out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I have never had it. And, and, and I was actually very terrified at the time. Uh, I was like, oh, my God, like, here's this thing. I'm laying in my sleeping bag, and he's just kind of sniffing around, sniffing around. He's walking around. And that's what really, like, I started thinking about my life. He got my food. I didn't have it wrapped up properly. He eats my food. <laughs> and so, anyway, that experience right there, like, when I came back, I finished my hike with no food. It was, like, a three-day hike. So two nights and three days total. And that was on my first night. And that whole time I reflected on what did I want my life to be. And so that was a real pivotal moment in my life that that little black bear came in and, and made me think about the fragility of my own life. Um, you know, and it, and I'll tell you, like, there's nothing more, uh, that feeling in the wilderness of the wilderness is no mercy. You know, it has only rule and only law. It has no mercy. There is no equality in nature, you know, and you feel that when you're around animals and you see them and you're with them, there's a, there's an honesty that happens. And, you know, and I discovered that honesty really for, um, because I was a lost person, you know, and I, I did feel like I was invincible. And so that little black bear kind of brought it in made me, I had my Swiss army knife and made me feel my own fragility. So that's what kind of led me to taking the next step to, to change. So, uh, well, I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to ask. So what happened with the Grizz uh, and the horse falling off the cliff? Oh, man. So, cause I mean, other, I mean, they're going to ask you now or we're going to stop recording. I'm going to ask you as soon as we get done. So you might as well just tell everybody. Yeah. Otherwise everyone's going to have to <laughs> tell one time. Yeah. So I was like, you know, um, it's like my second season packing and, um, you know, I got a pack string with me and I'm in the back and a grizzly bear kind of comes out on the trail. He comes but kind of like barreling down. Most of the time the bears will stop kind of like look sometimes they'll stand up and then they'll usually when they see the horses they they don't like the horses when you're alone by yourself that is a completely different story and one of the guys one of the cowboys was in front of me and he 
thought he was going to kind of spook the bear off more, which was still kind of going down the trail because he dropped down to the next switchback. And when he did, the the horse spooked when the bear moved, and he went off the side, and it was very steep. And the horse kind of locked up his hindquarters and then took a jump, locked up his hindquarters. And then there was, like, one huge, like, Douglas fir with a giant timber or um, bow sticking out that was, like, pointed. And when the horse leaped, you know, at that kind of steep grade, it gained a lot of altitude. Mm -hmm. And it landed directly onto that thing, and it went through its stomach and out its side. And it would made the most horrible noise I've ever heard a horse make in my life. And it was like, like, and it was be- like making this bellowing sound that the cowboy flips off, peels the head stall off the horse. Everyone's like screaming like, oh my God. So I'm like, I like jump off my, uh, my horse. I just leave the mules loose. And I start like kind of trying to get down to him. And the horse is like kicking and blood is like <sighs> pumping out. It's hitting me in my face. I mean, it's a large animal. And, uh, I'm trying to get him up off this thing. And the cowboy's kind of head's dazed. And he's like there. And I was like, I need help getting this horse up. We're trying to stop the bleeding. Like, you know, I'm like, and then the horse died. He died like probably like within 10 seconds, bled out. I mean, it was a massive injury. And uh, there was nothing more healing than that. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, you know, that was uh, that was an intense experience. I've had him up. Uh, we had some guys. We had a guy quit uh, three years ago. Bear came out, barreled uh, towards the whole pack string. Uh, the guy that was working for me at the time shot him and tumbled him. Bear turned, came at him again, hit him a second time. What was he shooting? What 357. That's why I carry 44 mag. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, dude, the 10 mil, more shots. I'm like, 44 mag. And there, so the bear uh, tumbles. And of course, you got to call the Forest Service. And it's just like investigation. And they came up, and, and it was 13 feet. Uh, the shot was made 13 feet. The bear print from the horse. So he was about to, he was about to tackle the animal. Um, but most of the times, you know, they don't really want to bother you. But you, you know, you never know. And the guy that quit was like, "Yeah, no, I'm good." Well, <laughs> the whole pack string exploded. Okay, Dude, so here comes nuts. a grizzly bear, a dead God. run, and next thing you know, these guys are. Five, you know they're on day nine on horses. Their horses start bucking and you know, blow up, and the mules are going every. I mean, it's like a yard this sale. Is, from this hell. is complete freaking mayhem. 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 You because like I mean, somebody that's more skilled could have like got a hold of them. If you watch that film, the Five Hundred Mile Project, uh, you get a, um, it's 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 a great film. But we had a guy, uh, a mountain bike, run into him, and, and the horse reared back and broke his orbitals and broke his face, and um, and then have to get medevaced or whatever. But things can get sideways, you know, with horses like pretty quick. And uh, that grizzly bear experience was was one of those. Uh, but it doesn't happen often, and uh, you know. So by the way, apply to the program. Uh, it's totally safe. Uh, <laughs> Almost totally <laughs> we'll, safe. We'll protect you. No, but uh, it's it's a huge opportunity. We just opened applications, by the way. I'll plug that real quick uh, last week. So they're piling up quick. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll close them, I think, March 31st. And then April 1st, we select the class. So we kind of select them along the way. And that selection is eight people? Uh, or is it 16? There's, there's three eight-man classes, and then we'll run a winter class. So we'll have 32 guys go through the program this year. Um, so yeah, so, so applications are open nine. So go to heroes and horses.org and, and apply if you're interested in, in coming out for the experience of your lifetime. Right on, man. And awesome. 357 Magnum. No good for, for bears. No, it's not. I mean, I have a 44 <laughs> mag. I'll tell you right now, I've like, I've, I've done so many side cuts by side comparisons with guns, like 10 mils, um, 357s. I'm telling you, you want that initial knockdown power to be a wake up call and let me tell you when a bear runs they put their head down low to the ground Mm. they're not like up they're super low to the ground Mm. and so you know a lot of people don't realize that like they're actually difficult to hit because they're like when they're running at you like that you know Mm. 30 miles an hour they're coming at you there's a lot happening very quickly (laughs) Um, and bears aren't as scared of people anymore the scariest thing is when i shoot you know when i knock an elk down and I'm by myself, and then I got to, you know, hit on the GPS for the guys that bring the horses or whatever, and I'm out there by myself, like, standing over gut pile. 
yeah. that is like the worst feeling. Like chum in the water, man. It's the worst feeling. Like you want to, you know, I always build a fire and I like make it like super big or whatever. And I try to put pine boughs over and piss on them or do all these like the kind of things or whatever. But you want to talk about like getting in your own, you know, I'm doing the whole like, what was that? <laughs> I'm the only one out there. I'm like, yeah. Like, there's no like cool How long guys. does it take the horses to get to you? Uh, it depends where I'm at. You know, sometimes What's the it can be a day. Waited? Okay. So um, have you ever slept out on some guts? No, no, no guys come no matter what. That would be Your good. horse can see at night. <laughs> I, I always tell, uh, listen, we ride at night and it's, pro, I mean, things happen. I mean, there is no, it is what it is. You ride at night. You want to find out, uh, you know, I always tell people, I said, you don't know, you know, a lot of people don't know this little bit of history, but I always tell them that the, the, uh, uh maybe I shouldn't say this, but the, <laughs> an old cowboy told me one time that the Catholic religion was actually started in Montana. And it was a, it was an old outfitter looking for tree branches at night, right? So <laughs> riding his horse. And I always tell that joke to the guys joking around, you know, shout out to the Pope or whatever. But I, I, uh, <laughs> it works. Like if you ride, you can't see anything and you're like, <laughs> you, you know, your it is the like, craziest feeling to ride all through the night on a horse. It's wild. But the horses know what's up. Oh, they see perfect no at night. No, but you can't see anything. <laughs> You know, and you're walking on these like ridges and you just hear like rocks like ding, 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 ding. <laughs> you're like, ah, okay. And you're just like, you're like riding a horse name like Dingbat or whatever. You're like, ah, I don't know. I trust you. <laughs> but they don't want to die either. So but yeah, heroesandhorses.org. I, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, and taking the time, you know, to kind of hear the story and stuff. So thank you very much. Well, hey man, thanks for coming on, uh, you know, sharing these lessons. Thanks for your service and, and everything that you did. And, and really, man, I think thanks for the most part what you're doing right now, man. Mm. I think it's awesome and um, appreciate it, bro. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Echo. Right on. Micah just step, stepped out. Awesome having him on. I, I just was reviewing my notes that I was taking while he was talking, and most of them I got to, but there's one that I didn't get to address, and I'm sure maybe come back on at some point we can talk about it or we'll just talk about it, but... You remember he told the story, or he was he was making hypothetical situation. Warren Buffett is in the desert, he has no water, yeah. and Micah sees him, right. and Micah has water, yeah. and Warren Buffett's gonna die, and he says, you know, I'll give you this water, but you have to give me all of your money. Right. <laughs> and, and, and Micah says, so he's gonna do it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's true, Often, but here's the crazy thing. There are people whose ego will not allow them to make that trade. They would actually rather die. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy, it sounds a little bit inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you how it's not inconceivable. In what Leif wrote about, with the, with the situation with a, a, a spe special operations unit, that was gonna conduct an operation and Leif talked to some National Guard guys that were saying do not do that operation. Mm -hmm. Leif goes and gives that information to the special operations unit that was gonna go do it. Mm -hmm. And those guys were like, no, we're going. And those, the, the National Guard, Guard guys, they don't know how to handle it. I forget what the exact wording, but we don't need to listen to them. Yeah. Instead, we're gonna go do this mission. And so we have to keep in mind that ego is so strong that if you have a guy now, look, Warren Buffett might be a guy who's, you know, let his ego, he's an older guy, maybe he's got enough life experience to be like, oh, I wanna live, that's more important to me. But I guarantee you, there are some individuals that would rather die than admit that they're wrong. They'd rather die than take help from someone else. They'd rather die than ask for help. So that was just one little, thing that I thought about as, and unfortunately, you know, I took the note and then I didn't get to get to bring it up with, with Micah, but that is something to think about. You don't realize how powerful a negative force an ego can be. Yeah. I, I was thinking the same thing too at that time. There's a movie like kind of new, I think where it had Kevin Spacey in it, and then before they released it, they replaced him because there was some <laughs> Kevin Spacey scandal. Where do, do you know what movie I'm talking about? It's uh, something about the, I want to say the Gatsby. Or, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what movie. You're but it was basically about. a famous rich guy. Mm -hmm. um, 
Wait, and is in the movie or that's what the movie's about? Both. Okay. Both. Um, it's, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, so it's about a real, it's like kind of like a true story or something, okay. I think, if I'm not mistaken. The, I'm only gathering like pieces of it, but it's basically about uh, <laughs> this super duper rich guy. Uh -huh. um, they, I want to say they kidnap his son or something like that, or the daughter or something, and they're like, hey, basically like, you know, held him for ransom. Mm -hmm. They were like, give us this money or whatever. And the guy, and it was no money for this guy. Like, it was not that much. And he was in the... I think it was like on the news or something. It's like, oh, so what are you gonna do? He's like, I don't care. I don't care. Like, there's no way he would give money. Mm -hmm. It was that. It was like that. Yeah. That much, you know. Where, yeah, I can lose a son. Like, whatever. It's like the. And it's not like. And I'm totally trying to remember the thing. But it wasn't. It wasn't like. Oh, I can't afford it. Or it was. It was more about the principle. Pride. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, like no, I'm no one, no one, not giving that much money. No one can do that to me, kind of a thing. Like, I'm not even. Meanwhile, like, you know, like kind of real important thing. You know, the son or the grandson or something yeah. like that. But yeah, I, I thought that same thing too. I said, I get, I get the example because yep. it's true. It is know? true. It's kind of true. It's basically like, like saying, without your health, you have nothing. You know, like you can't, you can't bring right. your money to the grave. Like, it's true. It's true. But. Yep. There are these weirdo little exceptions where it's like that doesn't matter to some some people. Yeah, that ego gets that ego starts to get charged up, man. It's um, it can be, it can definitely be a scary thing. So it's like, and you might have even said this before, where ego is essentially like a like a drug that you can, you know, some people like they'll oh <laughs> they'll just take drugs till they die. Yeah, like your ego will kill you. That's an example. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. It's like that thing. You know, people they'll smoke cigarettes like so yeah. much, and no, they'll the, be like, the, hey, the thing that I said was. Your ego will love you to death. <laughs> Your ego will there, love you to death. There you go. There Just you like go. drugs will love you to Like drugs yeah. love you. Yep. Yep. And oh, I, yeah. I took this from Jay, I think, if I remember this correctly, Jay Adams, who is a old school skateboarder. Mm. Back in the day. Yeah. Like Dogtown, mm. Z-Boys. And I heard him saying drugs will love you to death. Because you know he had, a, he had problems with addiction and went to jail and all this stuff. And I actually met him. And kind of hung out with him a little bit. <laughs> sure. I was my friend. My friend uh, ran an underground skate downhill skateboarding uh, uh, event. Yeah, yeah, I like this. M not just one, but like a regular basis. That was his jam. Yeah. And and it was like, hey, we're gonna meet at this random mountain that just got freshly paved. Mm, like yeah. the state just freshly paved some mountain yeah. and we're gonna meet out there and do downhill races Have you ever been on a downhill skateboard? Uh, I've been on a downhill skateboard. Yes. Okay. I was I said, oh, I'll try what this is like or whatever mm. I got on a downhill skateboard. I went 20 feet and I was already going so fast. I I, did, I jumped off <laughs> Because I could see where this was going. Yes, and it wasn't a good place yeah. I don't have the skill set to be doing this. Yeah, Guys race in leathers, yeah. like like uh, motorcycle racing leathers. Mm -hmm. They race in those things. So I kind of so at any at one of these underground events, Jay Adams, rest in peace, was there, mm -hmm. and you know I got to shake his hand, and I didn't get a picture. That's a bad move, actually. Well, how long ago was it? Mm, ten years. Ten years ago. Maybe ten years. Oh, maybe yeah. even a little bit longer yeah, ago. You, sh you should have got a picture. And then pictures are available at yeah, that time. Because yeah. if it's like 1991 or oh, something. Oh no, no no no! This was then, this was recent. This yeah. was like you know I was a grown man trying to get on a downhill skateboard. <laughs> Dude, those guys are freaking crazy. <laughs> no, I, I yes sir yes sir. They, they are, are bombing hills. Yeah, bombing hills. You're on a skate. This isn't on the snow or the water. Yeah. Like you fall in the snow, look, you can get hurt on the snow for sure. Yeah. You can get hurt on the water. You can, Notice there's a key word there, can. can yeah. You can get hurt on the water. You can get hurt on the snow. Yeah. If you fall on a freaking downhill skateboard, you're getting hurt. Yeah. Now, I, yeah. that, interestingly, they don't. They wear leathers, they know how to fall better, whatever. Yeah, I think I think a lot of times, especially in skateboarding in general, mm -hmm. that you just get hurt, and I think no, those, yeah. those guys are kind of just used to it. Where, for sure. You know, unless you break like your ankle or your wrist or whatever, or whatever, break whatever. Either hurt or you're injured. So, mm -hmm. skateboard is just used to getting hurt. Yeah. Let's face it, bro. You get you get especially on the downhill right where you got a bail or whatever, and you're yeah. sliding. Oh yeah, you're yeah. Sliding for oh sure. you're. What you're are you hitting? Up. Something's gonna stop you. You know. <laughs> I know. So Jay Adams said, yeah. "Drugs will love you to death." And as That's soon right. as I heard him say that, I was like, "Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. You know what? Also, will love you to death. Your own ego. Yeah. Your own ego will love you to death. So you gotta watch out for it." Yep. 
Yeah, like the, the, the short term payoff of what it delivers to you is just so makes you feel so good or safe or secure or little, whatever. Get that little hitter. That like yeah, man, meanwhile your your health, your safety, your well being. Got to be careful that. Be well, careful. hey, uh, this has already been a really long podcast. Appreciate everyone for listening. Yes, sir. If you want to support the podcast, go to jockofuel.com. Get some get some supplements of whatever kind you may need. Yep. Jockofuel.com. We also have look. We talked a little bit about China today. Mm-hmm. China. We talked a little bit about China. We are we are in an economic war with China for the time being. Could it escalate? Yes, it could. If we lose the economic war, trust me, the escalation's gonna be real bad. Mm-hmm. So we're in an economic war with China right now. And at Origin USA, we are on the front lines of that war. We are building stuff in America. The things that Micah was talking about today, you know, a sense of purpose. When, you, when you're not making anything, you don't have, look, let me rephrase that. When you are making something, producing something, building something, you have a sense of purpose. Mm. And when you're building something that's helping rebuild your community, you have an even greater sense of purpose. Mm. So if you want to help us rebuild our communities, help us rebuild our country, help provide a sense of purpose to hundreds and one day thousands of hardworking Americans, then check out originusa.com. Get awesome stuff that's made in America. Yeah, I think that that concept kind of probably goes deeper than maybe we might think at a glance where, you know, how like, you know, as technology evolves and all like all this other stuff or whatever, you know, basically it's just an it's an evolution of problems being solved. So the smaller problems get solved, solved, solved just so you can take on bigger problems. Right. And they then we have innovation and, you know, all this stuff, invention. Like back in the day, right, you have these simple tools, a stick, a rock, you know, and you're making like you're spending five days making this one thing that literally you can buy at 7-Eleven nowadays, right? Like that kind of stuff. But back then, it's just how it worked. It's like, yeah, bro, if you want a fire, Mm. bro, it's going to take a lot to make that fire. Then after you make that fire, it provides the warmth and the heat and you can cook for you and your family and all this stuff. So it's like this little system that kind of works together. But then... When you start inventing things, that fire part, making the fire part becomes really inconvenient. Like we got to focus on this bigger problem here that making that fire takes like freaking, I don't know, 35, 45 minutes that maybe would help us in this bigger problem if we could just do that in an instant. So let's solve that problem indefinitely mm-hmm. in, on an indefinite level, you know. So boom, we solve that problem. Now you got lighters, matches, whatever, right? I'm sure it didn't happen in that order, but I'm just saying, for example. But it just keeps going and going and going and going. So we got a bunch of problems solved for us now. Yes. All kinds of problems. Yes, but now the problems become, you know, what's that hierarchy? It's like some hierarchy, right? Hierarchy of needs. So now technology kind of like exploded so fast. So now it ended us up on that that higher part of the, the hierarchy or the needs, right? But technology has it. Right now, it's not good enough to solve those problems. So now you got people depressed or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. So now, yeah, if you we can infuse little little sen- sprinkles of senses of purpose into all of our lives, really, I think that's going to be the beginning of the uh, the solution the, to our problems. The awakening. Yeah, but it was just kind of like how Mike was saying, where you kind of got to go down to the, the the baseline a little bit to explore, like where can I infuse some of the purpose in that baseline? Then your life just as a whole will be more more beneficial, more fulfilling or whatever. Yeah, I think fulfilling is the word. Yeah, like you'll you'll feel more purpose like just in your day to day, you know? Just how it works, but, or I think it works like that. I don't know. Check. Um, So originusa.com, cool, awesome to support. Get it, get whatever you need there. Also, we got jocostore.com, which Echo made up the name for, very original. Yeah. Because we have a store. Uh, no, I think I, I accepted the name for it. Oh. I think you li- oh, did I name it? literally made it up. Uh, you know what? Actually, now that you mention no, it. No, you actually said to me, like, well, <laughs> hey, you know, I'm going to start us a store. And yeah. I was like, oh, what's it going to be called? I don't even think I asked that. It was probably like three days later. You're yeah. like, hey, I set up the store. Okay, cool. Yeah. W- you're like, we'll look at the yeah. website. And I go, okay, yeah. cool. What's the website? And you're like, a Jocko store. You know what's funny? Like, I'm remembering it, and you're correct. Okay. Exactly right. Because I, I don't remember. I just you could tell me anything right now, and I'd believe you. If yeah. you're like, no, you for- imposed it on me, or no, you said, yeah, yeah, 
Mm-hmm. You know, your idea is dumb, Jocko. Or you, you said, you know, Jocko, you wanted to name the store something <laughs> lame, <laughs> and then I came up. I would believe whatever you said. Yes, sir. Because well, I, I remember it. I am remembering it now. And it's weird because it's not like I was like, hey, what's the best kind of name for this or that? Or, you know, I want to make this show. It was just like it was just kind of like a foregone conclusion. Like mm. I didn't even really think of it. That's I was like, oh, let's just do the thing. It's just, it's just how. Mm. You know? just how. J- Jocko podcast, so he got to have a store. So yeah. Jocko store. Nonetheless, on Jocko store, you can get your uh, apparel, shirts, hats, hoodies, good stuff if you want to represent mm. on this path that yeah. we're on. Subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. All that stuff. We appreciate it. Check out check out JockoUnderground.com. Look. There's a lot of influential things going on out there in the world. People are getting banned. Whatever. Not whatever. Really. Yeah, straight up. Some of us got shadow banned. Did you get shadow banned? I, I don't know. I I don't know. It's kind of like there are people that I follow mm-hmm. that I know when they're shadow banned because I'm like, you know how you kind of miss it? Like you're like, oh, I haven't heard from this person. Well, yeah. they're not posting and they've been and you even try to look them up and their their oh, name. Yeah. That's the thing. The that's, name don't That's the video that someone sent me was they're yeah. tra- it's searching for my name and it's not up there. Yeah. Look, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know who's in control of these platforms. They seem to be being okay sometimes, but sometimes we're getting shadow banned. Yeah. So go to jockowonderground.com <laughs> if you want to help us out on that. Uh, psychological warfare, you know the deal on that. Flipside Canvas, Dakota Meyer got some cool stuff to hang on your wall. I've written a bunch of books. If you want to check them out, there's some information in them that could help you. Especially the kids' books, man. Get the yeah. kids some books. And also have a leadership consulting company. Go to echelonfront.com if you want some details on that. Check out our, our online training academy. Our online training academy, extremeownership.com. Putting all kinds of effort. The lessons that we, the lessons that we learned are so helpful. We, and this is what we hear all day long every day. I get emails, I get handwritten letters. We get updates. Utilizing the skills that we brought back, the leadership skills, the life skills. If you want to get in the game, go to extremeownership.com and check it out. Yeah, it's funny that that academy because you you have it under echelon front, mm-hmm. you know. With, you know, and I always looked at it or kind of imagined it as essentially, oh, this is what you you know if you work and or if you manage a team, you're a boss or something like that. Oh yeah, perfect, freaking perfect, really. But when you kind of look into it and you kind of go on there and stuff, this is really what it is. Where it's like, okay, yeah, sure, I listen to Jocko, you know, sometimes involuntarily against my will, whatever. But let's say voluntary, I listen to Jocko, and you know what? He has some good advice, you know. And actually, if I'm going to tell the truth here, where if I listen to, and by the way, you kind of choose what you put in your head and what you listen to, right? Mm-hmm. So we choose to listen to you most of the time. Sure. <laughs> So now Jocko, with all this advice or whatever, he actually has an online academy like to train you. <laughs> That's literally what it is. It is, so it's yes. <clears throat> like, okay, so I'll co- and I kind of took it for granted where I can ask you questions like when I see you. Mm-hmm. It's easy. I can literally call you up if yeah. you answer. You've asked me a lot of questions <laughs> over the years. Yes. If you think about it. And now oh, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not talking about questions about how to do a Kimura, which you have asked me, yeah. but I'm talking, you come in with a legitimate scenario, yeah, business like, scenario, family you know, scenario. I need advice yeah, straight up. Straight up. Just That's the other, la- last time I saw you, I asked, I asked you, what do you think about this? I'm thinking about this or this, and I need like yeah. straight up, legitimately need <laughs> advice from you right now. Did I give you good advice? Yes, I, I think so. I'm following it. Okay. I'll tell you that. And it's working or not working? So, so far, I guess. It was more of a long-term uh, okay. decision-making cool. for a strategy. Well, then we're probably thinking it's the right move. Because uh, yeah, you think probably so. weren't thinking, no offense, you may not have been thinking long term. Yeah. A lot of us make that mistake. We think short term. Yeah. What, I, what plays out. I much. was. It's like one of those things where you know how you make this decision to pursue this, it's going to pr- put this other thing on hold for mm. a long time. Uh, or okay, now I you can the pursue you the other me. one yeah. and it'll put this one on hold either indefinitely or yep. for a long time. Yep. So it's like, which one is it? The advice I gave you is very good, by the way. I, I agree. Yep. And even when you said it, it cl- it hit me so yep. quickly that, yep, you, I think you're right. Yep. You know? That's a good call. So if you didn't know me, yeah. if you weren't, if we didn't hang out, if we weren't doing jujitsu, if we weren't doing the podcast, and you had that question, yeah. you could go to extremeownership.com and literally ask me. And, and I would give you the same advice. Exactly right. And that's what I'd I'm saying. get some more particulars. Maybe your scenario yeah. is different. Maybe your area of operations is different. But essentially, you'd get at least. Now, does this mean I'm going to preach to you that I know 100%? No. But I would help you way through the options, which is what I did with you. 
Right. Yeah, exactly right. And that's exactly what I was going to say. So. It, it's it, That's exactly what it is, you know, where you and then, of course, you, you know, you, you have a bunch of other experts in little, little special specialty elements of life or whatever as well. But yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. You want to you want to get straight up life advice from Jocko. You want to get straight up online training <laughs> from Jocko. There it is. Boom. You got it right there. Extremeownership.com. Hey, if you also, if you want to help out service members, active and retired, you want to help out their families, go to Mark Lee's mom. She's got an awesome charity organization called America's Mighty Warriors. You can go to americasmightywarriors.org. She's doing a ton of help, a ton of help that I've seen with my own eyes. My friends have gotten help from her. So it's a great organization. Also, obviously, check out Heroes and Horses dot org micah in case you couldn't tell is a freaking awesome guy with an awesome vision and he's moving forward with that if you want any more of my torturous tales or you need more of echo's discombobulating disclosures <laughs> you can find them on the web you can find us on the interwebs on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, Echoes at Echo Charles. I am at Jocko Willink. Does this mean we want you to go in there and waste time freaking getting sucked into the ag- algorithm? No, don't do that. You wanna check out, you wanna hit us with something, you wanna give a shout out, cool, we appreciate it. You wanna get a little information about what we're doing, cool. Don't get sucked into the algorithm. The so listen, and I, my brain, mind, and I'm sure a lot of people do the same thing where it does this thing where anytime I listen to like Micah or, you know, any time, pretty much anyone's story mm-hmm. and you hear those cool little parts of it mm-hmm. where it's like, oh man, I need to take away the computer from my kids from now on. You know, it's like you get sucked into a story so much, like it's so, um, what do you call it? Like so engaging yep. that you kind of like, I kind of want to be a bow hunter now. You know, it's like that kind yeah. of remember when <laughs> giving John Dudley a call. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. When he's yeah. talking, I'm like, dang, maybe I miss my calling from yeah. you know, for bow hunting. Yeah. Even maybe though I'd be out there in the in the woods with the with the grizz. I literally shot one bow in my life one time, sure. by the way. And it was pretty recently. But nonetheless, I still had that feeling. See what I'm saying? Because you see you get so immersed in like the story or whatever. And he was talking about like the social media and I mm. felt it. I was like, Yeah, you're right, social media is so toxic. But the reality is it can be toxic mm-hmm. and it can be very beneficial. Like you, you know, I know, I'm, you know, you can be in communication with very valuable people yep. for very good reasons. I've gotten in, through to- social media. We've probably gotten 30 guests on this podcast, legit awesome guests, freaking so stoked yep. from social media. Oh, yeah. So that's definitely, and it's, and it is a legitimate way to communicate with other people. Yep. It doesn't mean you have to get in the algorithm. So it's there, we're there, and also Heroes and Horses, at Heroes and Horses. You can check out the Instagram, the Facebook, the YouTube. Go check out the YouTube. A bunch of the things that that Micah talked about today, he kept saying, hey, we made this film, we made that film. Mm -hmm. Go check those things out. They're they're really cool to watch. I watched them. And uh, yep, so there we are. Micah, really appreciate you coming down. Really appreciate your service in the military and out of the military. And once again, thank you for what you are continuing to do to help out vets. And it's going to have a huge impact. So thanks, brother. And to our active duty military and our veterans out there, thank you for your service. And remember, you got a lot to offer. Even when that layer comes off, even when that layer comes off, of the uniform and the military. When that uniform comes off, you still have a ton to offer. So go out, find a mission, find yourself. That's where it starts. And also thanks to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all first responders. Thanks for what you do. And remember, just like the military, What you do is not necessarily who you are. You have more than your uniform. So remember that. And to everybody else, let's follow the words we heard today quoted from Micah from Alexander the Great. 
who said, bury me with my hands out of the ground so the world can see that I left it with nothing. Let's leave it all in the field by going out there every day and getting after it. Until next time, this is Echo and Jocko.